that time I got reincarnated as a slime, volume 13. Prologue. Two misgivings. Ghidorah was at an impasse, about two things, mainly. One, it went without saying, was about who might have been trying to murder him. If the assailant didn't even alert me to their presence, that lowers the range of possibilities greatly. I have my thoughts on their identity, but... But Ghidorah admitted to himself, he was too afraid to state the name. Because if his forebodings turned out to be true, it meant all his sinister designs, and those of Yuki and his gang as well, had been playing into Emperor Ludora's hands the whole time. No, it may just be possible. The Emperor has lived far, far longer than I have. He commands knowledge beyond any average person's perception, and he has the power to match. It wouldn't be strange at all if he saw how events would transpire and made his move decades in advance. But if so, Ghidorah was far away from the Empire. But if his suspicions were true, he thought, then Yuki was in danger, so now what? Should he warn him or just let him be? That was the problem. Yuki was hardly a stranger, he had a decent enough affinity for the man. Despite that, Ghidorah was firmly on the side of Raimaru's forces at present. He couldn't rock the boat right this moment. If he was truly concerned, he could have revealed everything to Raimaru and sought his advice. But if he disclosed all this uncertain intelligence and turned out to be wrong, it'd send Raimaru's trust in Ghidorah plummeting. Ghidorah had already betrayed the Empire once, any further loss of confidence would affect his very position in life. The pluses and minuses to all his options left Ghidorah frozen in place, unable to take action. And that wasn't all. The second doubt in his mind made all his thoughts frazzled, flying in every direction. That face, that ambition. It is absolutely the same as what Emperor Ludora exhibited. But even the sight of me didn't seem to faze him at all. He truly appears to know nothing, and I doubt he is a fake, but... There was no way Ludora could be there, no matter which angle you debated it from, Ghidorah concluded there was no other answer, which meant that person was just someone who resembled Ludora. But if that person was his highness? No, that's silly talk. Let's think about who stabbed me. I have to conclude that I know the murderer, but if my hunch is right, that kid Yuki is in trouble. I'm not sure if I'll be able to sleep at night unless I at least give him a warning. And let's inform Sir Raimaru as well. In the end, Ghidorah gave his friendship first priority. It might damage his reputation, but that was fine. In this nation, after all, might truly did make right, and in Ghidorah's eyes, survival of the fittest was exactly what he hoped for. Finally reaching this conclusion, Ghidorah quickly sprang into action. Yuki, it's me. I'd like to give you some advice. To tell the truth. Before even asking what Yuki was doing, Ghidorah laid out his main points in a single onrush. Whoa, um, this is sudden. I am afraid it has to be. Think about my position, won't you? So Raimaru might start to foster doubts about me thanks to this, so I don't have time to debate the finer points with you. I'll do what I can over here so just keep an eye out for any nighttime assassins, all right. With that, Ghidorah ended his magical call with Yuki. Then in the same motion, he walked off to report to Raimaru. In a well-oiled business, he recognized how important it was to stay in touch, report what you know, and be open to discussion. He was an expert at raising the apprentices and other people under him, and he didn't scrimp on those tenets. So the old man's okay after all, huh? and I guess he's made himself at home over at Raimaru's place, even. Yuki mulled this over with a grin, his gaze toward the window. The imperial capital was facing a long rainstorm, all but blocking his view outside, but even through the rain, his eyes detected a suspicious figure. Based on the person's well-trained movements, it was clearly someone directed to surveil him. The realization made Yuki smile expectantly, and he stayed where he was. Kagali, the other person in the room, spoke up first. Do you mean Ghidorah? Well, I'm sure he did. Even a former demon lord like me has always found him a wily sort, the kind you'd best never turn your back on. That's why our relationship was so fruitful for us. 
Yuki nodded. It was. I gained my position in this nation thanks to him. And just now he gave me some of the most valuable information I could ask for. Ghidorah, he was sure, wouldn't hesitate to give him useful intel on Tempest. For example, intel on Kronoa, that sort of hero. Her fate was still unknown, but if Raimuru was alive, he must have defeated her. Still, if Raimuru had actually contained all her wild violence, there'd have to be rumors about it by now, but Yuki had heard nothing. Ghidorah didn't mention her, either, so Yuki couldn't discount the possibility that Kronoa was dead. Maybe he was worrying too much about it. He decided to move on. He needed to work out the issues Ghidorah brought up in his emergency report. Oh, did he? And what did he have to say? So apparently Masayuki is the spitting image of Emperor Ludora, huh? Yuki grinned at Kagali, who was too flummoxed to say anything else. If someone told him that out of the blue, he'd probably react the same way. Right? It makes no sense. I thought that wizard finally lost his marbles, but it doesn't seem like he's joking. I really don't think the emperor transformed into Masayuki or whatever, though. I can't be a hundred percent sure of that, but... Yuki recalled his encounters with Masayuki. His smile dissolved. Looking back... Masayuki hadn't been summoned to this world. As he put it, I turned around, and next thing I knew, I was here. He was a visitor, someone who came to this world out of sheer happenstance, or so he thought. But. But I can't fully prove that Masayuki's an otherworlder. I mean, he used magic and skills to. He stopped himself before his mind went any further down this path. Actually, let's save Masayuki for later. Right now we need to talk about the guys watching us. Oh? You were piquing my interest just then. But you're right, it's a bit stifling, being observed like this all the time. Right? It'll hinder our plans, and before that, I think we're gonna have to dispose of all our preparations anyway. What was that? You heard me. If the old man's telling the truth, it's safe to say we're in serious danger. If Ghidorah wasn't lying, moving the composite division currently deployed for the Dwarven Kingdom was a bad decision. Yuki had no idea what would happen, but even before that, he needed to step back and figure out who was friend or foe. It was a complete restart, and that's exactly how cornered Yuki and his cohorts were. Ah. Then yes, now's no time to be talking about that Masayuki boy. Kagali never doubted Yuki's words. If Yuki saw danger ahead, there was never any refuting that. He told me he sought an audience with the Emperor, only to have someone stab him in the back. Someone? Not Kondo? Kagali paused, then dismissed the idea. No. I assume that nobody besides Kondo could kill Ghidorah, but I could picture some hidden talent among the more undercover single digits. Besides, Tatsuya Kondo as the culprit was all too expected. Yuki wouldn't be demonstrating so much surprise if it were him. I agree with you on that, yeah. But I'm surprised for another reason. Ghidorah said he thinks he knows who stabbed him. The room fell silent. Kagali took a breath and peered into Yuki's eyes. Someone both of us know well, you're saying? Her eyes told him the story. They said tell her, or else. Yuki gave this a half-smile and a light nod. Believe it or not, yes. Of course, Ghidorah could always be mistaken, but I really don't think there's a way to mistake this. Kagali's eyes widened. So it's someone in our circle? Her smile had vanished. Yes, Yuki replied, nodding. His smile, meanwhile, only grew wider. Our double-crosser is. Chapter 1. Unrest and Resolve. A month had passed since my cabinet meeting. Today I was once again back in my control center, keeping up on my imperial observations. With all our intelligence being gathered here, Benimaru and I were basically living in this place. We still went back home at night, though. For all I knew, if I left the control center unoccupied, Veldora and Ramirez might turn it into their secret hideout. I built a retreat for myself, and I wanted it to be used. Benimaru was keeping up appearances, too, 
so I imagined he was resting in his quarters as well, not that I needed to worry about that sort of thing, I just didn't want my top commander collapsing from exhaustion before the final battle. We had staff assigned to the control center at all times by this point, three shifts running the complex 24 hours a day during wartime. I wanted to be sure nobody was overworked. Managing our health, at least, was something I wanted to be thorough with. Of course, my comrade Veldora was not a concern of mine on that front, and neither was Ramirez. Both of them got ample rest without me having to remind them, or really, they went out and screwed around all the time. They were excited about the war at first, but after a month of no movement, they seemed utterly bored with it. They were selfishly back in their own research lab now, telling me to inform them if something happened. Ah well. They just get in the way of things regardless, so I let them do what they wanted. Right now, the top brass in the control center was Benimaru, C.I., and me, along with my secretaries Xion and Diablo. Geld was there, too, I shouldn't forget about him. I felt bad about halting his construction projects for so long. I really wanted to get this war over with fast, before Frey started getting really mad. But that, of course, depended on my opponents. In war, the attacking side held the initiative, if the opponent never showed up, you couldn't fight even if you wanted to. The Empire's tank battalion, which I assumed would enter the scene in around twenty days, was moving far slower than expected. In fact, they seemed to be crawling along on purpose, trying to show off their might as they advanced. My Argos magic system kept a watchful eye on them day and night, but if you'd never seen a tank before, I'm sure they looked like terrifying creatures, even a real monster was still gonna be afraid of giant, horrible opponents, and the magic beasts ranked A or below in the forest had already fled far away from the advancing imperial force. So where were they? Well past their borders, that's for sure. Entering our nation without permission was fully against international law, as enacted by the Council of the West, but the Empire never did play by the rules. With things as they were, the question was how we could strategically take advantage of this. We could use it as a cover to stage a surprise attack, but we really did need to try talking at least once, I thought. There would be an order from the Empire to surrender, I understood, so until we could reply, I wanted to hold off on any attack. I know it's too slow of us, but we haven't finished our own preparations yet. I see no need to attempt to deceive them. We will decide everything in the first battle regardless. Benimaru agreed with me, not looking particularly concerned. So a bit relieved, I watched over our continued preparations for the anti-empire war. Finally, all those days of waiting were about to come to a close. The empire had stopped advancing and begun to assemble into formation. They were no fools, they had zero intention of fighting fair and square from the beginning, it would seem, so apart from the tanks, they had brought platoons of infantry into the forest as well. Vast numbers, in fact. Their total number had exceeded 700,000, around 70% of the Empire's entire force. We had known about this for days now, but it was worth going over again. Guess it's safe to assume this is the main force, I said. I imagine so, Benimaru agreed. It appears they intend to trap the Dwarven army, and their tanks are acting as decoys so they're trying to avoid being pincered in as they advance into our territory. They're being remarkably careful, considering the size of this force. The tank battalion seemed slow not because it was a show of force or whatever. They had a more important goal in mind, to attract our attention until they could get their main force of foot soldiers in position. Not that we didn't see through their schemes, of course. Having control over information puts us at quite the advantage, Benimaru said with a smirk. K he 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 he. Well played, Sir Raimaru. Dancing on your palm the whole time, were they not? Diablo, wasting no opportunity to praise me, also interjected. I was used to it by now, so I gave him a nod and a yep for his effort. Figure out how Diablo's mind works, and he's actually really easy to handle. Regarding the Imperial Infantry, I think we slightly underestimated the threat they pose. Each one of the soldiers seems decently powerful enough, and we've seen nobody defect from their ranks. 
they are assembling at a site about 19 miles away from Raimuru, the capital. That's where they are building a command headquarters and establishing their position. CI, attracting the attention of everyone else in the room, went into further detail. Moss, it turned out, had given him some valuable intel as well, intel that proved accurate beyond complaint. It was a nice compliment to our Argos, and it gave us a picture-perfect map of the enemy's location. If they're this close to our throats, wouldn't it seem unnatural if we didn't react? I asked. No, I wouldn't be so sure. They see themselves as the superior force here, and what's more, they are trying to keep their actions covered. Presumably, they're preparing to demand our surrender, then spring right into action. K he 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 he. I agree with Sir Benimaru. If I could add to his counsel, nineteen miles is almost the perfect distance for the Imperial Army. Magic based observation loses its accuracy at long range. They are safe from any Legion magic that might hinder all their forces at once. That, they believe, is how they are operating. It is hilarious to witness, but that is the best they are capable of. Apparently my concerns were for nothing. I thought the Empire would suspect our lack of activity to be a trap, but here I was being told that the enemy absolutely believed we weren't on to them. The only remaining concern was the strength of this enemy infantry. So, C.I., how strong are these foot soldiers? C.I. brought up their threat level, so they had to pack a punch. Depending on his response, I figured we might have to rework our plans. If I could give a broad evaluation using the traditional human ranking system, they rank the equivalent of a B. There are many advanced troops who rank over A among them, and even the lesser troops wouldn't rank below C+. Even compared to the Knight Corps of the Western Nations, I would call them quite a superior force. Yes, that was more power than I expected. But in this world, wars were all quality over quantity. A bunch of B rankers was nothing to trifle with, but a single A rank would be far more dangerous. Of course, I didn't want to underestimate their abilities as a fighting force. So there are practically no emergency recruits among them? They're all career soldiers. Right. From their training to the quality of their gear and tactics, they appear to outclass the Western nation's knights. Even your health lair would have difficulty piercing their magical defense. The way C.I. put it, the Imperial Army had legion magic cast over them at all times. They were a truly impressive force, trained to the hilt, and a platoon of them would be the equivalent of an A in rank. A force who truly worked as a team, such as Gogta's, could be a menace. It wasn't just the sum of each member's skill, it was more like exponential growth. If twenty or so of them deserved an A, simple arithmetic meant we had to fight against thirty-five thousand of these A-ranked threats. Frankly, we couldn't let our guards down. They were a pretty dangerous foe. Ah, we'll be fine. That's what the dungeon is for. K he 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 he. Force them to scatter inside the dungeon, and it'll be easy to destroy the enemy before they unleash their full force. Everything is just as you anticipated, Sir Raimaru. Not really, no. It just meant fending them off inside the dungeon turned out to be the best strategy of all, but depending on the enemy's war power. Wait. Hang on. Something dawned on me, no matter how much power the enemy brought with them, this interception strategy was valid either way. Inside the dungeon, it was possible to disperse their forces as we concentrated ours. That was why, if you really wanted to conquer the dungeon, you had to do it with small teams of elites, or you had no chance. Raphael strikes again, I thought. You know, looking back, I'm really glad we have Ramirez here, I couldn't help but blurt out. Benimaru agreed with me. We'll keep our city from being damaged, and it'll be a breeze to maintain our advantage. As a military commander, she's the last person I'd want as my enemy. He could give frank praise like this precisely because she wasn't around to hear him. If he complimented her in person, she'd be sneering and bragging to him all day. Regardless. So it sounds like we've got no problems, but how is Gobta's force doing? My magic was currently powering a set of large screens in the control center, displaying scenes from multiple points. One shot depicted the area near the Dwarven Kingdom. 
2,000 tanks were there, all in neat formation. They, too, were located around 19 miles away from the central entrance, the closest access to Dwargan's capital, exactly where we predicted they'd be. My main concern was the capabilities of these tanks. Their turrets were pointed straight at the large main gate, one I had visited many times by now. These so-called magitanks, or whatever, were supposed to be stronger than the tanks I was aware of from Earth. Perhaps those cannons had more range than those from my old world. I sincerely doubted their fire could actually reach the gate, but... In the public square on the other side of the gate, Gobters and Gable's forces were on standby. Both were leading their respective troops, diligently performing their duties. There were no unexpected skirmishes along the way, and the residents of the inn town were already fully evacuated. Now, as planned, Gobters and Gable's soldiers had rendezvoused here to serve as Dwarven Kingdom reinforcements. The Dwarven Kingdom has accepted Gobters and Gable's forces. This will be a united front, so they have not given up their command, said Benimaru. I wasn't worried about that, since Garzel already gave us his permission, but it looked like the Dwarven army kept their promises. Sounds like there's no problem, then. I have my concerns about how well they'll mesh with the Dwarven force, but if the Tempestians attack, and the Dwarves focus strictly on defense, I imagine things will turn out well. A military situation like this ran the risk of a jumbled, confused chain of command. Being a joint effort between armies of differing nations, they'd have to decide whose orders took first priority. If Benimaru was there, he could use his born leader unique skill to force his command on them all, even in a battlefield where allies and enemies were mixed among one another, with that they'd never have to worry about accidental friendly fire. With the dwarves on the scene, however, things could potentially end in chaos. Therefore, strictly dividing responsibilities between offense and defense would actually make things more efficient. Maybe I'd better talk things over with Gazelle one more time, just in case. Indeed, with the Empire deploying, there is little time left before the start of hostilities. It's about time for us to deploy as well, so would you like to contact him to make your final confirmations? Benimaru seemed to agree with me. So without hesitation, I reached out for our newly installed contact terminal. This contact terminal was a magical telepathic device that Vesta had invented. The great thing about it was that it could convey not only voice but visual information as well. It was shaped like a desktop computer, complete with a monitor, mouse, and keyboard, well, not a mouse, more like a palm-sized crystal ball. The terminal activated when you touched that ball. After that, just point out the person to contact among the figures etched into the keyboard, and you'd be connected to them. We kept it to a simple design so anybody could use it, although it did have its flaws. I said it conveyed visual information, but these were more like thoughts reconstructed in your brain. In other words, when you were jacked into your contact terminal, anything you thought could be picked up by the other side. This was the same fundamental concept as thought communication, and while I was used to it enough that I could shut out extraneous thoughts, newbies might wind up unintentionally leaking intel. Any wicked ideas you came up with could come through loud and clear to your partner. And forget about hiding any secret intentions. I definitely wouldn't use this terminal to go cruising for dates. The average, untrained person was better off using the device's audio functions only. But hey, they'll address that in version 2. Hello? This is Raimaru. Is King Garzel there? I began with hello in this world, too, as if that was the only logical option. It was too much of a habit to drop by now, so I didn't hesitate, but thanks to that, much to my bemusement, it had already become established contact terminal etiquette. Hello. I will call for His Highness. Would you mind waiting a few moments in the meantime? All right. I could hear panicked activity on the other end. I'm sure they had someone trained in handling the terminal, but hearing my name must have unnerved the person on the other end a bit. If the CEO of my old company called my desk phone out of nowhere, I'd probably be freaking out, too. Maybe I should have been a little more considerate. How rude to keep Sir Raimuru himself waiting. Xion was fuming about it already. If that's what you think, maybe I should have had you make the call, 
Huh? Because I think that kind of falls under the job description of a secretary, doesn't it? But Xi'an never touched the contact terminal, and the reason was simple, she didn't know how to use it. Or maybe not that, exactly. I kept teaching her how it worked, but her thoughts were apparently too strong for the device to handle. Ever since she blew out one terminal, she'd been kinda reluctant to try again. So really, she had no right to complain. Personally, instead of relying on some gadget like this, I'd use spatial transport to meet the man himself. In fact, I could bring King Garzel here, but what do you think? Diablo was being his usual Diablo-ish bossy self, but I wasn't too concerned. The king had his own business, no doubt, so it'd be more polite to set up an appointment first. It was my fault this time for calling him out of nowhere. It was natural that I'd have to wait a bit, and unreasonable to get angry at all about it. Well, if Sir Raimuru called for me without warning, it would be difficult not to panic. I sympathize with the dwarf over there. Hearing Gail say that, I silently wished some of that common sense would rub off on Xion and Diablo. In not even three minutes, I heard from Garzel. Sorry for the wait. I was just thinking I should contact you before long. Garzel's voice boomed from the speaker adjacent to the monitor. There was no image. Raphael was handling all the operations for me, so I could transmit whatever video I wanted, but Garzel was still getting a grip on this, so he was probably sticking to audio only. Smart choice. Ah, good. I just wanted to confirm with you one more time about the way we'll divide up roles in our united force. Mm, yes. That is important, but before that, I need to inform you of something. The eastern gate into Dwargan is being blockaded by the Empire's force. Just as Ghidorah had warned. That was probably the force led by Yuki. Yes, we have it on screen here. I'll send it to you. I pointed the Argos system toward Imperial lands. It was a long distance, with a magical barrier in the way as well, so the image wasn't exactly clear, but we could still see a crowd blocking the highway leading to the east gate. It's just like you told us, isn't it? When I heard about the enemy defector, I suspected it was a trap, but perhaps we can trust that man a little. Oh, I don't know yet, there's no doubt that Ghidorah's given up on the Empire, but I'm not sure I'd trust him right now. There's every chance he's being used without being aware of it, too. I'd keep a watchful eye on him. Ha! Huh. Tell me how you really feel, then. I'm quite glad to hear that from you. Garzel flashed me a joyful smile. I guess he was testing to see if I was on my guard. He never stops playing the old training partner card with me. Now, Raimuru. The envoy I sent to the Empire is just being given the runaround by them, it seems. By our laws, the Wargan can launch the first attack only as a last resort. That's a disadvantage for us, but we dwarves pride ourselves on it, and so we must wait for the Empire to act. You don't need to join us in that credo, but what are your plans, exactly? Garzel's smile rapidly dissolved, replaced with a look of concern. How should I interpret his intentions here? I turned my eyes to Benimaru. He returned my gaze with an easy smile. We didn't even need to exchange words, so tuned in we were to each other. I exhaled, straightened myself up, and turned back toward the monitor. Watching the totally blank screen, I tried to sound as formal as possible. The Imperial forces have invaded our territory without warning or permission. We cannot shut our eyes to this, and we are considering strong measures in response, including military options. Along those lines, as part of our alliance, I wanted to confirm your compliance with these measures. That sort of thing? Benimaru seemed satisfied with it. Xion happily nodded. Geld was virtually quaking with excitement, and Diablo was giddily taking down notes about something or other. I had no idea what he was writing or what he was going to do with those notes, but I was sure it was nothing good. Resolving to seize those from him afterward, I waited for Garzel's response. Hmm. You're starting to sound more like a king every day. Excellent. You invited them so deep into your territory because you intended to intercept them here from the start, didn't you? Of course, we could have fought them at the border, considering the potential damage to our town, 
but if we do that, they might try framing it as self-defense against a monster invasion or something later on. If they're in our lands, that stops them from claiming that, and it instills a sense of danger in the Western nations, too. We've already evacuated our citizens, and by this point, we've got just cause to strike. Ha 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 ha. I like your force of personality, but I have to take points off for revealing all that. Garzel laughed at me. He was the one who prodded me about it, and this was how he thanked me. But he wasn't done yet. Be that as it may, I don't want anything slogging us down. With our militaries in particular, we can't afford to have any discord. So let me spell it out for you. I am going to leave our negotiations with the Empire to the Jura Tempest Federation. If, after that, you decide open warfare is the option to take, then let the armed nation of Dwargan act on their alliance with Tempest and join the fray. And to avoid command chain confusion during the war, we and Dwargan will focus strictly on defending our lands. Is that all right with you? Ooh. That was a clearer answer than I expected. I thought that since the Dwarven Kingdom had a position of absolute neutrality, they wouldn't dare to interfere unless they were invading our territory. Benimaru and I had anticipated that as well, so I accepted the proposal without particular alarm. Thank you. I feel a lot better hearing that. Don't be silly. You must have expected this to happen from the beginning. It's the safest tactic, to be sure, but if our alliance forces ever run into trouble, at least we're justified to take action now. If you ever need us, feel free to tap our resources. Ah, how reliable of him. I had the backing of Dwargan, a nation undefeated for a millennium, and just having a place to run to in the event of defeat was enough to give me peace of mind in this fight. All right. We'll send off our envoy as planned. We will need to divide our forces between Central and the East in order to protect them. It's in our own interests to keep our army on the defensive, too, and be careful. This new tank weapon is a complete question mark on the battlefield. Even looking at the Empire's equipment, something tells me that the age of the sword may be coming to an end. Forgive me for putting you in such a dangerous role. Garzel, perhaps out of concern, added that statement. No, I sure couldn't tell him to rest easy. As he said, we didn't know how these magic tanks performed. So I decided to give him a warning, even though I didn't think it was necessary. Based on my own knowledge, I am aware of a weapon called a tank from my own world as well. They use controlled explosions of gunpowder to send metal shells flying through the air. It's a simple principle, although the mechanism it runs on is a lot more complex, but with their power, range, and accuracy, it's an incredible weapon, I think. If these empire-made magitanks run on a similar setup, there's a chance that current tactics can't handle them. Garzel was right. The age of the sword would soon be over, and it was likely to bring about an even more violent battlefield. What would happen if you used magic instead of gunpowder to send shells flying? I had Raphael simulate that for me, and the results were terrifying. It turned out that, depending on the spell invoked, you could create a magical artillery shell, a magishell. That was overwhelmingly more powerful than what a tank, the epitome of modern earthly science, could launch. And we're talking a massive weapon, too. Are you telling me that magic defenses won't work? Exactly. You'd need a full magic barrier to fend it off. And given the power involved, you'd need to redouble your defense with things like trenches and earthen walls. I knew it. I suppose all of us think the same way. We, too, have been working on a magic armor soldier project to prepare us for the new era. They might have beaten us to the punch, but it's not like we have any right to complain, eh? So can we beat them, or what? A tough question to answer. All I could give him was this. It's not a matter of can we or can't we, really, we're just going to. That's all I can tell you. The words seemed to satisfy Garzelle just as much as my friends here. Hair. Ha 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 ha. Well, ain't that reassuring. Best of luck out there. We're on it. That's how I ended my exchange with Garzelle. As final confirmations went, I thought it was pretty good. That's all the confirmation you need, right? It will suffice. 
we have a pledge from him that we can do whatever we like. I nodded my agreement with Benimaru. The time had come. Now that we'd reached this point, we didn't have to wait for the Empire to make a move. We were all ready to go here, so why not kick things off officially? Justice was on our side. The Imperial forces had invaded deep into the forest of Jura, that was Demon Lord territory, and there was no sugarcoating that. Now we needed to negotiate things so we'd look like we were panicked and definitely not aware of every single thing they were up to. So who to order for it? Gopta and Gable weren't exactly proper diplomats, and more importantly, they weren't very good negotiators, especially Gable. Looking back to our first encounter, I'm never gonna send him on any envoy work. So I decided to order Testarossa out. With her, at least, I knew she wouldn't get killed if the Empire decided to shoot first and ask questions later. Maybe it was all a farce, but we did need to offer a promise. I think it's just fine to launch a preemptive attack without saying anything, but when you're a demon lord, the way you act kind of matters. So I sent off a thought communication to make the order. As Raimuru and Gazelle were talking on their contact terminals, Gobta's first army corps, with around 12,000 soldiers, and Gable's third corps, around 3,000, had gathered together behind the Grand Gate into the Dwarven Kingdom, approximately 15,000 in all. They had not entered the cave itself but were camped in a large open square at the outer edge. The evacuation of everyone in the in-town was successfully completed, and now they were waiting for the Empire's next move. No messenger had come from the Empire yet, no surrender order ferried to them, but everyone gathered here could sense that the war was about to begin. The Dwarven army was also hurriedly preparing for combat. The Royal Order of Dwarves consisted of seven divisions, and two of them, the Engineering Division and the Magic Support Division, were busily reinforcing the main gate and erecting a temporary barrier. An earthen wall, built up with earth magic, could have a fire spell applied to it to instantly make it stouter than a brick equivalent, enhance it even further, and you had a virtual barrier of iron. Thus, in a very fluid process, a tri-layer defense wall was built outside the main gate, and as work continued on it, the Royal Order's heavy strike division sprang into action. The officers and soldiers were covered head to toe in magical gear, but despite that, they all nimbly lined up in formation. Some sort of event must have taken place, but Gobda and his army didn't pay it much mind, as the dwarves busied themselves, the first and third corps were all relaxing in their own ways. Gopta and Gable were sitting on the ground, having a friendly meal together. Next to them, for some reason, there was a table setting, complete with an extravagant parasol. Sitting on its white chairs were Testarossa and Ultima, who appeared to be enjoying a little tea party. They were being served by Veyron, looking every part like a staffer at a tropical resort. Despite his advanced age, his back was fully straight in an amazing, statuesque posture. Hey, you know, this is really, really good. It feels so, manly, yeah? Great stuff. Indeed, my goblin friend. I am just as satisfied. This delicate flavoring, and the more you chew, the more flavor seeps out of it. Truly a delight for the taste buds. Gopta and Gable were offering high praise to a meal prepared by Zonda, Ultima's underling. It was a whole roast on the bone, like a cartoon snack for a caveman, simply seasoned with salt and herbs. This wasn't from the army's pantry, whatever it was, Zonda had gone out and hunted it himself. As a chef, it is a tremendous honor to have two army generals offer me such praise. My specialty is court palace cuisine, so this kind of camp food is out of my expertise. Please forgive me if anything displeases you. With that, Zonda bowed gracefully and retreated to Ultima's side. His double-breasted chef's coat was a schooner-crafted masterpiece, made from Helmoth silk and dyed the same shade of light purple as Zonda's hair. It certainly made him stand out from the armor and military dress he was surrounded by. Even Testarossa and Ultima were sporting custom-made military uniforms, Testarossa was wearing pants, and Ultima opted for a skirt, but both were unmistakably army gear. It was no surprise that Zonda stood out. He carried himself in an ever-so-sophisticated way, one that seemed unsuitable for the battlefield. 
he certainly brought a touch of class to this camp, and by now, he was indispensable, he had been teaching many of the soldiers the finer points of camp cuisine, winning their hearts and stomachs, and being Ultima's direct underling gave him a lot of freedom. Ultima being rather a free spirit herself, she had a lot of authority as an advisor to core leader Gable, and she wasn't afraid to use it. With her bold, proud demeanor, she had no problem overriding any and all complaints from the other demons. She was practically demonic royalty already, and only a small handful of people could dare offer a complaint to her. It's not to my taste. You're not offering enough dishes, either. I wish there was more variety. I think you've got a point there. Going with these roasts and this basic hot pot, it's just way too skimpy. You've come to know Shuna and Mr. Yoshida by now. Hone your skills and make yourself more useful to us. Unlike the effusive Gobta and Gable, Testarossa and Ultima were not exactly fans. I'm deeply sorry, Zonda meekly replied, before Gable spoke up. No, no, Zonda, not at all. And I'm sure Ultima completely approves of your skill. The problem, I imagine, lies not in the taste. The sudden remark drew the attention of everyone around them. Testarossa looked intrigued, Ultima was peeved that someone was disagreeing with her, and Zonda was visibly shaken at the possibility that he just upset his boss. Veyron, meanwhile, was as unaffected as always. Gobda, of course, ignored all this and asked a question. Ha! Huh. What do you mean by that? Ah, thank you for asking, Gobta. How to put it? My younger sister gripes at me all the time, you see. She keeps saying I should think about things from a more feminine perspective. What do you mean by that? Gobta asked again, taking a bite out of his roast. That's the thing, Gobta. Here we are, enjoying this meal, not worrying about whoever might be seeing us but Testarossa and Ultima can't afford to follow our lead in that respect, no? Now Zonda understood what Gable was driving at. It made sense to him. Until he obtained a physical body, food had never been a requirement for him, and so he had forgotten something quite basic. Good cuisine, after all, was about more than just taste. Gee, Gable, that's a very good point. Not the kind of thing you normally say at all, either. No. No, it's something I'm working on as well, you see. Of course, it's honestly more something Sir Raimuru taught me, but... Gable began to spin an anecdote from when he asked Raimuru for advice not long ago. Raimuru, he had said to him, I want to be as popular with the women as you are. What do you suggest I do? You're asking me that? Because, look, I'm still a verg, ah, never mind. Gable let me give you this piece of wisdom. If you want girls to like you, you gotta learn how to be delicate. Do that, and they'll naturally flock to you. That, Gable proudly explained, was what Raimuru had told him. Then I remembered what Soka told me. And it dawned on me that Raimuru was just advising me not to do anything a woman wouldn't like, the most basic of things. Everyone was impressed by Gable's impassioned argument. So Raimaru strikes again, in a way. If he was overhearing this, he definitely would have blushed, good thing he wasn't around, then, because nobody else was going to stop Gable from prattling on about him. Lady Ultima, Lady Testarossa, please accept my apology. I promise I will do my best to meet your expectations the next time I cook for you. With a graceful bow, Zonda stepped in front of Ultima and Testarossa and took a knee. Look at that! you've got quite a talented servant. And meanwhile, look at mine. What are you talking about? Moss seems perfectly useful to me. And if Sian's working in your place, Tester, he must be incredibly good at paperwork, right? My servants are more about manual labor, so I envy you having someone you can assign those kinds of chores to. Well, Alt, maybe you're right. No point asking for what you can't have, though. Testarossa and Ultima continued talking, all but ignoring the kneeling Zonda. Their attitude might have seemed cold to Gobta and the rest, but it was actually quite the opposite. Being at the pinnacle of demons as they were, they rarely even took any interest in other people, let alone praised them. Veyron and Zonda, 
fully aware of this, became noticeably nervous when their names came up, but at the same time, they felt a sense of elation, like their souls were set aflame, basking in the recognition their masters offered them. But not everybody picked up on this. Boy, Gobta said, it's tough being a lady, huh? Like, I guess they're asking you for that thing where you have to cut it into small bites so it's easier to eat, right? I get what Gable's saying, but honestly, that's too much work. Gobta, that's the sort of thing you should never say out loud, no matter how strongly you feel about it. It's the first step, you see, to becoming a gentleman. That, yes, that, was what Sir Raimuru taught me. No, no, I understand that, okay? But this is a battlefield. You gotta eat when you can and not ask for fancy stuff. As a core leader, I think that's the right way to act around here. As long as I can eat, Gobda thought, what's it matter what it is? And given they were in a soon-to-be war zone, he felt justified pointing out how selfish it was to say something like that. The fact that he was appointed the leader of an entire army gave him a sense of responsibility, and what's more, he wanted to show his soldiers that he was just a bit cooler than all of them, or so he thought. That's why he said it. And he was right. It was a perfectly valid argument. But sometimes, people just won't listen to the truth. And Gobta probably should have thought about that first. Gobta's a pretty funny guy. That was actually hilarious. You said it. I'm so glad I'm assigned to him. Ultima and Testarossa were all smiles. Their eyes, on the other hand, weren't smiling at all. Oh, man, thought everybody but Gobta, these demons are serious trouble. W.H. Woe, Gobta. Um, Commander Gobta? Let's keep it at that. I'm sure our intelligence officers understand, so. It was Gobji, one of Gobta's aide de comp, who hurriedly stepped up to stop him. He knew Gobta enough to realize that his superior officer had no ill intentions, he was just expressing his honest opinion. To him, Gobta wasn't wrong about a thing, but in this world, being right wasn't enough to guarantee your survival. Some people simply didn't listen to valid arguments. As a goblin who knew how to read a social situation, Gobchi knew that Testarossa and Ultima were two people you did not want to get on the wrong side of. After all, common sense dictated that someone who enjoyed a little tea time on a battlefield was unconventional, to say the least. Gobta, he said to himself, you really shouldn't be lecturing those two. And as he predicted, Gobta was in a terrifyingly dangerous situation. Testarossa and Ultima weren't angry or anything. They simply thought he was an interesting toy. But if a pair of primal demons thought of him as a toy, it meant nothing less than Gobta's life hanging in the balance. But then a miracle happened. Hey, ah, Testarossa, you got a moment to chat? Raimuru chose this exact second to throw Testarossa a contact terminal call. Gobta's life was spared for another day. Not a problem at all. What can I do for you, Sir Raimuru? Testarossa kneeled on the spot, those around her immediately realized whom she was currently in contact with. It wasn't long before everyone else was on their knees, although Raimuru wasn't aware of that. Oh, um, wait one second, he nonchalantly said before sending a thought communication Gobta's and Gable's way, are we connected now? Yes, sir. I am on the line as well, my lord. They both sensed Raimuru nodding. But the next thing he said surprised them all. I've just finished a meeting with King Garzel. We decided that the Tempest forces would take the lead against the Empire, but before that, we're gonna go to the bargaining table with them. He really wanted to launch a preemptive attack, he explained, but before that, they planned to reach out and offer them a chance to surrender. Then Raimuru went on to explain his arrangement with Garzel, Testarossa and the others listening in without interrupting. Once he was done. So, Sir Raimuru, you'd like me to represent you in that negotiation? The ever-perceptive Testarossa spoke up first, she was confirming it for politeness's sake, but in her mind, it was already settled business. The problem, then, was how to entrap the Empire. Ah, yeah, I would. As a diplomat, I'll let you keep your authorization to act with my full powers if need be. 
You may also consult with me anytime via thought communication, and you'll still have the same status as a core commander, so I want you to work with Gobta and Gable to get the job done. As you wish. Although she and Ultima were currently deployed as observers, Testarossa was also the commander of the Western deployment. That army wouldn't have a role to play this time, but it was still one of the largest in Tempest. In terms of rank, that put her on par with Gobta and Gable, so she made the perfect candidate for an emissary to the Empire. Right. Great. Now, I imagine you're gonna be exposed to some danger in this job, but are you okay with that? Raimuru seemed concerned, but Testarossa had already gleefully accepted the post, nothing wrong with that, no. I will gladly show the ignorant citizens of the Empire the full majesty of your glory. Okay, um, cool? I mean, I'd like to avoid war if possible, but I don't think that's gonna be doable this time, so. So we will declare the Empire our enemies and lay waste to it, then? Huh? Well, like, I guess, but. Then leave this negotiation to me, Sir Raimaru. If they are foolish enough to reject your merciful ultimatum, they do not deserve to breathe for another minute. I will destroy each and every one of them. Testarossa was ready to kill. It visibly dismayed Gable. I'd much rather not have this terrifying woman in my life, he thought. Gobda, on the other hand, was still running on Gobda time. I don't think you have anything to worry about, Sir Raimaru. Testarossa's just talking a big game because she's excited for her first trip to the battlefield. I'll be supporting her every step of the way, so we're rock solid over here. It was a bold declaration for someone as socially oblivious as him. Wait, you'll join her? Of course. I'm commanding an army, I got a responsibility to uphold, and part of that job is to keep our more vulnerable women protected. Gopta stuck his chest out proudly at the stunned Raimuru. Even Testarossa had to chuckle a bit. This goblin. He's a fool, but I can't hate him for it. Being misunderstood to this extent even made Testarossa want to laugh it off. The fact that he totally failed to notice that she wasn't even trying to hide her brutality. He was a real my way or the highway guy, she had to admit. All right. Then I'll send Ranga over as well, so both he and you can be Testarossa's bodyguards. If the Empire agrees to our demands, then great. If they don't, it's gonna be war right then and there, so try not to die on me, okay? I'm on the job, Sir Raimaru. I got a lot of experience running from my opponents, you know. Ah yes, you do, don't you? Then go make me proud, Gobta. With that, Raimaru shut off the thought communication. The monster armies now had their marching orders, everyone fell quiet, collecting their thoughts. All right, we're finally up. Let's get this camp cleared out and get moving. Gopta's command roared across the cave, and with it, the monster army began moving as a single entity. As I gave the order to Testarossa's group, the main thought on my mind was hmm, this isn't exactly what I was expecting. Part of me began to wonder if they thought we were being too hasty but couldn't say anything about it. Which, I mean, I get it. If you want to be all majestic as a demon lord, it's not natural to act like you're freaking out. I think I handled that the right way with them, but I couldn't be sure. Still, it's amazing how much I can count on Testarossa. She's such a refined woman, and I was confident she'd make sure the Empire knew just how dignified a ruler I was. She said she was going to annihilate the Imperial Army, but I wondered if she was serious about that. She couldn't be, really. But then again, she and Diablo are like two peas in a pod, that made her a big handful for me, too, and it made me realize she was probably being serious. These primals are extremely dangerous. Maybe I should stop her. Ah, but it's too late for that, isn't it? This is war. You'll have all the time in the world to pity your adversary after you win. Besides, I was already seeing some unexpected benefits there. By that, I'm talking about Gobta's growth. Maybe it's because I'd put him in a position of responsibility, but I could tell he was making a serious effort to live up to it. He really became a man, I guess, and the more he grew, the easier things would be for me. 
I wanted him to keep up the good work, but I was afraid he might step on a landmine pretty soon. Yes, it had been fun to watch as a spectator, but before Testarossa got really angry, I thought maybe Gogta ought to be let in on the joke. With this in mind, I spoke up. Ranga, you there? At once. Ranga popped out from my shadow, tail wagging and looking all cute. I had an urge to sidle up and take a nap in his fluff, but I had to hold back. Ranga, team up with Gobta and protect him if anything happens. His tail froze mid-wag. After a moment of silence, he replied, sounding rather dejected. I understand, my lord. When do you want me to leave? He was kind of acting like a kid who didn't want to go on a car trip. It didn't take more than a moment's thought to realize what he was thinking, but my orders remained unchanged. As long as we didn't know what the Empire was fully capable of, Gobda, and Gobda alone, remained a concern of mine. Right now, if you could, please. I am off, then. With a hangdog look, pardon the pun, Ranga padded off. Did he hate being away from me that much? Thanks. I'm counting on you, okay. Gobta's gotten a lot more reliable lately, but I'll feel so much better if you're there for him. I felt kind of like a heel, but for now, I needed him to pitch in. So I gave him a few more parting words, and he immediately reacted. Leave this to me, my lord. Now he seemed to be glowing with motivation, his footsteps, languid up to now, were accelerating into a brisk trot. He can cast spatial transport anyway, so I was sure he'd make it to Gobta and the gang before they departed. Quite a relief. So we're gonna be negotiating with the Empire, but it's all but guaranteed our talks are gonna break down. Once they do, we plan to declare war on the spot and start fighting immediately. In which case, how should we position our forces? By the sound of Testarossa, we were definitely about to have war on our hands. I'd really like to avoid it, but it's impossible. If they've marched this deep into our lands, I sincerely doubted they'd go back without doing anything. At the very least, we'd need to tango with them one time, in order to show off our powers. But we were facing a tank battalion, an unknown force. An ill-advised strategy could seriously cost us. We had to decide on our plan carefully. And that was exactly the moment when Benimaru would come into play. If Testarossa's negotiations lead to war, our city will be immediately isolated inside the labyrinth, he told me. In that case, we'd better call Ramirez. Indeed. We've come this far. The war is about to start. I don't think she's going to be bored much longer. I feel it's wrong to think of war as entertainment, but... This is where a monster's way of thinking differs from a human's, I suppose. So? As we planned, our city would be protected by the labyrinth, the world's best defensive structure. We'd be fighting on our turf, and I'd like to believe that gave us the initiative. The problem was Gobta's force. If you think about it, the two forces are well out of proportion with each other. But at the same time, the enemy is amassed into a gigantic ball, and along those lines, we can think of these tanks as a single monster. If anything, we have the advantage. That, and as Benimaru confidently explained, the supply troops who came with the tanks didn't really even count as hostiles. I wasn't so sure about that, but his self-assured words were very convincing. I decided to hear him out. However, if we deploy our forces too widely, they might fall victim to the tank's fire. I made a calculation of their estimated power based on the knowledge you shared with me, Sir Raimuru, and the results convince me that the green numbers won't be able to stand up to it. Thus, for our first sortie against the Empire, I'd like to deploy the Goblin Riders alone. Huh? Isn't that a bit harsh? You want to challenge them with only a hundred mounted forces? That's right. We will begin with that, to see how things go. If the enemy's tanks are as I predict, we can win if we send the whole army into battle, but if they exceed our expectations, we will have to rethink our strategy at that point. So either way, we have to try to fight them, and when we do, I don't want to needlessly rack up casualties. Benimaru coolly laid it out for me. As he put it, the goblins would be used as a touchstone, and if things really went south, 
Gobda and his riders would wind up sacrificial lambs. But Benimaru was unfazed. In fact, he made this cold, calculated decision precisely because it'd be the most efficient thing to do, so what'll happen to them in the worst-case scenario? I've told them to use shadow motion to retreat as they see fit. Aha! And there was another reason why he couldn't deploy the green numbers, huh? Benimaru was making his estimates of the tank's performance based on my memory, or my knowledge, I guess. But everything I knew about tanks had come from what I'd seen on TV, essentially, so it was all pretty vague. But I also had a powerful ally in Raphael, so as vague as my knowledge was, I thought I was able to give Benimaru some pretty accurate specs. In addition to that, we already had visual confirmation of what the Empire's tanks looked like. We knew the length and caliber of their guns, and we were also aware of the sub-weapons they were equipped with, a bit like machine guns. They manufactured these with otherworlder expertise, I'm sure, so it should be similar in operation. Their power and performance were unknown, but as we figured, if we just paid attention to the stuff we should be wary of, it'd all work out. The Nimaru's estimations and Raphael's calculations were within the margin of error to each other. It was safe to say that Benimaru's plan was the right way. It was certainly better than anything an amateur like me could come up with anyway. His plan was as follows, first, as soon as the battle begins, the 100-strong goblin rider cavalry will charge in unison. They'll take advantage of their high-speed maneuverability, using erratic movements to give the tank guns no chance to aim. In this way, they should be able to avoid direct hits. Given their small size, they'll be able to nimbly respond to any situation, in fact, if they're lucky enough, they could use a stick and move approach to toy with their foes. Hearing all that, I was convinced. If you're scared, Benimaru apparently told Gobta's team, you lose. Of course, you never knew what would happen on the battlefield. The enemy might try pulling something wild on us, and there was every chance they'd score a lucky hit or two. I know he said that nobody's gonna die as long as they don't score a direct hit, but you never know until you pop open the lid. That was why we had to make sure everyone understood to retreat immediately in an emergency. But running away, keep in mind, is the last thing any of us want to do. I'd never allow them to sully your prestigious name, Sir Raimaru. Now I was more afraid of Benimaru than the Empire. Well, don't make them do anything rash, okay? I'm afraid that's impossible. In war, if you want to win, it's the polite thing to give it your all. Benimaru briskly smiled at me, no hesitation on his face. That was cool and all, but I had mixed feelings. I understood his point of view, but he was making it sound inevitable that someone was gonna get whacked out there. I don't really give a crap about my prestige. Having it helps keep my nation's name protected and all, but if we got ourselves killed to save our good name, wasn't that defeating the purpose? Like, I just didn't want to see any of my friends hurt, so. Well, let's just assume the worst and make sure the third corps is on standby, ready to be transported in at any time. If I was fighting this myself, I thought with an uneasy look in my eye, I'd never have to worry about any of this. Lieutenant General Gaster, Caligulio's confidant and leader of the armored division, was commanding the Magitank force for this expedition. He was a muscular and fearless man in his mid-thirties, and right then he was on the rear guard, sitting back in his state-of-the-art command vehicle and enjoying the atmosphere of the battlefield. The forest around him was as unchanged as always, with nothing to block their way. Gaster, who had grown accustomed to this scenery, began mulling over the fame he would gain from this battle. I'm going to defeat the armed nation of Dwargan, an impregnable fortress for over a thousand years, and Garzel himself, the heroic king. How thrilling can this get? In his mind, he envisioned all the people cheering for him. It'd be the birth of a new champion who would go down in history as one of the greatest of all time. Just dreaming about it made Gaster's heart sore. The man who defeated Garzel, the heroic king, would have the epithet hero applied to him for eternity, it had come in the not-too-distant future, guaranteed to happen. Gaster's Magitank force had enough war power to make sure of that. Two thousand of these magical tanks were now lined up, moving in well-drilled unison. 
their formation as they lumbered across the plains at the foot of the mountains was divided into twenty horizontal rows, each with a hundred tanks. It was a magnificent view, and Gaster couldn't have been happier to see it, but he was already falling into his opponent's hands. Each of these tanks was around thirty-five feet long by twelve feet wide, and with two thousand of them out at once, they couldn't just go anywhere. Gaster deployed his troops in the exact location he had surveyed in advance, and that, it turned out, was exactly where Raimuru and his advisers had expected them to be. Gaster had no idea this was going to happen, but he was an excellent soldier nonetheless, he was a lieutenant general, and as such, his personal combat skills were formidable. As he saw it, he was as good as any knight in the Imperial Guardians. The only reason I haven't been selected, he reasoned, is because I haven't had a chance to participate in ranking duels. Being in charge of a division like this is akin to being on military duty all the year through. That irked him mightily. Of course, a lieutenant general is a high-ranking position, there were only a handful in the empire, akin in social status to high-ranking nobility. He was well out of reach of the common person, no doubt, but that wasn't enough to satisfy Gaster. Someday, he would replace Caligulio and become a full-fledged commander himself, and then he'd be a hero. Gaster was an ambitious man, honor, not money, mattered to him. That was why he volunteered to wage the decisive battle against the heroic King Garzelle instead of conquering the labyrinth. And Gaster had more than enough ability to back up that ambition. He possessed the unique skill performer, which gave him command over any sort of audio phenomena, allowing him to analyze situations in detail simply by listening to the sound around him. He could also use special sound waves to issue specific commands to people, leading his allies even in the middle of chaotic battle. It was the greatest power an army officer could desire, but that wasn't all. Performer could also be used as a vicious attack. Gaster could manipulate sound waves and manipulate them at will, using a sonic cannon to destroy the very cells of his foes. Clearly, Gaster was one of the most powerful people in the Empire. PFFT. The Guardians might be strong and all, but only if they bear the legendary gear granted to them by the Emperor. I deserve those weapons and armor far more than any of them. If he could only get his hands on that legend class gear, he confidently believed, he, too, could join the lofty ranks of the single digits. Gaster's mind was occupied with all these fantasies, but he wasn't letting his guard down during this op, hmm? Something changing in the forest? The sound around him suddenly stopped. It was the first time he'd ever experienced such a thing. Aboard camp preparations and take cautionary positions. Upon giving the order, Gaster focused more intently, turning his attention to the forest to his left. The atmospheric sounds of birds and animals had disappeared, no insects were chirping at all. There was something tense in the air, that, and the sound of small footsteps, as well as that of leaves rustling closer and closer. It was far off but moving quickly. They're trying to take us by surprise. Not a bad move, but they picked the wrong foe to try it on. Gaster chuckled to himself. Based on his analysis of the ambient sound, there were approximately a hundred figures approaching. They had intelligence that the demon lord's forces were gathering near the inn town, so they likely deployed out from there. It was proof positive that Caligulio's plans were working out well. The demon lord's in town forces had completely missed the main body of the imperial army, and when a 700,000 strong army weighs down upon that demon lord's throat, oh, the sheer panic they'd all experience. Just imagining the scene made Gaster smirk. Now they were a bit over six miles away. Before much longer, they'd be in range of their magic cannons. Those could fire up to nineteen miles away, at the expense of accuracy dwindling to near nothing, the actual effective range was more like one and a half or two miles. Of course, with the right type of explosive shells, you didn't need to worry about accuracy. This enemy force was small, and concentrated in a tiny area. Perhaps they thought they could use the trees as cover, as long as they didn't go out in the open. Well, think again. First, let's give them a salute to liven things up. Their special ammunition was still in the prototype stage, so they could prepare only two rounds, but the blast radius could extend up to a hundred feet or so. 
The power of that explosion was currently unmatched by explosive magic, generating tens of thousands of degrees of heat and a concussive shock wave that could deform the terrain itself. It was a one-of-a-kind weapon, one only available on Gaster's command vehicle, but he had no intention of saving it for a rainy day. Without hesitation, he loaded it up and pointed the muzzle of his cannon into the forest. Then he barked out orders to his battalion, in the unlikely event that the enemy escaped, he wanted them to be ready to intercept. Left flank battalion, turn counterclockwise. The soldiers had been setting up tents for their encampment, but given that the dwarven kingdom was under twenty miles away, they were in a constant state of tension. As soon as they received the order from Gasta, they began calmly packing up the wagons the tanks were towing. It wasn't long before everyone was ready for battle. Without another moment's hesitation, the left-wing battalion of five hundred tanks floated in the air, orienting itself toward the forest. Gaster and his men were ready, and as if waiting for that moment, a single monster appeared from the depths of the lush forest. It was wolf-shaped, with two horns growing out of its forehead, and its enormity was remarkable, a good sixteen feet long, making it look proportional to one of their tanks. This has to be the Ranga monster reported by the IIB. They call him the Demon Lord's pet or some such nonsense, but supposedly he ranks an A-plus in battle. That made him a big deal, then. Just one? What are they thinking? Wait. Gaster considered what this wolf's mission was. If he came alone, he's not here to fight. It's probably serving as some kind of warning. It figures. You want to protect your position as Demon Lord, so you can't take any half measures. He he he. You'll regret that. As Gaster saw it, his enemy wanted to intimidate him with Ranga's towering presence, sapping his will to fight. It seems this Raimuru is quite a proud demon lord, isn't he? Trying to protect his lofty reputation by giving up the chance to surprise us? He let out a loud, ringing laugh. His officers quickly joined him, melting the anxiety among their soldiers, they were at just the right level of tension. Ranga was close to them now, his steps relaxed. He was showing no sign of a fight, as Gaster suspected, he was here to negotiate. He finally stopped about thirty feet away, right in front of the lieutenant general and his team. A woman who had been sitting side saddle on him gracefully jumped off his back, making hardly a sound as she did. Then without a care in the world, she walked right up to Gaster's vehicle. When he laid eyes upon her, this woman with beauty beyond what any human could possibly achieve, Gaster felt a chill run down his spine, like a dagger of ice had stabbed him. What? The sounds this woman makes. It's so strange. There was the sound of a heartbeat, but it was playing an eerie melody. He could hear her blood flow as well, but it was both faster and quieter than that of a human being. Too fast, even. If someone's blood flowed that fast, it'd be far too much for the body to bear. Now Ranga didn't even register to Gaster, his eyes were squarely upon the woman. Her long pure white hair flowed beautifully, accentuating her beauty, but her body was clothed in a stern military uniform that poorly matched her looks. The bottom of it resembled a pair of riding pants, with the thighs loosely bulging out. There was someone else riding on Ranga's back, but he didn't even register to Gaster, that's how much the eerie presence of the woman had taken over his consciousness. Who is she? The IRB said nothing about her. Rangas considered a high-ranking official of the Demon Lords, and this woman's far more dangerous than him. Gaster felt justified in criticizing the Imperial Information Bureau. But there was no one here to complain to. More important right then was the fact that someone intimately close with the Demon Lord was here with him so he spoke in a dignified voice to hide his overwhelming anxiety. You're an emissary from the demon lord Raimuru, aren't you? You contacted me quicker than anticipated, but I'm glad his officers are such thoughtful, talented people, so what is your business? The woman smiled sweetly at Gaster's question. It is a pleasure to meet you. My name is Testarossa, and I serve the great demon lord Raimuru, ruler of these lands. As for why I've come here today. After saying that much, the woman's smile widened. It was a smile of pure, unadulterated evil. I convey to you the words of my master, 
leave here at once, and we will overlook this violation of our borders. But if you invade any farther, you will be shown no mercy. Testarossa's blood-red eyes glowed as she made her statement. Gaston nervously gasped. He tried to say surely you're joking or the like, but before he could, Testarossa moved, just a light wave of the hand, but at that moment, a wall of flames appeared just a couple feet in front of the tanked battalion's first row. It was gone in an instant, but on the ground, the molten remains of the fire had formed a fine line of glass in the soil. Do I make myself clear? Cross this line, and your lives will be extinguished. If you are not prepared for that, stay where you are. Now, good day to you. Testarossa gave the lieutenant general a graceful bow, then turned on her heels and walked away, as if she had lost interest in the conversation. It was her way of stating that the time for negotiating was over. Ranga, of course, was wagging his tail at her. Only the small figure swinging around on his back still took notice of Gasta, but Gasta himself no longer cared. H. How dare you make fun of me? Who the hell do you think you're talking to? And attempting such an obvious bluff in front of all this firepower. He was furious, as if everything he ever believed in had been shattered, and it instantly cost him his composure. She had said what she wanted to say, and she hadn't given Gasta's side even a moment of her time, the kind of approach the Empire typically used on their foes. But receiving it back in kind had ignited Gasta's anger, and any fear he felt before had disappeared. So he made the wrong decision. He was around fifteen feet away from Testarossa, who was now exactly halfway between him and Ranga. Think I'll let you get away with this? Gasta made up his mind. Courtesy to emissaries was not a concern for the Empire. If they surrender, fine. If not, prepare to be overrun with all our might. That was the Empire's motto, and since Testarossa just insulted the Empire with her attitude, that was more than enough reason to begin hostilities. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Shoot that cocky bastard's head off. After that, have the twenty tanks in front fire a simultaneous volley. Let's show the demons lurking in the forest the majesty of our empire. Secretly, Gaster used his performer skill to lay down his orders. The first to react was the sniper attached to his command vehicle. Quickly, he lifted up his rifle and took aim at Testarossa, and then the long-range spellgun fired off a silent shot. This was an enhanced version of the standard magic-powered spellgun, its range extended to over a mile, at only a couple dozen feet away, she was as good as dead. The bullet inside was infused with the elemental magic fireball, and what would happen if a bullet filled with that ripped into your body? Well before the target could think about it, they'd explode into flames, burning from the inside out. Even if a monster was naturally resistant to magic, that resistance often didn't extend to its internals. There was no way to escape from a bullet traveling faster than the speed of sound, and Gaster was thus assured of the Testarossa's impending death. But the moment the bullet was released and over the threshold, Testarossa turned around, her face so evil, and so beautiful. Gaster's eyes widened in astonishment. The bullet that was supposed to pierce Testarossa's body was stopped by a single, delicate index finger. This was a bullet fired at three times the speed of sound, packed to the gills with magic force, but that magic never released itself. Instead, it was helplessly plucked out of the air and discarded, like she was playing with some cheap toy. So that's your answer? Well, lovely. A very fine one, too. Let's make it a fair fight, then. With that, Testarossa joined Ranga, never looking back, and then they walked away, as if nothing had happened. Gaster almost fell into a panic, but he overcame it by sheer force of will. Fear and humiliation competed against each other in his mind, and humiliation won out. The rank-and-file soldiers had no idea what just happened, only he and the sniper accurately understood. If that was how it was, time to continue as planned, and mow them down with the tank guns, their most powerful weapons. That was the best means he had to protect his pride as an imperial soldier. Lieutenant General, what should we do? Don't fall back. Don't let her tricks and illusions deceive you. We are the glorious imperial army, and we will bring victory to His Majesty the Emperor. 
begin the bombardment as planned, now. Responding to Gaster's shouted command, the tanks deployed on the left flank went on the move, the warning had been abjectly ignored. The first row trundled forward in order to build space between themselves, and with that, the glass boundary line was broken. The war was on, and it came a lot more easily than expected. The imperial troops didn't hesitate to step over the final warning line Testarossa had burned into the ground, and with that, we were at war with the Eastern Empire. It's on, isn't it? Yes. And this is just the beginning. Ramirez and Valdora were talking to each other, acting all haughty and laid back in their rather lofty chairs. I let out a sigh. This wasn't a game, it was real war. I wished they'd brace themselves and treat this a little more seriously. Yeah, great, ah, uh, can you get the town evacuated now, please? Right on. Just leave it to good old Ramirez. Ramirez cheerfully answered my request, and the next moment, without a sound, our capital city of Raimuru was quarantined in the dungeon. I had delayed this quarantine until the very last minute so we could keep pretending to be oblivious to the enemy, but now the game was over. As soon as they ignored Testarossa's advice, there was no need to hold back. Oh, I had a message from Thraney, Ramirez said after effortlessly wrapping that up, as if she'd just remembered it. Hmm. Like, she detected some fishy-looking character or something, so she's gonna go greet them. Huh? What's that mean? Well, I'm not sure I really know, either, you know? A dumb question on my part. It was useless to ask Ramirez for anything in the way of details. She didn't even work for me anyway, so I had no right to complain. Besides, we kind of got her wrapped up in this war, so I was grateful she was cooperating with us at all. And speaking of Thraney, she can be pretty damn lax about things, too, come to think of it. C.I., do we need to do anything about our intruders yet? I was a little worried, so I checked with C.I. They will not be a problem for now, sir. All we have to do is keep an eye on the gate placed on the surface, as planned. Well, I was glad I wasn't overthinking it, then. It sounded like a few spies had made their way in, but C.I. and his team Koryami were making quick work of them, so I guess there wasn't much to worry about. Now, let's take a quick look at the labyrinth structure. Floors 91 to 95 were now where floors 96 through 100 used to be. The town of Raimuru on the surface had been transported lock, stock, and barrel to the lowest level, the temporary floor 101. You had to defeat Veldora to reach this level, and common sense dictated that if things came to that, we'd be screwed anyway. The real final defense we deployed would be on floor 95. Floors 91 through 94 were now the dragon rooms, and if you got past them, you'd find yourself in the vast chamber where Veldora awaited. Behind that chamber was the control center we were sitting in now, if Veldora was defeated, we could buy some time in there, put the town back on the surface, and let the residents flee under Gell's protection. It was, frankly, a desperation move, so I very much preferred if our floor bosses did their best for us instead. Either way, we could at least be assured that the labyrinth was as defended as best as it possibly could be. Really, even if your typical army tried to break through floor 95, it'd be impossible for them. This being wartime, all usual dungeon services were naturally suspended until further notice. We weren't gonna sell any more resurrection bracelets, of course, and the inns and bathrooms were shut down, too. Any would-be visitors would need to bring all their own food and necessities. We even planned to cut off access to the water sources every five floors, which was bound to make things a lot harder. If you really wanted to beat the dungeon, it'd take you days, months, even. In a battlefield like this, Liga wasn't necessarily better, in fact, having too big a force could really drag you down. Based on the intel Ghidorah and others gave me, nearly all Imperial soldiers had undergone body augmentation, allowing them to go without food or drink for a week. But even so, I couldn't imagine them having an easy time in the labyrinth. We ran simulations with several Night Corps from the Western nations, but the chances of successfully conquering this place were slim to none. Even if the Empire's army was that much better than them all, 
it wasn't going to be a walk in the park for them. So maybe I was worrying too much. Still, we better not let our guard down. The enemy might try to sneak their way through unnoticed, and we'd have to adjust our tactics based on what they tried. But either way, our preparations were now complete. We'd already informed our neighbor nations of the empire's movements, and I was sure they were all praying for our victory. If worse came to worst, the western deployment was on standby, and for everything else, they'd have to take action as the situation demanded. Now it was time to return my attention to the battlefield. Testarossa, regrouped with Gobta, was riding away on Ranga. The Empire's tanks were behind them, giving chase, and judging by how their gun turrets were moving, they seemed ready to fire post-haste. Are they all right? If they're hit, probably not, but that's unlikely to happen. Benimaru seemed intrepid as always. Wasting no time, he used his unique skill-born leader to send orders to the First and Third Corps. The Tempest forces all began moving at once. The green numbers now carefully advanced toward the enemy's rear, entering the forest and using the vegetation as a shield as they made every effort to avoid enemy detection. If they could win the fight, they'd charge, if not, they'd retreat, but until they were sure either way, they didn't intend to make any bold moves. Gable's team Hiryu, a hundred-strong corps of flying raiders, joined three hundred wyvern riders picked from the blue numbers in the skies. Their plan was to try attacking the slow, rumbling tanks from the air, which I thought was a good idea, but the enemy had air power of its own. Once that stuff reached the battle site, that was when the real war would begin. Finally, Gobta's force was currently the closest one to the enemy, as long as we didn't know what those tank guns could do, staying within range of them would be a death wish. They were still a healthy distance away from the advancing tanks, but as long as we didn't know exactly what their range was, we needed to stay on guard. That, and while I didn't think the Empire was aware of the goblin riders yet, it looked like those tanks were ready to shoot. Maybe they had some kind of new weapon, one not even Ghidorah was aware of? Report. Based on the tank gun's orientation and angle, they are taking accurate aim. It is believed they have a sound grasp of the goblin riders lurking in the trees. Huh? Ah, that's bad, isn't it? Benimaru, I think the enemy has some means to locate the goblins. Understood. I took that possibility into consideration, so Gobta's force is the sole group comprising the advance team. I was the only one panicking, Benimaru was relaxed as ever. Apparently this was all part of the script, so I decided to trust Benimaru and watch how things went, there were two thousand tanks in total. Five hundred of them had turned around, on patrol for the goblins, and the twenty tanks in the front row were about to fire their main guns. The one big notable difference between these tanks and the ones on earth was that these had shorter barrels, maybe? They had been traversing the foothills of the mountain range, but they still had some thick vegetation to get through. Those short barrels probably made turning easy, or I suppose they were knocking down trees with brute force, too. Still, ease of turning makes dense formations a lot easier to organize. All of them could turn quickly without worrying about bashing gun barrels against each other. I wasn't sure they were long enough to provide a lot of accuracy and range, but that wasn't for us to worry about. The fact that these tanks were in actual operation probably indicated that any problems along those lines were already worked out. And what about Gobta's team? Well, Gobta was already back with his troops, he looked pretty pale, but I doubted it was because he was scared of the tank squad. Perhaps he realized the truth about Testarossa, and it dawned on him how much danger he was actually in. Testarossa, meanwhile, was sitting on Ranga's back, legs to one side as she gracefully ruffled his fur. When the negotiations were over, she apparently assumed her job was done. She did deserve a lot of credit for getting back safely like this. She could afford to knock off for a little while, but I didn't think now was the right time for it. As I was thinking about this, the tank guns finally opened fire. Twenty-one shells flew on in. It was hard to make out through the Argos system, but one shot fired from the command vehicle looked different from the others. What was that? Gobda, in shadow right now. All riders, in shadow. 
Renimaru left my question in the dust as he gave the order. Gopta quickly responded. Without a moment's pause, the goblin riders used shadow motion to disappear from the scene. Immediately afterward, a rain of shells pelted the area, a storm of twenty-one lethal blasts. It was a terrifying hellscape to imagine. Understood. The caliber of the tank guns is 120 millimeters, so the mass of the shells is estimated to be approximately 46 pounds. Based on the distance to the point of impact and the time of arrival, the velocity was found to be slightly under six times the speed of sound. The kinetic energy of each shell is proportional to its mass multiplied by the speed of flight squared. From these conditions, the muzzle energy and penetrative capacity can be calculated. The velocity drop is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional load, the air resistance is taken into account by simulating the surrounding environment, and these figures are multiplied by the magic power factor inside the shell. Um, I hate to interrupt you while you're having such a ball describing all this stuff to me, but, like, I don't even know what a stick of dynamite can do, really, so if you could maybe give it to me in beginner terms. Acknowledged. In specific terms, a direct hit would shatter even the great gate of the Dwarven Kingdom. Not even an A-ranked dragon could withstand it. Anyone within fifteen feet of impact would be severely damaged by concussive force, and survival for anyone ranked C or below would be out of the question. Right, thank you. Could have started with that, you know. Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's, like, real bad, isn't it? That, plus there was that mystery shell mixed in with them. I began wondering if Gobda was really all right, but my fears were unfounded. As soon as one shell landed, the ground exploded. Then it happened again, twenty times in a row, defacing the terrain. As soon as the last shot hit the target, the space the goblin riders were in burst into flames, a blast of wind and a localized thunderstorm ripping the land apart. All this carnage extended across at least a couple hundred feet, demonstrating the tremendous power of the blast. That must have been the effect of the mystery shell, it was like a nuclear bombardment. How the heck did they develop this? Of course, I could only marvel at it because I knew Gobta's gang was safe. Thanks to their instant response to Benimaru's command, they had all shadow motion ed out of there. Glad you're okay. I wouldn't call myself okay, sir. The shock wave made it through to shadow space, too. Anybody hurt? No, we're good on that. No casualties, thanks to Benimaru. Gobta replied in his usual cheery voice. I could hear him griping about how much it hurt or something, but, ah, I'm sure he's okay. I'm not sure if Testarossa is capable of shadow motion, but she seems to be fine, so no need to worry about her. For now, the big question is, what's our next move? Time to use thought communication to set up a conference call. Benimaru, Gobta, Testarossa, and I were on the line. I also activated Mind Accelerate to make the best use of physical time as possible, that way, we could have a productive meeting in a matter of minutes, so what do we do now? I wanted to hear Benimaru's opinion. Right now, Gable and his troops are on their way to launch a raid on the enemy tank force. I'd like Gobta's force to move out and help execute a pincer strike on them. Hmm. Isn't that dangerous? It is, but Gable's force will serve as a diversion. Gobta's force will use that opportunity to attack. The tanks pack more destructive force than expected, but their mobility is within our expectations. We stand a good enough chance of winning. Bold words from Benimaru, to be sure. Thanks to this little skirmish, we now knew that Gable's air force could fly faster than the tank guns could turn. According to Benimaru, if Team Hiryu focused on evasion, they wouldn't be hit by any gunfire. He thought it'd be very hard to shoot them down, but, I mean, really, if I was flying around up there, I'd be pretty scared. Gable, despite it all, was a pretty seriously brave Dragonute, so I didn't think he'd have a problem with it, but still, Benimaru had a point, though. As long as you were in flight, all you had to do was get out of the line of fire, and you wouldn't take any damage. As for Gable, well, I was sure his fighting spirit would get him through this. 
that left Gogta's team. Ah, we're going in, too. You're going to be the star of the show. But don't worry. Once you're in among them all, they'll slow down to avoid any bouts of friendly fire. So when Gable and his force start their diversion, run as fast as you can. These orders sounded monstrous to me. Ogreish, if you will, which I supposed was appropriate for Benimaru species. Okay, so um, you want us to keep up shadow motion while we're doing this? Benimaru shook his head. That'll be dangerous. The enemy will likely have a variety of defensive measures in place, like monster detection and protective barriers. They might have anti-skill measures as well, so it's best not to get fancy with our tricks. I agreed with him on this. There was no way the enemy would keep their treasured tanks that vulnerable, it was safe to assume there was a full defensive arsenal on them. Anti-skill barriers were a known thing, too, and if they used those on us, we were in trouble. Maybe it was actually safer to just go for a frontal attack here. There's a legion magic known as Interface Barrier that I am aware of. It is a magic spell that prevents surprise attacks from other dimensional spaces, but it also may potentially block the legion from moving. As Benimaru said, a head-on rush is probably the safest way to go. Testarossa summed up what I wanted to say very well. Gopta Shaw seemed convinced. I, I get it. If you say so, Testarossa, I'm not gonna complain about anything. Wow. Gopta was so freaked out by her. But after the way he slammed someone incomprehensibly more powerful than him, it's only natural that he'd be kind of intimidated. I was hoping, or looking forward to, um, well, let's just say that I'll keep a close eye on how their relationship pans out. Gopta, you should know that people are not always what they seem. Keep that in mind and please try to avoid making the same mistakes again, okay? You could say that to me as well, I guess, I mean, I didn't even realize what Testarossa and company were until it was spelled out for me. Righto. I'm real sorry about it. Good. Good idea, Bobta. What is he talking about? Benimaru asked me outside the call. Oh. It's not really a secret, I guess. Just Gobta putting his foot in his mouth again. Ah, you mean about Testarossa? Well, he is maturing, yes, but in the most important parts of his life, not so much. It's not a bad thing for him to get burned now and then. He chuckled at this. By the way, he continued, who were the people that Diablo brought back with him? I sense a certain ominous vibe from the three girls in particular, but... Benimaru had accepted them without complaint, because I had clearly given them my seal of approval. But he was still wondering where those ladies came from, no doubt. Then again, these were primals, real bad news in demon Dom. Maybe he was better off not knowing. On the other hand, I couldn't just keep it a secret forever, could I? It's hard for me to keep my mouth shut to the very people I trust the most. I was sure Xion didn't know and wouldn't care, but maybe I should tell Benimaru the truth after all. Let me tell you about them in a bit, all right? Benimaru shrugged. Indeed. Not a topic to worry about during a war. And if he was willing to agree to that, time to shift gears. All right, Gopta. We're at war right now. It's good to reflect on your past mistakes, but it won't matter unless you come back alive. Yeah, I know. Is there anything you don't understand about your mission? No problems here, Benimaru. We'll move over to the edge of the forest and rush in just as Gable launches his attack. Very good. Put everything you have into this. Yes, sir. The fright was gone from Gopta's voice. I was sure he'd be able to concentrate on the mission now. And in another few moments, our thought communication conference was over. A few minutes later, the third corps led by Gable attacked the tank battalion. Gwahahaha. Behold my exploits. You slow-moving bastards are no match for us. Gable was in his usual form, making a big show out of everything he did. I had my concerns about it, but that was just Gable being Gable. And indeed, the tanks struggled to react immediately to his force. As Benimaru had predicted, their guns were unable to catch Gable and his cohorts. That was largely to Gable's credit, 
he demonstrated superb command, and everyone reacted to him with perfect coordination. That must have been the result of a great deal of training, while I wasn't paying attention, they had acquired some remarkable skills in air combat. So Team Hiryu was doing a fine job, but the 300 Wyvern riders were putting in a great effort, too. I guess we had managed to build up a decent amount of spare riders, too, once we procured some more Wyverns, I figured they'd become a real force to be reckoned with. Gable was all about creating a diversion out there, but that didn't mean they weren't attacking at all. He was having the Wyverns spit fireballs, providing another feint. That B plus rank wasn't just for show on those guys, they were easily as good as the fireballs conjured by your average sorcerer, not enough to break through a tank's magic defense, maybe, but it was still effective against infantry. It was a nice primer on just how effective Gable's air-to-ground strikes could be, and while the results they put up were minimal damage-wise, they expertly fulfilled their tactical role. Gobter, too, had successfully switched mental gears. There was no hesitation in his command, and he was charging straight at the tank forces with head-on, perfectly timed movements. There were 500 tanks facing Gobta's force, with another 1500 lined up and pointed toward the Dwarven Kingdom. If the goblin riders could get that far into their ranks, they wouldn't be able to make any careless moves. It'd be a huge victory for us if that happened, but the imperial forces weren't incompetent, either. They'd desperately try to block them, and from there on, it'd be a battle of skill and speed. Gobta seemed to understand this, and as he followed Benimaru's orders, he used his thunderous speed to zoom toward the battalion. Not a moment's attention was paid to the muzzles pointed at them, not a hint of fear. There was only about a hundred yards left to the front row. The goblin riders could run that distance in under six seconds. A few shots were fired their way, but the goblins didn't flinch, keeping up their speed. In fact, the shells exploded far away from them, presumably they were warning shots. It only proved that the imperial army was in a state of turmoil. Not a single move was wasted among the riders as they disposed of the obstacles blocking their way with computer-like precision. Even now the infantry members guarding the tanks were trying to engage them, but the wolves made quick work of them. Range, zero. They had successfully approached the tank battalion, their primary target. There was Ranga, running in the lead, Gobta looking as manly as he could muster on his back. He gave a silent signal to Gobji running right behind him, and Gobji nodded back. The next moment, he split off from the platoon, headed up to a tank turret, and threw a little something inside, a glowing red jewel. This was an element core, Kurobe had manufactured a bunch of empty cores for me, and then I had cherries infuse them with flame magic. Flare bombs, you could call them. But will these work? A resounding explosion shot forth from inside the tank, at its weakest point. If this didn't have the desired effect, we were planning to abort the mission at once. Will this be okay? Do not worry, Raimaru. Trust in our friend Cherries. Yes, Sir Raimaru, take heart. If I put in just enough magical power that it didn't spontaneously explode, I am sure it'd be no problem to disable that hunk of iron. I'm sure it'll be fine, too, but this is our first time experimenting with it. So of course I'm gonna be. The tank exploded. See? I told you, didn't I? I told you my plan was foolproof. I was the one who came up with this idea, you see. That was why I was so anxious about it. But if it worked, now I wanted to brag about it. Oh, sure, bask in it. That is so like you, Raimaru. I don't need that from either of you. Cherries was tremendously proud of himself, when Nimaru and Beretta gave that a resigned chuckle. Shion and Diablo just smiled. The second phase of the operation was a success, and now the atmosphere around here was notably more cheerful. So far, this was just a prelude. The next goal was to get deep inside of them, pay no mind to the battalion facing Gobta's force and strike the middle of their army. The goblins ran on, striking at the infantry position to protect their tank's blind spots, like a giant monster swarming across the battlefield in all directions. Their movements, shown on our big screen, had a refined beauty to them. 
Gob does sure done it, hasn't he? Now none of those tank guns can target us, I said. No, we can't be too careful, Benimaru cautioned. Depending on their commander, they may shoot at us anyway and accept any collateral damage. That was absurd, but then again, this was war. We had to be prepared for that. Besides, the enemy has air power, too. It's still too early to rest easy. That's right, I thought, turning my gaze to another large screen, looking at the enemy aircraft on it, I could tell they were increasing their speed. It seemed the Empire could stay in communication with them, one way or another. Once the enemy air force arrived, Gable would be compelled to deal with them, leaving the goblin riders isolated on the battlefield. After that took place, it was a race against time. We needed decisive results while we could get them. As if answering my expectations, the battle continued to progress rapidly. Gopta and Gable were both making the most of their training, achieving real results in the first battle of this war. But something always goes wrong sooner or later. As Benimaru just said, it was too early to rest easy. Gasta glared at the approaching goblins with a singular abhorrence. Damn them! Thinking they can own us. He felt a deep, primal resentment for them, and he promised himself that he'd take it out on them all shortly. A few moments ago, Testarossa, her pure white hair fluttering in the air, had put a mortal fear inside him. Not wanting to admit it, Gaster decided to instead rebuild his confidence by tearing the goblins to pieces. No matter how fast these monsters moved, he thought, they'd just be a disruption, nothing that could damage a tank. But the explosions that roared across the battlefield shattered that idea quickly. No? Gaster had to keep himself from shouting it out loud. No way could a commander show himself upset on the battlefield. He was still an able leader, and he hadn't lost his ability to make sane decisions. Lieutenant General, what will we do? Don't panic. Look at the enemy's moves. They've only destroyed one tank, and there's no sign of any follow-up. That bomb was one of the few trump cards they have. Yes. You're right, now that you mention it. Otherwise, those flying lizards would be scattering them all over the field. Gaston nodded. He thought he had kept himself calm enough to make the right decision. But this was wrong. In fact, Raimaru had prepared over 3,000 flare bombs for this fight. Every member of Gobta's goblin riders carried ten of them, and every flying lizard Gable and Team Hiryu also had ten on hand. Team Hiryu hadn't used them so far because they were focusing on diversionary tactics, that, and they knew flare bombs wouldn't unlock their full potential unless used in an enclosed space. In such a space, the power of a gunpowder blast was easily doubled, and the same logic applied to flare bombs. Benimaru's focus here was on destroying tanks, not infantry, so he refused to let those bombs go to waste. The important thing today wasn't instant glory, it was making this op a success, and Gobda, Gable, and all the monsters under their command were aware of this. Gasta, blissfully unaware, was regaining his composure. I must commend you for unleashing that new weapon of yours, but we will still win the day. He might have misread the ace up the goblin's sleeve, but he did know what they were aiming to achieve. They ignored the left-wing battalion because their goal is to destroy this main force, right? If that's the case, we have our choice of ways to stop them. Gable and the lizards were certainly putting on a flashy show up there, but the tanks were protected from that with a magical barrier. The only thing to be wary of was this new weapon, and if that was the case, all they had to do was keep Gobta's force at arm's length. Have them deal with them in a compacted air battle formation. Gaster's order surprised his second in command. Lieutenant General, that's dangerous. Some of us are in close quarters battle with the enemy. We'll be risking friendly fire. So what? If they're in the way, just blow them away with our tank guns. Our glorious Imperial Army doesn't need incompetent louts dragging them down anyway. What? And with that said out loud, Gaster's associate could no longer stop him. A few tanks and a lot of infantry would get caught up in the carnage, but the battle was certain to be won, and the aide knew it. Gaster was willing to sacrifice a few pawns to win the day, 
and without that kind of vision and determination, perhaps being an army commander was impossible. Are there any legal problems with that? No, sir, none. The staff officer accompanying Gasta had no objection, now it was Gasta's turn to shine. Left flank battalion, compacted air battle formation. The order came directly from him, not through any subordinate, allowing the left wing to take formation faster than ever. Ignoring the infantry overtaken by goblins, they used their remaining vehicles to block the road, then turned their guns, so the tanks at the front and rear were all but right next to each other. It was a formation that defied all common sense in modern warfare. What? That's nuts. It was only natural that Gobda was stunned. Taking advantage of their huge size, the tanks crowded together, deliberately trying to close the gaps in their ranks. It would make it impossible for any of them to maneuver, but it worked, Gobta's forces could no longer run through the gaps between tanks. But the surprises weren't over yet. Next, the left wing spread out in a circle, forming a barricade around the goblins. In response, half of the central battalion also went on the move, floating into the air before turning around and landing right on the backs of the frontline tanks, now they were a wall, fully blocking the goblins' way. Nearly a thousand tanks had linked together to form a single, gigantic fortress. There would be no destroying the central force now. I heard they could move like that, but I never thought they'd try something like this. Gobchi, Gobda's second in command, was similarly stunned by the scene in front of him. Put up a machine gun barrage and pinned them down. This kicked off a three dimensional sweep of machine gun fire. The multifaceted barrage put the stops on the high speed maneuvering Gobta's team was best at. They were surrounded by tanks and the infantry accompanying them, and they didn't care how many friendlies this strategy killed. Ah, this is bad. I'm not sure we can keep going with this operation. Gobta grew upset. The Nimaru's strategy was faltering. Seeing the Imperial forces get shot by their own allies made even Gobta panic a bit. NNNH. I'm sorry, Gobta. I'd love to help you, but we've got our hands full. Gable's force, meanwhile, was being exposed to aerial bombardment. The tank guns might not have been able to hit them, but those tanks were also equipped with machine guns, successfully keeping Team Hiryu in check. Now Gasta, the man in command, had fully regained his composure. The difference in numbers had become a decisive advantage, and bad news often tends to come in groups. Sorry to keep you, Lieutenant General. The Flying Combat Corps, led by Major General Faraga, had just shown up. They were a hundred airships strong, and now they were Gable's problem, just as Gobda was facing an even more difficult situation. It's about time, Faraga. It's a dead end for them now. Now's the perfect time to test out our top-secret magic cancellers, isn't it? Ha ha. There's no beating you, Lieutenant General. In that case, let's see if we can't get in on this. We'll share the credit today. Don't get sloppy. Yes, sir. Good luck to you. Gasta and Faraga, speaking on a special closed line, swore to fight together. For Gasta, he wanted to make sure this op was rock solid. For Faraga, this was a warm-up before the main course and a way to show he could be useful in real battle. Despite piloting such valuable airships, the Flying Combat Corps occupied the lowest rung among the three divisions. In his mind, they needed to start making a name for themselves, and with him in the fray now, things were starting to look bleak for the Tempest Force. Gopta's riders, of course, understood the change of tides better than anyone. What do you say, Commander Gopta? Ah, this ain't gonna work. Let's get out of here. A good idea. With the situation changed, there is no need to force matters. Gopta made the right decision. From the get-go, he'd had one golden rule drilled into him, don't try to force your strategy, and if something unforeseen happens, retreat to fight another day. And with Benimaru, who had overseen the riders for quite a long time, giving the retreat order, every one of the goblins realized the danger. Even in fleeing, they all worked in unison, turning around without the slightest delay. Then they tried shadow motion to retreat, but... Gobda, the enemy is not that unintelligent, 
they have begun a magic jamming operation that prevents you from engaging shadow motion. Ranga gave the warning the moment he sensed something was wrong, but it came a little too late. Even by then, the goblins were already under the influence of the Empire's wide-ranging magic interference. Ranga might have been able to sprint his way out of it, but the rest of his kin couldn't. The only way out was to run. Everyone, head to the forest as fast as you can. Gobda was frantic as he shouted, and the goblin riders quickly heeded him. They had about six hundred feet of terrain between them and the woods. It'd usually take ten or so seconds to traverse, but being shot at from behind like this, it seemed hopelessly far away. It was now a battle to retreat, and it would prove to be one filled with hardship. Looking at the fleeing goblins, Gaster flashed a brutal smile, then quickly ordered his crew to prepare the tank gun on their vehicle. Don't think you bastards are getting off that easy. They would be using the special ammunition on board, there was just one round left. Following his order, it was loaded into the gun and fired without delay. This special round landed in the forest in front of the goblins, instantly spreading intense flames across it. The aim was to block their path, and while they could use their super-honed intuition to dodge incoming shells, there wasn't much they could do when their route of escape was burning. Bad news there. Geez, I wonder if I'm gonna make it back alive? You better not kid around like that, Gobta. If I'm here, we're all coming back, got it? You're always super confident, aren't you, Gobto? Hearing all that baseless confidence, I feel like a doofus for worrying about anything. I wonder if Captain, I mean, Commander Gobta is worried, too. What are you talking about? If he is, it's probably over what's for dinner tonight. That or how he'll apologize to Riga for partying with Sir Raimuru until late. The goblin riders started laughing, Gobchi and Gobto joining the mix. It was a desperate situation, but the goblins hadn't lost their usual swagger, and with his ears honed, Gaster overheard the entire conversation, Don't you dare mess with me. Now that you're fully surrounded, your fates are in my hands. Gaster's heart burned with passion. But in front of his gaze, there was now a beautiful woman with pure white hair, Testarossa. Her face looked cool, despite the blasts of hot air surrounding her, and she didn't seem the least bit threatened by the flying bullets. And you, too. I'll never forgive you for messing with me like that. That pretty little face of yours will be weeping in terror. Gaster was not personally conscious of the faint, dark desires within himself. He hadn't noticed that his fascination with Testarossa was causing him to make increasingly rash decisions. So with his face evilly twisted, he made another order. All remaining vehicles. Fire our tank guns at the enemy. The order completely ignored the safety of the remaining forces on the left flank, busy hassling the goblins, but nobody was going to argue the point with him. So the remaining one thousand tanks turned their guns around, just as the fortress wall of tanks was checking the goblin riders' moves, adjusting their angle, applying anti-shock protection to withstand the force of firing at point-blank range, the muzzles of these deadly, life-reaping tanks were ready to flash in unison. Fierce battle was also unfolding in the skies, the airships launching all sorts of enhanced magic. Gable and his team found themselves at a loss to respond. The magicule flows around them had been disrupted. The Empire's top-secret magic cancellers were affecting Gable just as badly as the Goblin Riders. NNGH. What a menace. The closer we get to those flying ships, the heavier our bodies get. What now, Sir Gable? I'd like to go help the Goblins, but there's no time for that. They might have had the time if it was Team Hiryu alone, but they were accompanied by the Wyvern Riders as well, and they lacked real battle experience any wrong moves, and both Gobta's and Gable's forces could fall at the same time. Da, we have no choice. We'll take those ships down first, we have the numerical advantage, Team Hiryu, concentrate on the enemy in front of you. You got it, boss. But they're bigger than us, aren't they? Comparing our numbers may not matter. Shut up, you moron. Sir Gable knows that, but that's the only order he can give us there's always one person in the crowd who can't get the picture. But despite that exchange, 
Gable and his cohorts prepared to dive right into full-scale battle with the fleet of airships. One of the pilots aboard regarded Gable and his force with cold, cruel eyes. This was Major General Faraga, leader of the Empire's vaunted Flying Combat Corps. He was very capable, with a hunger for promotion to match, no officer wanted to find higher office more than he. Despite that, however, Faraga took great pains to lift up his other colleagues, striving to keep them on his side. There was a reason for this, of course, he had been around to see the end of the Magic Division, his former stomping grounds. This Magic Division boasted immense power, once upon a time, but now it was dismantled, a relic of the past. Perhaps it was a sign of the times, but they had grown to be judged as too inefficient for warfare, that was the main reason. People think that magical warfare is this flashy fireworks show, but in reality, it boils down to a few core tenets, analyze the enemy's magic and interfere with it. In the meantime, you'd activate your own magic and try to strike the enemy's army. Repeat ad nauseum. This tended to never produce significant results, mainly because magically enhanced knights were much stronger in real-life battle situations. For example, nuclear magic, regarded as the most powerful kind out there, took around a dozen sorcerers to invoke. No one person could cast it, and the time to construct, or cast, the spell was far from trivial. Some champion-level fighters could indeed control nuclear magic solo, but at best they could engineer an explosion the size of a football field. A direct hit from this was powerful enough, yes, but armies could have the anti-magic shield legion magic cast upon them, and only group magic had the power to overcome that. In other words, individual magic casters were not expected to be active contributors on the battlefield. What's more, while it was important to have the necessary number of casters on hand, it wasn't a case of more is better. Every battlefield had only so many magicules to harness, and once they were used up, magic users were essentially useless. Thus, while wizards and their kind were indispensable, they were not seen as star performers in battle. Faraga was an excellent wizard in his own right, an art he honed studying under Ghidorah. He respected his teacher, honoring what he taught him, and he didn't neglect his own diligence, either. But then he realized something, with Ghidorah helping to modernize the armored division, they would soon have no place left in the military. The times were changing, and soon there would no longer be a need for well-trained casters. With the right spell gun, even ordinary people could control extraordinary magic. And Faraga hated Ghidorah for it. He felt that his master was strangling himself through his own actions, but Ghidorah rejected his pleadings at every turn, and so the magic division declined to nothing. And that's exactly why I betrayed my teacher and swore my allegiance to Sir Caligulio. The move had earned him his current position. He took in the people who worked under him, all talented magic casters, and gave them a place to shine. And someday, sooner or later, the Flying Combat Corps would enjoy the honor of being called the strongest in the world. Until then, he'd happily kiss up to his colleagues and keep a low profile. That was Faraga's plan, and he kept to it with a strict discipline. Now, finally, the perfect opportunity had arrived, an operation to defeat Veldora. The Flying Combat Corps had been chosen as the keystone of the mission. The core plan was to contain Veldora with their magic cancellers while assisting the other units. Logical support was one of their original roles, but they were exempted from it this time. 300 of their airships, out of 400 total, were on other missions, and the remaining 100 were staffed by elite sorcerers to the limit of their capacity. It was a completely battle-focused formation, which showed just how much importance Caligulio placed on this operation. Faraga understood well enough that he needed to succeed. We'll perform out here and prove our usefulness. It will be a new era for us. He smiled to himself. Once that new era dawned, he'd no longer have to curry favor with the other officers. The tables would be turned, and nobody would be able to ignore Faraga's wishes. That was how he thought his life should be, and he never doubted it for a moment. Compared to defeating Veldora, this isn't much of a warm-up at all, but fair enough. Those flying lizards and earthbound dogs are good practice fodder for our new weapon. Why should we share the credit, I ask? By the time we're done, 
Lieutenant General, you'll owe us big time. Faraga lifted the wine glass in his hand as he shouted. Comrades, we have been patient until now, but that ends today. It's time to show them our true power. Ye are. The crew drowned him out, as a sorcerer who should have been among the elite, he could no longer face the reality of the hardships he had to endure. All that humiliation was about to be overshadowed by the glorious days to come. Every member of the crew was of one mind, and in tune with this, a hundred airships stepped up their attack. The most unique feature of the airships was their magic-canceling engines, but they were also equipped with other cutting-edge weapons. These were controlled by magicians well-versed in elemental and summon magic. An airship's structure could be roughly divided into three sections, operations, defense, and offense. Each section was assigned a crew of one hundred, with another hundred serving as reserves, liaisons, and medics. The operations section, needless to say, operated the airship. At least fifty people were required to keep a ship aloft, but if the fleet wanted to operate at full strength, not even a hundred were quite enough. The defense section was in charge of the airship's defense barriers, which came in various flavors, anti-physical, anti-magic, anti-attribute, and so on. An airship's outer walls weren't particularly thick, a weight-saving measure, so if they neglected to protect themselves with magic, they'd be shot down in a flash. No crew would dream of flying without a defensive staff. Finally, the attack division was the most important one. Each airship was equipped with magic amplifier cannons that made it easier for magicians to work together. Multiple magicians would focus their power on a magic ball placed on top of a pedestal, by casting on it at the same time, they could trigger large-scale magic much easier than usual. One cannon was in the front of the ship, and two were on the sides, there were a total of five per ship, with up to ten magicians per cannon awaiting orders and backups standing by to keep up the magical barrage. It's worth noting that a magic amplifier cannon's power increased in direct proportion to the number of people using it. If two people were on it at once, the resulting magic force doubled, if a full complement of ten magicians worked together, it increased twentyfold. This was a serious threat, even simple fire magic could become more powerful than a full-fledged fireball. It went without saying just how incredible this invention was. The airship's defenses were perfect. The fireballs spat out by the wyverns were no threat at all, their barrier even prevented damage from ramming the walls. No half-hearted attack had a chance of working, and that kept Faraga satisfied. And we haven't even gotten to their offense. Our airships are the strongest there are, proclaimed Faraga, and it's time to show their true power. Give me maximum force, and let's knock those annoying lizards out of the sky. Up until then, only two or three magicians had been casting spells at once. But they had done enough testing. It was time to go on stage. A spell controller, an orb nearly twenty inches wide and made of purified magic stone, was perched atop every magic amplifier cannon, channeling magic power into it would activate the device. The magicians, sitting quietly until then, lifted up their hands, and on a signal, all ten unleashed large-scale force, lightning, icy snow, flames, vorpal blades, and all kinds of other terrifying magic blasted through the sky, amplified twenty times their average strength, and all its fury was focused on Gable and Team Hiryu. I had been watching the battle unfold with rapt attention, but now I couldn't help but leap out of my chair. Gopta's forces were being blown away by the impacts of the tank shells, Gables were falling out of the sky, mercilessly exposed all-powerful magic. Things were intensifying fast out there, and we were starting to take casualties. I had expected that, of course. I did, but maybe I was still too optimistic, deep down. Benimaru seemed so incredibly confident, and Raphael didn't say anything, so I naively thought there wouldn't be any problems. But that wasn't the reality. Of course it wasn't. We were waging war, after all. There was no way we could win without taking any damage at all. Now my lack of foresight made me feel angry and impatient. But Benimaru remained as cool as ever. Please, Sir Raimaru, take your seat. This was within our expectations, and there are no problems to speak of. His words made something blow up inside me. What? 
We're taking casualties out there. Shouldn't I have used Megiddo to help you guys out? No. I'd already come to a conclusion about this. Megiddo was affected, yes, but I had already decided it was pretty pointless. The Nimaru questioned its effectiveness as well, and even Diablo was negative about it. Apparently there were several reasons for this. First of all, since we had started this whole thing as a nation, we couldn't always rely on our master, the Demon Lord, that is, me, to be there for us. The Demon Lord was responsible for protecting the monsters under his command, Benimaru asserted, but it was the duty of his subordinates to protect the country. The rest of my staff agreed. If they did not feel that Tempest was their country, and they had to protect it with their own hands, they had no right to live here. You don't have to take on everything, Sir Raimuru, as Shuna put it, I was glad to hear that, and for that matter, I agreed with it. So that was one reason. The second was that Megiddo had a weakness, one Diablo pointed out to me. This Megiddo is quite a beautiful magic. It provides high power at low cost, it's versatile, and it can be applied in a variety of situations. But once you are familiar with it, you can counter it in so many ways. I could have launched it from here in the control center, and if I did, I'm sure it'd be pretty damn useful, too. But once my trick was exposed, it'd never work a second time. As Hinata had told me, all they'd have to do is conjure up some wind and create a dust cloud or a smoke screen, and its accuracy and power would be lethally compromised. I was pretty surprised that Diablo asked Hinata for her feedback, what an information gatherer he was. But enough about that. Last time I took out Megiddo, I killed every single one of our enemies. The survivors, namely, Edmaris and Rosen, weren't going to blab about it, so there was no worrying about information leaks, that definitely wouldn't be the case this time. There was no way we could keep the deaths of hundreds of thousands of imperial soldiers and officers quiet. A trump card is best always kept safe for the last moment, advised Benimaru. Magic that has such an awesome effect at first blush was best not used carelessly, he thought, and Diablo was with him on that. They were pretty convincing. Megiddo is a super high temperature heat ray created by concentrating sunlight to extreme levels, and it's almost impossible to avoid once sighted. As an anti-personnel magic, it's only really an option when used at the right moment. Meanwhile, our opponents here weren't really flesh and blood, they were tanks, hulking piles of iron. I'm not saying that Megiddo wouldn't work, but I don't think it'd be too effective. Raphael calculated that it'd take a long time for that magic to destroy the tanks, to penetrate one, I'd have to increase the power, in other words, the focal temperature of the heat ray, up to tens of thousands of degrees, and since these tanks aren't powered by oil or gasoline or the like, I couldn't count on it bursting into flames for me. If a penetrating heat ray didn't stop a tank, I'd have to plug it full of holes until it finally stopped moving, and at that point, it'd be a lot easier to blow it away with nuclear magic instead. But doing that meant having to break through layer upon layer of anti-magic barriers, and you'd have to kill off the magicians behind them first, which leads to this long, drawn-out magic battle. Tactically, it made no sense. It wasn't going to work. So since I'd given command over to Benimaru, my job was honestly just to watch over things. That was all, really, but... I should go out, and... I was about to say that, but I was interrupted in the middle of my statement. You can't. As the commander, I cannot put our leader in danger. Above all, I am concerned with the story the hero Chloe told us. In another timeline, someone out there managed to murder you, Sir Raimaru. Asking you to fight out there while knowing such a dangerous person may exist, it's simply impossible. I had shared the story of this potentially lethal foe with all my officers, framing it as a potential what-if coming for us. What did they think about it? The answer was obvious from the look on Benimaru's face. Currently, I would consider as a threat the commanders of the Empire's three divisions, along with a hundred members of the Imperial Guardians serving under the Emperor. There might be other hidden figures as well, and we are investigating any potential leads. Please forgive us if this sounds weak-spirited. It was C.I. who gave me that report. He and his team were currently risking their lives to gather information, 
all for my sake, to eliminate this potential threat to me. With the enemy's strength unknown, it is out of the question to send you, our Lord, to the front lines. The operation is underway without any problems. Please, I ask you to trust in me, Gobta, Gable, and all who serve them. At his bidding, I sat down in my chair. I still had this unpleasant feeling in my chest, not quite annoyance, not quite frustration, but Beni Maru's words were simply too true, he was right. If you thought about it, from the very beginning, Beni Maru had been thinking about me as he carried out his plans. And not just him, Xion, too, standing behind me, and Siai by my side. Diablo went without saying, but even Shuna, looking at me all worried, they all prepared for the reality that anyone who went to battle would have to face sacrifice. Likely, that was true for everyone on the front lines, too. They were standing out there, ready to use themselves as bait to catch a threat they didn't even have a visual picture of yet. And even the incredibly self-indulgent Veldora was sitting quietly in the control center, ready to protect me if push came to shove. It was all for the sake of protecting me, the king of this nation. The only person who hadn't resolved himself to it was me. Right then. And that is why I have to be perfect. I thought I heard a voice from somewhere. Great. Are you worried about me, too? Well, I'm fine now. It'd be disrespectful to be so sad while all these people are so resolved. It's time for me to join them. Sorry. I lost some of my cool. Benimaru nodded at me. Don't worry. Sir Raimaru. Victory will most assuredly be yours. He flashed me a fearless smile as he made the promise. He was a commander responsible for the lives of his soldiers, and his face was serious to match, and hearing that, I felt the irritation, the conflict, and all those other unpleasant feelings disappear. I had long prepared for my own death, and for killing my enemies, but I tried to avoid thinking much about the concept of people dying for me. I needed to accept that, I needed to accept that it wasn't only for my sake, but for those of their families, the framework of the nation that guarded and defended them, and the fact that I was here to symbolize all that. For these very reasons, I could never allow them to be defeated. As a symbol, I needed to act the part, I needed to put in a suitable performance. Realizing this, I resolved to begin by giving Benimaru the relaxed response he hoped for, of course. I want you to tell everyone what I'm going to say. All right? By all means. With Benimaru's consent and cooperation, I was going to transmit my will to each and every one of my people. Thanks to the unique skill-born leader, they'd receive my statement in their minds. Listen to me. Crush the enemy with all your might. There's no need to go easy on them, and of course there is no need to show mercy. Use everything you've got to eliminate the enemy as quickly as possible. I tried my best to put my entire heart into it. Benimaru nodded his approval, the other officers smiling as well, because to them, the order meant one thing. The full release of the power kept under control. Correctly understanding the meaning of my words, the monsters resumed their assignments. And thanks to that, the battlefield was about to drastically change. Chapter 2 the assault begins. All the monsters on the battlefield accepted the words of their lord and ally Raimuru with their souls, the words of an absolute ruler who accepted all their loyalty and trust, then another voice commanded them. The disguise operation is cancelled. Crush the fools bothering Sir Raimuru's mind until nothing remains of them. With this, there was nothing left to bind the monsters. Joy filled their hearts, and they relied upon pure impulse to unleash their magic force. The demonic auras they had suppressed so as not to affect the town they lived in were now fully released, and the concentration of magicules around them shot upward. There was nothing to be afraid of any more as they let their deepest impulses drive them across the battlefield. Gobta, too, heard the order as the shells kept raining down. Finally. But it doesn't look like we've achieved our goals yet. Is that okay? He was talking to himself, but his second in command, Gobchi, responded. Well, what's the problem? The plan was to persevere and make the opponent show off all their latent force, but at this rate, we're going to dwindle down to nothing. 
we have to scare them a little, or nobody strong's going to come out for us, that's how it is? That's how it is. Gobda and Gobchi were having this conversation in the middle of a battlefield, bombarded by shells and shock waves. Those watching were impressed by their ability to hear, although they were well used to their supremely relaxed attitudes by now. If it worse, you know, the strongest guys would jump out first, but... Well, put it that way, Gobta, and aren't you one of the big four? Hey! All right, maybe, but I'm still the weakest of them. Seriously, stop bringing that up. As they conversed, Gobta, Gobchi, and the goblin riders under them were seething more than ever before. Everyone was waiting for the order from Gobta to come down. Shells rained down on regular occasions, deliberately and precisely, as if aimed at a dartboard, and they were throwing a dozen darts at once. From the beginning, the intention wasn't to score a direct hit, but to wipe them all out with the shock waves. The goblin riders, realizing this, were on the move in search of shelter. A direct hit would kill them instantly, but on the other hand, anything else was survivable. Everyone here was powerful enough to rank as lieutenant in the Tempest Force, meaning an A- equivalent in rank. Even if they were seriously hurt, a little potion would take care of it. Based on this, Benimaru's strategy was to feign defeat. There was no need to actually lose, of course, just pretend to be in a crisis. In the meantime, the remaining troops were to block the Imperial Army's retreat and counterattack at once. If they waited until the tanks ran out of ammunition, the strongest people on their side would come to finish them off, Benimaru put it in the simplest terms possible. Gobda, of course, wanted to voice a few complaints about that, but an order was an order, and he couldn't disobey it. The Imperial Army wasn't nearly as much of a threat as Benimaru in his mind. I mean, Benimaru's usually a real nice guy, but when it comes to military stuff, he's merciless. And this time, even Sir Raimaru's safety is at stake, there's no way somebody like me could speak out against it. Those were Gobta's memories about when he was told about the plan. Convincing his goblin riders to follow it was a pain, but once he mentioned Raimaru's name, they stopped complaining. All that was left was to overwhelm the enemy in the first engagement, but as expected, that was asking a bit too much. As soon as their attempted breakthrough was blocked, Gobta's force decided to stick to their original decoy role. But that's over now. Raimaru had given his statement, and Benimaru followed it up with new orders. No need to hold back. The time had come for them to unleash all the power they possessed. Okay, you now have permission to attack freely. The green numbers are Hakuro's responsibility, so they're good, but for now, I'm leaving you riders to Gobchi. He sent out a thought communication to his squad mates, face stiffened. His tone of voice was as usual, but it had an unmistakable power to it. Roger that. So what are you doing, General Gobta? Gobchi asked, shrugging. Gobta replied with a troubled-looking smile. Well, I can't play around anymore, either, you know. I don't care about that big four stuff, but it's an order from Sir Raimaru and I can't act like a wimp when he's watching me. I'm gonna get real serious now. Gobchi and the rest of the team looked into Gobta's eyes. Immediately, they knew he was serious, the kind of seriousness they almost never saw in their boss. Hair. I know what you're capable of. Go ahead. Don't hesitate to use it. Why are you acting so bossy? Why you heard that? Well, it's fine and all, Gobto but you do your best, too, okay? Hair. Of course. Gobta gave this a tired sigh. Gobto had been on the team since its early days, they had known each other a while by now. He was good in his own way, but thanks to absorbing a lot of unnecessary knowledge from Raimaru, he had a tendency to act all cool when it wasn't called for. Way back when, he had imitated Gobta's aide Gobchi, but now he had evolved in his own unique way. He was wearing a long black coat with two long swords that he didn't even know how to use fully. Gopta wondered if he was safe out here, but he figured that with Gopchi around, it'd probably work out. After making up his mind on that, Gopta turned to the person he had to worry about the most, Testarossa, still sitting behind him. 
So along those lines, Testa Rossa, I'd like us to go our separate ways from here, if that's okay? Testa Rossa nodded, smiling. Even in the midst of these flames and concussive impacts, her graceful gestures remained intact, her military uniform still clean. Soot and dust would never stain Testa Rossa. Yes, of course. I feel the same way as you. From now, I will act not as an observer, but as an individual living under Sir Raimaru. Please do your best, all of you. So Testa Rossa got off Ranga, and with a final good day to you, she breezily walked away. Raimaru had attached her to Gobta as an observer, but that role was now over. The lethally dangerous demon was now on the move, she sure is a free spirit, ain't she? A dismayed Gobta thought, but he didn't say it out loud. He had grown up at least enough to know saying that was a bad idea. After seeing Testarossa off, he decided it was his turn. All right, everyone. Begin. Yeah. He gave the order to his troops, finding the response satisfactory enough. Even Gobta wanted Raimaru to see how cool he was. He liked Raimaru. He was selfish and more than a little mean, but at the same time, he was always so kind and worth relying on. He admired her. He was once just this tiny little goblin, but he had grown to a fairly famed warrior. Now it was time for him to repay that favor. The riders are yours, Gobji. He turned toward Ranga. Now it's your turn, Ranga. Transform. The shouted order was answered by Ranga, who had been lying in wait all this time. I've been waiting for this moment, Gobda. Let us show our powers to Sir Raimaru, my master. The two fighters' consciousnesses cinched together as they released their inner magic power. The next moment, a black mist enveloped Gobda. Come on. Let's go wild. Yes. I've been holding back for so long. The mist disappeared as if it had been sucked into Gobda. It revealed a goblin fighter infused with a black wolf, a humanoid wolf with two ominous horns. Gobda and Ranga had unified, and only now could they be called part of the Big Four without a trace of irony. The moment they saw him, Gobchi and the rest of the goblin riders rushed out of their hiding spot. Don't get in Captain Gobta's way. He's fighting serious now. Gobchi's desperate shout expressed just how endangered the goblins were at the moment. The demon wolf's fists, for example, were literally swatting down flying tank shells from the air. In fact, even a direct hit didn't singe his reinforced black fur. These massive bullets, running just under six times the speed of sound and boasting incredible destructive energy, couldn't even dent Gobda now that Ranga's armor was on him. That was a byproduct of Ranga's own multi layer barrier, but for the unwitting Imperial troops, he was nothing but a walking nightmare. W.H. What is that? Am I dreaming, or? You sure aren't. It's a monster. I can't believe the kinds of freaks that Demon Lord has working for him. Panic was beginning to set in among the lower-ranked privates. Among the troops in the tanks, stuck together and unable to move, the fear was even greater. With a howl from Gobda, dark lightning stormed down from the sky above the tank crews, 1,000 tanks had transformed into a fortress, and now they were ripe targets. The dark strikes interfered with the tank's defensive barriers, emitting a blinding light as they did. They withstood the barrage for a few moments, but it seemed its resistance to electricity was less than perfect. The crew inside the tanks seemed to be safe, but the infantry nearby, in formation with the tank wall behind them, suffered incalculable damage. But dark lightning was dangerous not just for the shock it carried. The essence of it was even more terrifying than natural lightning. Ah! Hot! This has to be seriously damaging the tank's defensive mechanism. A. All teams, evacuate. Evacuate your tanks at once. Although the crews were saved from being electrocuted, the heat the bolts generated were too much for the tanks to bear, even after the first cracks appeared the dark lightning wasn't done yet. Like a living, thinking snake, it continued to bite into the inorganic metal plating, causing serious damage to the mechanical parts inside. One after another, the tanks exploded in flames. With a thunderous rumble, they breathed their last. In this situation, 
The tanks that had been linked together to form a fortress were now nothing more than death traps. The crews desperately abandoned them, scattering to avoid being caught in a lightning strike. Military command was a thing of the past for them, and they felt and acted every bit like a defeated army. They were sure no big deal. Gopta smiled as he observed the scene. As he saw it, the power he and his cohort wielded was more than enough to face up to this foe. That, and the enemy's main force, the original target of this operation, no longer seemed threatening in this demon wolf form. He looked at the wall of tanks towering in front of him. The wall that once blocked their way was belching black smoke from Ranga's lightning. Without hesitation, he let out a roar, a voice cannon, and instantly, it shattered the wall. On the other side, he could see a line of tanks pointing their muzzles at him. More than enough to play with, huh? This is where we come in. That's right. I'm sure Sir Raimuru will love watching this. Gopta and Ranga gave each other contented nods. So they began. Without further hesitation, Gopta dived through the burned-out wall of tanks, wholly unafraid of the vast forces awaiting him. Then he ran across the battlefield with all his might. He exceeded the speed of sound, making it impossible for the Imperials to follow with the naked eye. Just you see what Ranga and I have been working on in training. How long can you keep up with us, huh? Dance with wolves. A dark gale rushed across the battlefield. With it, a destructive sonic boom slammed itself against the tank troops. The shockwave included the magical effect of the storm of destruction skill. Gradually, the storm grew to a tornado, a dragon storm of destruction whose well-calculated movements were honed for maximum enemy casualties. That was Dance with Wolves, Gobta's fearsome anti-army annihilator. And with that, one corner of the battlefield had effectively collapsed. As Gobta was beginning his rampage on the ground, changes were also occurring in the sky. It was the third corps, led by Gable. Dot. Dot. Following Benimaru's order, Gable and his team had been providing cover for the goblin riders. Once that became too difficult, they moved on to the next mission, never panicking. In other words, they were part of the same pretend-to-lose strategy Gobta was in on. The strategy was to make the enemy play their trump cards by maintaining a stalemate while making it look like they were about to lose. It was a pretty wild idea, but Benimaru ordered it nonetheless, not looking concerned at all, and Gobta and Gable accepted it without a second thought. If things got really dangerous for Gable, they had permission to evacuate, only after they helped Gobta's force retreat, of course. Gable didn't think that would be necessary, though, after all, despite all his protests, Gobta was still smirking at the idea of executing this op. Gable thought he could learn a lot from Gobta's brashness, but as it turned out, they were quite similar in many ways. Even in this state of affairs, he was still looking to shoot down an airship if he could. As long as he could maintain the stalemate without too much effort, he didn't see a problem with inflicting some damage on his opponent. That was the idea behind their aerial approach, but the enemy turned out to be stronger than he thought. Their core magic didn't work, and the Wyvern Riders' fireball attacks were similarly blocked. With their air dominance now gone, Gable's team was at a distinct disadvantage. Our role is to attract the airship's attention. If we fought with all our might without minding the consequences, it's not impossible to bring them down, but... Yes, Gable and the rest of Team Hiryu might have been able to break through the airship's defences. But doing that would make it impossible to continue the mission and so Gable decided now was the time for patience. Thus he followed Benimaru's orders, gladly accepting the role of a sitting duck in the air. The problem with this was the Wyvern riders and their lack of durability. They might have been the elites from the blue numbers, but they hadn't evolved into dragonutes the way Gable and his core had. Their magic resistance was low, and if they were caught up in a large-scale magical attack, they'd be brutally shot down. So Gable decided to ask the Wyvern Riders to withdraw. Lady Ultima, I have a favor to ask. What is it? I wish to have us continue our pretend to lose strategy, but I am thinking about upping the performance. Upping the performance? Yes. If we keep flitting around like this, 
I'm not sure the enemy will ever let their guards down. Therefore, I'd like to have Team Hiryu leave itself more open to magic attacks. Hmm. A very interesting idea. So what do you really want? Well, as I see it, now is the perfect opportunity to build our resistances a little. Not even a direct hit will kill us, likely. We have plenty of recovery potions, so I thought I could put on a nice show of being battered and bruised, while we tested out our endurance against them. Ultima laughed out loud at this wild idea. The rest of Team Hiryu looked less than enthusiastic. Are you serious, General? Sir Gable can be rather, simple sometimes, can't he? Do we have to try that right now? That's what I want to say. Gable pretended not to hear the rising complaints. Well, all right. I'll allow it. Sounds like fun, besides, said Ultima. My thanks to you. Now, if you could, I'd like your group to take their leave. He wanted Ultima, the observer, to lead the Wyvern riders away to safety. Gable and Team Hiryu alone would then launch a de facto suicide strike on the airships. If this kills me, I'm gonna haunt you in the afterlife. Wish you hadn't thought of this experiment. This is definitely something he'll be pissed about later. Groans and scowls were prevalent across the faces of the force, but Gable still paid them no mind. Although they liked to gripe, their enthusiasm and excitement were still bubbling up to the surface. So Team Hiryu decided to engage in some impromptu magical endurance training. All this happened, by the way, as Raimuru was looking on, fretting to himself. When he found out the truth later, he almost had a conniption on the spot, shouting to high heaven at Gable and his aides. More than a few Team Hiryu members predicted this well in advance, but the fact that they went with it anyway indicated that Gable, their superior officer, was maybe becoming a bad influence on them. Anyway, this was much of the reason why Gable and his force took so much damage from the magic the airships flat out. Dot. Dot. And now Gable heard Raimuru's order in his mind. Listen to me, he shouted, oblivious to how worried Raimuru was about this experiment. The training time is over. Now it is time to turn these skies into a graveyard. His troops were beyond excited. Gable himself was brimming with joy. Fortunately, the inexperienced among us have evacuated with Lady Ultima. It's only us here now, and it's no problem if we get a little reckless. This goading didn't quite get the reaction he intended. Reckless? I'd rather fight like hell than go through that endurance training again. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the first time Sir Gable's been reckless with our lives. Gable's face turned red. Silence, he shouted. Just get on with it, all of you. Follow me and give me your full strength. Seeing Gable embarrass himself like that made all the troops who saw it grin a little. Well, so be it. You guys stop fooling around, too. Let's just step up and get on with what we're told. Yeah, yeah. We're not about to say no to the general, no. No way. Sir Gable, give us your orders. Hearing that, Gable nodded, satisfied. Then he sized up the flying combat corps fighting against them and asked a shouted question. Who are the champions of the skies? It is us, Team Hiryu. The mood had changed with Gable, his team answered up to it. That's right. We have to get rid of those who pollute our sky. That is the will of Sir Raimuru. He has given his royal decree, and so you must do everything in your power. All of it. Don't think about anything else. Yeah. Gable's order held special meaning for Team Hiryu. It meant far more than simply trying harder. Don't let your consciousness slip away from you, all right. All troops, enter Dragon Body. The members of Team Hiryu sprang up at once. This was Dragon Body, their secret weapon and ultimate finisher. Not only did it increase their fighting power to an overwhelming degree, but it also increased their ferocity, making it more difficult to control themselves. If it consumed their sense of self, they would become rampaging monsters. They had stashed away that ability up until now, precisely because it became difficult to control all their destructive impulses. 
Gable had thus invited Midre to lecture them on control training, but their success rate hadn't been too stellar with it so far, still, use it they must. Raimoru had ordered them to give it their all, and so they had no reason to hesitate. Dragon Mode All at once, Team Hiryu unleashed their true force. Their muscles swelled up, and the purple scales that covered them turned jet black. They became thicker, more flexible, and several times tougher skinned, and along with that, their heights also went up around 20%, taking in the surrounding magicules to construct new bodies for themselves. With this mega boost in mass and volume, their offensive and defensive forces had also leapt forward. They were, needless to say, incomparable to how they were pre-transformation. And as for the most important part, their consciousnesses. If they were to lose that, they'd be nothing more than pure manifestations of power, but no one on Team Hiryu lost it. Every single one did a magnificent job keeping a hold of themselves. This was the moment when the true force of the Dragon Warriors, the most powerful fighting corps in Tempest, came into effect, I want each of you to take down one airship. Can you do it? Yes, sir. Great. Then get to it. At Gable's command, Team Hiryu moved in unison. Who were the champions of the skies? The answer to that question was about to be resolved before their eyes. The members of the Flying Combat Corps, the most valued part of the armored division, itself one of the Empire's three great fighting forces, were no more than pathetic, bleating lambs by now. The reason? Now that the Dragon Utes had unleashed Dragon Body, the special properties of that intrinsic skill had nullified their magic. Gable and the other Dragon Warriors were now immune to everything including and up to Megiddo, itself a nature-based magic. Each one had a multi-layer barrier and a cancel natural elements spell on them, shrugging off all physical attacks and cancelling both magical attacks and natural effects. These airships mainly attacked with magic, and with the machine guns they had as auxiliary arms, they didn't have a chance of penetrating the scales of Gable's force. Team Hiryu's fighting skill ranked A- to start with, and having that multiplied several times over had put them well past the A wall. Even worse for them, the transformation also gave them healing skills that came scarily close to ultra-speed regeneration. They had tapped into enough power to make each one a high-level magic born. With that, the fate of the now toothless airships was sealed. And now Gable was making it official. It's time to go. Prepare for my special finisher. Gable was stronger than his peers to start with, but in addition to muscle, he also had a special A-level of magicules in his body. It didn't hold a candle to Xion's or Benimaru's, but it made him as much of a force as C.I. or Geld. Tapping into Dragon Body for himself had made him into a truly remarkable warrior, enough power to even approach the former demon lords Carillion and Frey. Vortex Crash a single strike from Gable sent an airship hurtling toward the ground. The air currents swirled around him, concentrating the moisture in the atmosphere to a single point and melding it into a maelstrom of magical power. The full brunt of this vortex was released from Gable's spear, piercing straight through one of the airships. Its barrier, kept running by a hundred strong staff in the ship's defense section, provided zero resistance before shattering. The airship was instantly downed. The rest of the dragon warriors quickly followed suit. Although they couldn't fire pure magic power from their spears like Gable, each used their enhanced physical abilities to charge at their respective airship. Magic no longer worked on them, and the ship's barriers provided no protection, and in no time at all, those barriers were breached, allowing them to invade the ships. Five dragon warriors swarmed a ship at a time, taking no more than a few minutes to bring one down. At this point, it was only a matter of time before the entire flying combat corps was wiped out. Gable was already getting carried away with it. Gwahahaha. Keep it up, warriors, keep it up. And if any of you can't take down a single ship, you know what'll happen to you later, I'm sure. Hearing those words, the team Hiryu members lagging behind the pack exchanged alarmed glances. There were only a hundred airships, they counted, and if Gable wasn't gonna stop attacking, there were precious few left open to them. Oh, come on, Sir Gable. Sir Gable's so moody, isn't he? 
and he's in such a good mood right now, I don't know if he's gonna leave any prey for us. Knowing the general, that's way too possible. How would Gable judge airships taken down by teams? Well, that was for him to decide. The rest of the force, fully aware of this, rushed to join in the attack. Now the positions of predator and prey were reversed, and so the course of the day in the sky was settled. Going back in time a little. The supply troops assigned to the Imperial Army's Magitank force were about to face the trial of their lives. You've done well to keep up with me, but remember, the real battle is about to begin. These words were uttered by Hakuro, the man in charge of the green numbers. His face was cool, unaffected, but the force of twelve thousand hanging on to his words were gasping for breath, they were, after all, located directly behind the Empire's tank force, and to get there, they had to march along, arcing path of some twenty-five miles from the Dwarven Kingdom, all while wearing heavy equipment. It was Hakuro the instructor who allowed this to be possible. He had trained all his numbers thoroughly, drilling them in the art of battle will. Thanks to that, the numbers had mastered a variety of martial arts, including instant move, letting them virtually teleport at will, and form hide, which prevented their foes from sensing them. These green numbers had deployed at the same time as Gobta's force, doing their best to reach this spot without being detected by the enemy. I would like to commend all of you on your mastery of the battle will I taught you, Hakuro said, face as gentle as a doting mother. His troops, seated on the ground as they listened to him, gasped anew at this, afraid of what was coming next. They had known Hakuro for a long time, and they knew if the instructor was merciless against his allies, he was even more so against the enemy. The order he would give them with this compliment was terrifying to even imagine, and for those who understood it was up to them to execute, it was with a steely resolve that they took the foreboding news. Our mission is to cut off the enemy's supply lines here. It may not mean much in the grand scheme of things, but if we can destroy the enemy's rear supply units, we can dissuade them from wanting to fight a little. There's no need to take enemy lives needlessly, but there is also no need to show mercy, either. Besides, Hakuro gave the battlefield a glance and smiled. And then. Gobda has grown to be a fine man. He is currently doing an expert job playing the decoy for us. And I want you all to perform as well as that general is. Hakuro's voice boomed over the distant sound of explosions. Those with no real combat experience grew more tense by the moment, overwhelmed by the sound of it all. All right? While you're fighting, I don't want you to think about anything else. Fail to kill the enemy, and you're the one who dies, let the enemy go, and friends will die because of it. Those are the iron-clad rules of the battlefield. His troops were panting for breath a moment ago, but now they were silent, listening to every word from Hakuro. Their leader was imparting knowledge, so those prepared to give their everything would not find themselves mentally lost in battle. All life does not come equally. There is no need to worry about strangers, when compared to the lives of your loved ones. I will also remind you that these enemies are invaders. They are fools who don't even deserve the right to live. Do not be shy about cutting them down. With those threatening words, Hakuro hoped to quell any feelings of guilt they might have had. It was his way of showing a little kindness. I have trained all of you, and with that training, you can even cut down those piles of iron. Everything thrown out from them seems frozen in the air to you, does it not? Then do not be afraid. There is no one who can stand against our blades. Nobody could say, uh, no, they don't seem frozen at all, sir, there was no way to. If they did, he would say you need more training. And give them an even more harrowing ordeal than any war could give them. But while some had little complaints like that in their minds, no one had any complaint about Hakuro himself. He never asked them to do something he wouldn't. His words may have been extreme at times, but it was all based on his desire as their leader to see his troops reach the same heights as himself. Now the green numbers were watching for their chance, the order from Hakuro to charge. Their boss was acting as a decoy, the most dangerous job of the day, a truly excellent performance, one befitting a member of the Big Four. They had all seen him, thanks to Hakuro's all-seeing eye extra skill, and thanks to thought communication, 
everyone down to the last member was sharing in the same insight. There was fear, yes, but more than that, the members were fascinated by Gobda's and his goblin rider's courage. It made them realize that now it was their turn to make an effort. Hakuro felt his anxiety dissipate a little as he sized up his group. Its members had been thoroughly trained to deal with all kinds of situations, but there would still doubtlessly be casualties in their first battle. He did wish, somewhere in his heart, that he could have done additional training, but there was nothing more he could do. The enemy wouldn't wait for them. Under Benimaru's plan, Gobta's force would stick to their stalemate for as long as possible. It'd be bound to make the enemy impatient, he said, the tanks didn't have infinite shells, so the rain of bullets had to stop at some point. That's when Hakuro's force would come into play. They'd hit the enemy's supply forces, seize their goods, and make it a cinch to seize these so-called tanks. As a secondary objective, they were tasked with uncovering the hidden leaders, the strong men among the enemy, but that, they could play by ear. Hopefully if they exist, they'll come up to me, Hakuro thought, although that, too, was just a matter of luck. This is their first battle. If they're consumed by fear, they're bound to die. I wanted to ease those fears as much as possible, but we'll just have to see. For now, all Hakuro could do was pray they succeeded, and that everyone came out of it safe. But those fears turned out to be unnecessary. Listen to me. Suddenly, Raimuru channeled an order to the green numbers through Hakuro's skill. Hearing it was all it took for the monster's anxieties to be quelled. An inexplicable elation rose up among them, their bodies felt warm, as if they'd catch on fire. To eliminate the enemy as quickly as possible. Now Raimuru's words, or his orders, would be going into effect. They made Hakuro chuckle. I see I've worried for nothing. Did you hear that, all of you? Yes, sir. Then let's go. Your patient waiting is over. Go and unleash your full powers. Before Hakuro could finish his words, the monster army rushed off at a furious pace. Ten or so minutes later, the infantry guarding the Empire's supply teams were lined in a horizontal formation, ready to intercept the monster army. The sudden surprise attack almost threw them into disorder, but they were the elites of the Empire, and they immediately regained their bearings. Some of the platoons used armored vehicles for transport as shields to shoot at the monsters with. At first glance, the Imperial forces seemed to have the upper hand, as befitting an army with such a decisive numerical advantage. But the green numbers weren't intimidated. Despite being exposed to gunfire, the scale shields provided to the front row proved handy. Unlike a bow, a rifle shot does not travel in an arc, the purpose of small arms fire is to suppress the enemy at close range, and as long as the front row didn't take any hits, worthwhile suppression would never happen. This was, after all, still a world of swords and sorcery. With their unthinkably high lethality, guns had the power to change every tactical textbook in the land. But this world had magic, and thus a single bullet wasn't necessarily enough to neutralize an enemy. For that, slashing attacks with swords and axes were more effective than bullets striking a single tiny point of the body. The Empire had great pride in all its new weapons, but not even they were enough to institute a paradigm shift, a full change in the times. If not, their commander decided, it was time to break out a new weapon. So the next order came down from on high. Damn it! All forces, switch from rifle fire to your spell guns. Maintenance teams, join the main force and bring only the most important supplies with you. The standard rifle, a weapon recreated from knowledge brought from another world, was ineffective against monsters. They did have some success in the experimental stages, but that was only against unarmed, essentially naked creatures. But if that was the case, there was always magic. These spell guns, wieldable even by ordinary foot soldiers, had fire lance magic engraved on them. That, the commander thought, would be enough to pierce through most monsters and burn them alive. Unfortunately, that supposition was beyond naive. The green numbers were equipped with the latest in unique class armor, Garm had hammered out the scales of Charybdis to create their scale shields, and they could deflect far more than just lead bullets. No good, sir. 
the enemy force is immune to magic. The true value of these scale shields was the high resistance to magic they offered, but that wasn't the only nightmare striking the imperial army. From the skies above flew in the wyvern riders, the elites of the blue numbers, led by Ultima. Drop them all. With that sweetly voiced order, the ground was engulfed in flames. It was a flare bomb based ranged attack. Not a terribly powerful one, but it had ample killing force against the Imperial infantry. But it was the sound, in particular, that sowed confusion across the battlefield. It made the support soldiers not used to fighting, mechanics, medics, and so forth, unable to keep up with the changing situation. Soon, the order to join the main force was no longer being heeded, leading to even more unnecessary casualties. It was a relief for Hakuro to see that the battle turned out to be more lopsided than he feared. Hey there, Hakuro. These kids are under my command, but do you mind if I leave them to you? Ah, Miss Ultima? I don't mind that, no, but... Hakuro gave Ultima a good-natured greeting as he watched her jump down from her wyvern's back, the difference between his attitude with her and with his soldiers was like a yawning chasm. You don't? Great, thanks so much. Ultima, for her part, was acting like a cute little girl begging her grandfather for a treat. If Veyron or Zonda saw her like this, they'd no doubt wonder if they were hallucinating. They'd never tell her that, of course, but... Certainly, certainly. By the way... Mm. What is it? Well, you see, Miss Ultima, I had a question for you. Are you close to Lady Carrera, perhaps? Mm, I don't know about calling her Lady and me Miss, but I'll let you off the hook, Hakuro. Anyway, the answer's simple, we hate each other. Ultima was still all smiles and cuteness, but there was something frightening about her presence in that moment. She was, as it turned out, extremely good at this feigned friendliness. She was actually brutal and ruthless by nature, and those two sides of her fluctuated so much, you wouldn't be faulted for thinking she had a split personality. Even so, Ultima always paid due respect to those older than her, so that aspect of her went wholly unnoticed with most people. Oh, no. A pity. Why do you ask? Well, I was just, you know, wondering if you knew Ajira, one of Lady Carrera's men. Hakuro picked his words carefully. The demon Ajira looked a lot like a certain person Hakuro knew, in fact, they were virtually body doubles. That person was none other than Byakuya Akari, Hakuro's grandfather and martial arts teacher. He was thus keenly interested in this Ajira, but the demon himself didn't even seem to notice Hakuro. Was it because old age changed his appearance too much? Mm, sorry, I dunno. I'm not too interested in him, Ultima said plainly. But if you're that curious, why don't you ask him yourself? She made it sound so casual. Hakuro nodded his agreement. You're right. I suppose I was overthinking it. Ah, yeah, that's an easy habit to fall into. But you better think about that later, huh? The battle's more important right now. You don't want Sarimaru yelling at you, do ya? With a final word or two of thanks, Ultima flew off into the sky once more. Hakuro, watching her go, had a bit of a confused look on his face. He <laughs> he. Ah, look at me. I keep telling people not to let distractions seize your mind in battle, but it seems I need to work on that myself. Best make up for this error as quickly as I can. Then he drew his blade, ready to rule the battlefield as the sword ogre. Major General Faraga was stunned by the scene before him. His fortresses in the sky boasted unstoppable defense, thanks to a network of barriers overseen by teams of elite magicians, but now one of them had been shot down by a single blow from a monster. According to an investigation conducted by the Imperial Intelligence Bureau, this was an uncommon race of creature known as the Dragonute. It essentially had the fighting power of a humanoid dragon, but what Faraga saw happen before him was something well beyond that description. Who is that freak? What kind of bad intel did the IIB send me? Were they sending him falsified intel in order to take a wizard like him down? The thought occurred to him, but not even he could swallow that one. 
No, that couldn't be. Those guys literally transformed before my eyes. Is this the morphological change seen in some monsters, like in the book my master wrote? It has been said that certain monster races could freely change between two forms at will, one suitable for everyday life and another geared more for battle. The Dragonutes they were fighting now were an evolved form of lizardmen, with wings giving them flight and breath attacks that came in a variety of elements. They were a B-level threat as a monster, and while you didn't want to pick a fight with one for no reason, they weren't a major threat to an airship. Or they shouldn't have been. But this was different. What could be going on? Faraga turned to his aid, helplessly confused as he tried to reconcile their intel with the reality before him. I'm deeply sorry, sir. According to a report from the person who measured the energy values of the enemy monster, the statistics rise greatly after the transformation. They discovered that the final value is several times the standardized level for an A rating, several times. So over an A? And they're completely immune to magic on top of that? Despite Faraga's ranting on the subject, he didn't quite have it right. Gable's force boasted very high resist magic defense, but they weren't impervious to it. A hypothetical cancel magic wasn't in their repertoire. It was just that the airship's magic attacks weren't strong enough to break the multi-layer barriers protecting them. I hate to admit it, but from the situation at hand, I can only assume that. Our magic attacks aren't working, and the enemy's magic is shooting down our airships, our pride and joy. I can see that for myself, Faraga wanted to say. But he held back, trying to keep a cool head. There was nothing to fear from a flock of a hundred or so dragonutes. No matter how excellent their armor was, he thought, it couldn't be a match for the Empire's most advanced weapons. When those three hundred wyverns fled, he believed victory was assured, well, no. Honestly, Faraga felt uneasy about it, maybe it was his many years of battle experience, but something was giving him an unpleasant premonition, and he didn't like it. So my hunch was right, then? But for now, we need to come up with countermeasures first. With that in mind, Faraga turned his attention to the battlefield anew. If we're talking explosive growth, then each one of them's a high-level magic-born equivalent. A hazard-level threat or maybe even a calamity if we're unlucky. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. That's what I heard from our analysts. Abominable. Sheerly abominable. If magic worked on them, even an A-ranker could be handled well enough. So what about the one in the leader role? Th that. What? What is it? Ah. Sorry, sir. Allow me to brief you. The aide faltered a bit as he looked at the report, but one glare from Faraga, and he resumed reading it to him. What Faraga heard made him want to cringe. Over ten times? Are they sure about that? It's true, sir. There were no malfunctions in the measuring devices, that particular individual has over ten times the energy of any of the others there. How? Faraga was speechless. Even Ghidorah, who had gone through the cycle of reincarnation many times to build his powers, couldn't achieve such an absurd amount of magic force. This level was more along the lines of a demon lord. There was nothing about this particular monster in the IIB documents. He did not participate in the battle tournament the monsters held, so his fighting force is apparently unknown. According to one spy we sent in, another aide added, this one was making a presentation about medicinal herbs at the event instead. He had some interesting things to say, but now that I think about it, perhaps that was their way of hiding a disaster-level threat from the world. Faraga, listening to his aides express their opinions, concluded that it had to be true. What they saw just now truly was a transformation. They had kept their forces under wraps to catch the enemy off guard, and now that they knew the airships were basically armed with nothing but magic, they revealed their true selves, they really got one over on us, he thought. Gentlemen, calm down. We're fighting monsters here, and if we are, you all know that our victory remains unassailable. No matter who our foe is, we simply need to launch our magic cancellers at full blast, and they'll all be pinned down. Dragonutes might be a rare species, 
and those with transformation skills even rarer, but that didn't make them unbeatable. The airships were powerful, cherished weapons, developed for use against Veldora. Use their magic cancellers, the true showstopper among all their advantages, and not even the dragon family was worth breaking a sweat over. Even now, their magic cancellers were in effect and covering a wide area around them, including at ground level. But they were operating at something of a trial run, only for the fight against Veldora would they be turned up all the way and focused on a single point. The bodies of monsters were made up of magicules, disrupt the magicules in the air around them, and they'd inevitably slow down, and if these disruptive waves could be concentrated in a smaller way, they could render any sort of monster helpless. Right away, sir. As his aides hurriedly sprang into action, Faraga tried to grasp the battle situation. Save for their leader, the dragon Utes were forming teams of five in the air. Twenty of their airships were currently engaged in battle with them, and fewer than ten ships in their fleet had been taken down. There was still plenty of room to recover. Major General, we're ready to fire. But in our current position, we'll lose some of our own allies to the cannon blast. So? Oh oh. Never mind, sir. Then get on with it. Yes, sir. What would happen if you shot magic cancellers on an airship that stayed aloft on magical force? It was obvious, without the magical effect upon it, the airship would follow the laws of physics right to the ground. The crew would be wiped out, including the magicians who looked up to Faraga, their old companion in the magic division. But despite that, Faraga gave the order without batting an eye. Begin irradiation, now. The remaining ships set off, circling around Gable's forces and the airships they were currently engaged in battle with, then, one after another, they fired their cancellers from their bows. The airships they targeted began to fall downward, along with the dragon utes in combat. I'm sorry, but this is a necessary sacrifice. Faraga prayed silently, eyes wide open as the fallen airships hit the ground and burst into flames. There was no way the crew, to say nothing of the demons caught up in it, were safe. Well done. Now the only thing that remains is the special one among them. And even if magic doesn't work on it, the shock wave and the heat are beyond anything it could take. It was a great sacrifice, but a small price to pay for taking out a hundred upper level magic born. A hint of relief washed over the aids. But it was Faraga who reigned on their parade. Don't rest easy yet. Sacrificing your compatriots is nothing to be proud of. And we haven't finished off that one individual yet. The words made the aid stiffen. The demon lord class individual had been frozen in the air, but its wings were still intact and keeping it in the sky. With more than twenty airships now destroyed, there was no way they could let it escape. If it were only the flightless gobda of the big four, we wouldn't have had any of this trouble. Indeed. We, in tandem with Gaster's tank force, could have broken down even the strongest of defences. But this guy here is pinned down by the magic cancellor. If we keep irradiating him, it has to tear his body apart sooner or later. We can't be certain of that. Our analysts are still conducting observations, but the individual's energy values are falling only minimally. Hearing this exchange between his aides made Faraga feel a sudden chill in his core. We're exposing it to magic cancellers from over seventy airships at once, and all we can do is pin it down? So trying to weaken him is meaningless altogether? As much as he couldn't believe it, Faraga felt this called for rethinking his strategy. This, he knew, was a whole new dimension of strength. Focusing all their magic cancellers only just stopped his movements. Maybe they could weaken it with time, but he had no idea there was another monster on the level of Veldora like this. This guy has to be more trouble than Gobda of the Big Four. But wait. At that moment, Faraga suddenly had a flash of inspiration. Maybe this individual here was Veldora, the exact target they had been looking for. The thought sounded enticingly convincing to him. Aha! If this is Veldora, then that explains the off-the-charts energy readings. Before he knew it, his mouth was speaking by itself. His aides had a wealth of reactions to it. Oh. 
so being newly freed from his seal, maybe he's too weakened to even maintain his dragon form? Weakened? He's got all this power, and you call that weakened? Even his squadron had powers comparable to dragons. In fact, we've even tracked a few of them approaching the level of an arch dragon. That's right, said Faraga, that, my friends, is the horror of Veldora. He defeated the imperial army once before, my master Ghidorah told me the story. And even after being sealed away for three hundred years, he's still that strong. Hard to even imagine what he was like pre-seal, isn't it? His aides nodded approvingly as they listened. Yes, with that much power, no wonder the army of Farmus never stood a chance. The major general is right. I'm pretty convinced this is Veldora. Most of the people in the room agreed, but some still had their doubts. Excuse me, Major General. According to our documents, the name of the Dragonute leader is Gable. That's an alias, you, said Faraga, laughing it off. We've all heard about how Veldora's power has waned after being sealed off. He's just trying to keep a low profile until he regains his true fighting strength. With that much assurance, the questioning aide had no choice but to back down. It's, rather unheard of for a monster to take an alias. But if any would, it'd be Veldora, perhaps? There were still assorted things he didn't agree with Faraga on, but instead he forced himself to see things his way, and once word spread among the crew that Veldora was the individual they were pitted against, the officers' faces all lit up with joy. It's terrible that we lost thirty percent of our valued airships, but if that was against Veldora, it's hardly anyone's fault. If anything, it's a stroke of good luck. We need it to be on the lookout for the wide-ranging attack that defeated Farmus. Good thing we blocked him off with our magic cancellers as early as we did. Yes, Faraga thought. Veldora's trapped in the cancellers, unable to move. Keep draining him of his strength, and it'll be far easier to kill him. Now, out of nowhere, he had completed the biggest coup of this whole operation. Slowly, deliberately, Faraga chewed on his good fortune. Is the output on the cancellors all right? No problems, sir. Stable eighty percent. How much longer until it reaches maximum power? Estimated under an hour, sir. At this rate, it's all we can do to pin him down, but little by little, Veldora's physical disintegration has begun. I think it'll be effective enough for us. Veldora has an hour to live, then? Good. More than enough time for Gaster to finish seizing the Grand War. His aides were excellent. Without a word, they understood Faraga's intentions and worked with their analysts to provide him the needed updates. At the drop of a hat, they were reviewing their operation and identifying potential problems. In an hour, they concluded, Gobda of the Big Four should be suitably rooted. Fusing with that wolf monster made him a formidable force, but it still lost out to Veldora. If Gaster's tank battalion put their minds to it, it wouldn't be too hard to defeat him. If it's Veldora and his kin, then no wonder magic didn't work. But the goddess of victory has smiled upon us. Just sit back, relax, and the Empire's long-held dream will be granted. Now fully convinced, Faraga focused on rallying his soldiers' morale. Victory was in the air across the bridge. Let's get some wine ready. Good idea. Something special this time, a nice four hundred year old vintage, perhaps, please. Yes, the perfect wine to toast the Empire's vindication. The lees should settle within an hour. Very good. Let's go with that, then. Oh. Can I have some, too? The beautiful girl, her long bluish purple hair in a side ponytail, had sat herself down in the aide seat next to Faraga. Since when was she here? And not just that. She was in a full military uniform, one that didn't suit her age at all, but despite its abject formality, it only enhanced the girl's cute looks. Faraga quickly regretted his carelessness. The sheer certainty of his victory had left him too relaxed. And not just him, all the other aides and officers on the bridge were the same. The girl must have wound her way through all those mental gaps to make her way in here. Who are you? Where did this intruder come from? 
And what did she want? She was almost certainly foe, not friend, but Faraga doubted she'd give an honest answer. Oh, I can't have any? Then I guess tea's fine instead, I've had a busy day as an observer, so I'm good and parched. The rest of the bridge turned to see the mystery person Faraga was addressing. Their eyes went wide in astonishment when they spotted her. They had barriers in operation both inside and outside the ship, and nothing about this girl was detected in advance. And so there she was, sitting there like she always belonged on that seat. I said, who are you? Faraga slowly stood up and turned toward the girl. He accentuated his question by pointing a gun at her. The girl kept smiling, seemingly not threatened at all. And it wasn't a threat. Not for her. You wanna know who I am? My name's Ultima. That name's super important, so Raimuru himself gave it to me. This was Violet, the original purple and one of the most powerful, balance-breaking presences on the planet. Faraga calmly observed this Ultima, trying to assess her capabilities. Reasoning conversation would be an effective means to this, he spoke up. Ultima? Never heard of you, no? Wow, you're pretty ignorant. I came here because I wanted to ask some questions, but maybe I ought to ask somebody else. What? Look. You guys are all gonna die soon, you know. So I want you to tell me about some stuff before that happens. She delivered that explanation with a sweet, innocent smile. Seeing this conjured feelings within Faraga that were difficult for him to describe. If he had to compare it to something, it'd be like when he encountered a high-ranked imperial guardian for the first time, those absolute presences. If anything, Ultima was putting even more choking pressure on him than that. Are you telling me, that I'm being pressured? Why this girl? I'm actually afraid of her? Faraga doubted his own instincts. But the fact was that if this girl Ultima broke into an airship by herself, she had to be absolutely extraordinary. This was, no doubt, a major emergency. He guessed what she was after, then realized how obvious it was. Valdora, still held captive, was outside the observation window, a sight that symbolized the total victory of the Empire. The monsters must be absolutely frantic, and they'd likely try anything to get Valdora back. Ultima? I can't believe I'm shuddering under the thrall of this monster the IIB knew nothing about. This must be their top fixer of sorts. A top-level monster, serving Veldora directly. Definitely a top officer, one named only recently. She looked as human as they came on the outside, but it was impossible to put into words just how horrifyingly evil her aura was. He didn't know who she was, but Faraga, luckily, knew a monster with an aura like that. Ghidorah, his master, had been conducting fervent research on them. So Faraga pointed his gun at Ultima. I've got it. You're a demon, aren't you? Wow, good job. You're right. Of course I am, he thought, chuckling to himself. With this level of evil spirit, she definitely had to be a high-ranking arch-demon, one both physically incarnate and named. A true monster, through and through. The big open question at the moment was her rank. She's definitely noble, no doubt about that, medieval or lower would be preferred, but if we're talking ancient, we might have some problems. No. We can stop a demon's special skills in this space. And a demon without magic is hardly anything to fear. Faraga began secretly giving instructions to his subordinates. His orders, to point their magic canceller at the ship's interior. It had shut down their magic amplifier cannon, disarmed their spell guns, and turned the magicians in the crew into plain old helpless people. But that was exactly what Faraga wanted. Block off a monster's magicules, and the threat was gone, and the same was true for demons, too. Just take care of that stop, and the magic a demon fights with is off the table. If you were waging a magic battle against an arch-demon, all the sorcerers in the world couldn't give you a chance at victory. It was much better to create a position of superiority for yourself to start with, increasing your odds of coming out on top. Keeping his gun in everyone's sight, Faraga surreptitiously put a hand on the saber at his waist, then he kept talking, endeavoring to keep Ultima's attention. 
I'm surprised Veldora wrangled up a demon assistant like you. Huh? Sir Veldora? He he he. No need to hide it. What other reason would you have for being here, apart from coming to your lord's rescue? Um, no. I am the faithful servant of Sir Raimaru. The servant of the demon lord Raimaru? Come on. She's clearly here to rescue Veldora. No, he had never received any briefings that indicated Veldora had people working for him. Whether she served Veldora or a demon lord, that was just a triviality. My pardons. So you're here to save Veldora, aren't you? What are you talking about? I just told you I'm here to ask some questions. Don't you listen to people? Somehow, they didn't seem to be on the same page. Is she bluffing? I don't see the point of hiding it, but what the hell does she want? Faraga began to get a vague sense of uneasiness, as if he was wrong about something. Like he was making some kind of big mistake. So what do you want to ask me? Ultima smiled, like she had been waiting for this all day, then with that same smile still on her face. Well, how this ship works and how to control it, for one. That's pretty important. Also, the remaining military forces in the Empire. Like, how many really strong guys do you have and stuff like that, as much as you know, okay? Her innocent attitude felt like nothing but disrespect to Faraga. If she's messing with me, then fine. I'll admit she's kind of a trickster, but what can one person do? He still had his concerns, but that was how he truly felt. All their preparations would be done soon, and they had the perfect counter to deal with a demon. At the corner of his eye, he saw a signal that everything was ready. Their victory was now assured. Faraga regained his composure. He he he. You think I'm just going to give that to you? No, not really, but I guess that doesn't really matter. Got my tea ready yet? I've kinda been waiting a while. I've got something even better than tea for you. As if shaking off any remaining hesitation, Faraga pulled the trigger, the bullet flew away, signaling the start of battle, and just as it did, the magic cancel came into effect across the airship. The weapon in Faraga's hand was not a spellgun. It was a Colt Government 1911, a military-grade semi-automatic pistol manufactured by the Colt Firearms Company in the U.S. It was an antique, brought over here by an otherworlder, and Faraga cherished it so much that he never missed a day of maintenance on it. It was loaded with a 7 plus 1 round, and its nickname of hand cannon came from its use of large-caliber bullets, specially made at great expense. But this cult was only a diversion. As a spiritual life form, basic weapons meant nothing to a demon anyway. An incarnated demon might have felt a little pain, but that was it. With a deft hand, Faraga released the safety and fired off its full array of bullets. He had no optimism about gunning her down with them. Only those with a death wish would look down on an arch demon like that, and as soon as the sound stopped, Faraga saw he was right, Ultima was seated in her chair, not a care in the world, as she lifted up her left hand and let eight bullets drop to the floor. He didn't know how she did that without magic, but the bullets were drained of their kinetic energy, and Ultima's hand was unhurt. That's a pretty fun-looking toy you got there, but I like the one Sir Raimuru has more. Oh yeah? Well, this one's my favorite. The results were honestly more disappointing than expected, but they didn't surprise Faraga. Holstering his gun, he then took out the saber on his hip. This was a magic saber, but it still retained its powers even with a magic canceller influencing it. Using Faraga's own magic force to keep a steady flow of magicules running inside the blade, it could produce an even greater effect than a magic aura sword-infused blade. Magic swords worked against demons, he knew, that, and if he could destroy this physical body of hers, she'd never be able to withstand the magic canceller. Off to the demon world with you. Faraga was a wizard but also a talented swordfighter, he didn't go out of his way to show that off, but he was proud to say that he was as good as any famous swordfighter out there. That was why, even in this magic-blocked environment, Faraga could keep calm. Ultima, too, remained unfazed despite the magic canceller doing its work on her. That, Faraga coldly assumed, 
was fake bravado, and he wasn't about to let his foe's performance fool him. So how's it feel to have all your fancy magic blocked? Faraga sneered. Question mark Ultima responded with a puzzled expression. He he he. Getting impatient, aren't you? Well, this little chat is over, accursed demon. The air around Faraga changed, an invisible thread of tension stretched out between him and Ultima. Ha! Huh. You wanna go? Ultima asked. Of course. What kind of dimwit would ever make a deal with the devil? Dimwit? Hey, um. Are you talking about me? Who else, you fool? Can't you understand that? Let me tell you one thing. You want to know who's strong in this empire? Well, I'm one of them. Taking advantage of Ultima's brief reply, Faraga thrust his saber into the air. It was a master-level stab technique aimed at Ultima's heart, a true finisher that not even a magic born could evade. But. Then I'll kill you last. Faraga heard a voice behind him. His killing blow didn't even touch Ultima in her seat, instead, it went right through the chair, putting a hole in it. Shockingly, the girl had somehow gone from being right in front of him to right behind him. That was the unbelievable truth Faraga had to face. If you don't want to have a conversation, that's fine. I'm still gonna have you answer my questions, though. But don't worry. You don't have to say anything. I'll just take the knowledge from you myself. With an innocent smile, Ultima looked around at the soldiers and officers watching her. Then in a horribly chilling voice, she said. Okay, let's start with you first. What? Faraga quickly spun around. Some kind of round mass flew past his side before slamming against the wall, leaving a stain. It was a human head. One of his now dead aides fell to the floor, then began convulsing, as if he forgot he was supposed to do that until just that moment. What on? Well, he didn't know much, did he? Okay, let's keep going. With that, she randomly ripped off the head of another officer, played with it a bit in her fingers for a few seconds, then discarded it. This was now a process, and one she began to repeat with a steady rhythm, leaving a growing pile of corpses behind her. Now the bridge was transformed into a hellscape of shrieking and terror. T turned the magic canceller up to maximum. Contact the other ships and have them focus their sights on our flagship. The magicians in attendance were panicking, but Faraga's demands brought them back to their senses. Hurriedly, they followed the orders and sprang into action. Is this magic canceller your new weapon and stuff? It sends out random commands to local magicules to inhibit magic casting, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm sure that works on lots of monsters, but um, did you think it'd work on me? Ultima asked that question with just the most adorable head tilt. It was greeted with a near scream from Faraga. You're bluffing. Don't think you can bluff your way out of this. Mm, I dunno about that, I mean, if I was a mystic beast built up from magicules, then yeah, I feel that'd have a pretty good effect. But don't you think it's kind of a waste of time to point that at me if I've already incarnated into this body? What? Besides, maybe it'd be a different story with a lower-level demon, but not a high-end one, you know. Because when we're conscious, magic just kinda happens naturally with us, like you guys and breathing. Like this, see? With that, Ultima disappeared. At the same time, the head of the communications officer sitting at the end of the command deck flew off. Ultima had completed the job in an instant. Did you see that? All I did was move a bit, and it sent that man's head up in the air. I was going faster than the speed of sound, but you didn't feel any sonic boom, did you? That's magic, you know. And also. Ultima gave her hand a little shake. Her fingertips seemed to blur for a bit, as if in a haze. Then with the sound of something wet whapping into a hard object, the head of the aide standing next to Faraga burst apart, you see? If I want a shockwave, it's easy. All I have to do is follow the laws of physics, and ta de a. It was such an innocent way to calmly describe an atrocious act. She felt no guilt about it whatsoever. No, Faraga muttered to himself. Now he was finally understanding her. 
the common sense he had spent his life developing got in the way of comprehending any of this. It was such a strange feeling, like she was speaking a language from some faraway foreign nation. His instincts refused to accept it. Was? Was she really an archdemon? Even after all this time, Faraga was still pondering the true identity of Ultima. In terms of actual strength, Faraga was a good match for an archdemon, but a lot depended on age. A newborn one, he could beat all by himself. Against an ancient one or older, that'd be too much for him, but a lesser noble medieval in age or younger, well, he thought he had a sporting chance. So what was all this about? They had this magic canceller that could keep even Veldora himself pinned down and helpless, but it wasn't working for them at all, and even if Ultima, as this named demon called herself, was physically incarnated, her strength was simply extraordinary. That's what threw Faraga's common sense for a loop so badly. Now he understood that he had no hope at all of beating Ultima, no matter how much he struggled. So he wasted no more time playing his final move against her. Don't get cocky with me, demon. Summon spirit, Efreet. Come to me, elemental of the primordial flames. It was the most powerful of summon spells, offered only to champion-level casters. Faraga alone couldn't master that arcane art, but with the magic amplifier cannon on this ship and fifty magicians helping out, it was now possible. Magic cancellers had only a tiny effect on spirits, which is why such a summoning could even be successful. With a mighty roar, Ifrit materialized on the bridge, thoroughly trashing it. If the spirit was high level enough to outrank the demon, even an archdemon could be obliterated. Faraga was sure of it as he turned toward Ultima, I'll admit it, you're a menace. But we've been studying demons for a long, long time, and we're well prepared for them. Sorry, my friend, but it's over for you. Even with Faraga's strained voice ringing in her ears, Ultima kept smiling. And for the first time in his life, Faraga learned just how awful a smile could really be. You're kidding me. It can't be. There's no way she can beat the Ifrit I summoned. The Ifrit Faraga summoned had been granted the power of fifty magicians working through an amplifier cannon. That made it several times stronger than regular high-level spirits, and whether she was ancient or prehistoric, no archdemon could ever beat him. And yet Faraga's fear persisted. Don't get carried away just because you summoned that small fry. You really should have started talking while I was still giving you a nice, friendly smile. Now I'm gonna give you nothing but despair. Ah, it's over. That was the immediate thought, the instinct, in Faraga's mind. And the next moment, right before him and the surviving bridge crew, Efreet, the embodiment of absolute power, froze and shattered into a million pieces. It was the elemental magic Kokitis, and Ultima had just launched it without any casting time, as simple as breathing. Ah, ah. No. She's a monster. What was that? What was that? The poor fools were all crying for what was likely the last time, in a state of complete panic. It was a natural reaction to have. The living personification of death was standing before them. Okay. Now, back to question time. Ultima's voice, you could almost describe it as cheery, was the last thing all those souls ever heard. A few minutes later, a beaming Ultima chuckled to herself. She had acquired everything she wanted to know, and she was delighted with it all. She couldn't quite glean every single piece of knowledge from them, but to Ultima, reading people's brainwaves for information was a snap. She was an intelligence officer, and bringing back information was part of her mission. If she did a good job at it, she knew her master Raimuru would be pleased. I sure hope he gives me some praise, she thought, then he turned toward the last survivor in the room. This was Faraga, he was the only one Ultima had missed amid all this despair, and she sure didn't skip him out of any kind of mercy. And since you called me a fool, I'm going to give you the biggest scare of all. And I bet you'll survive it if you try hard enough, so let's see what you can do, okay? Upon whispering that, Ultima activated a spell. Jet black flames the size of a fist rose above her left hand. Oh, oh, oh. Faraga recognized it, 
an abyss core, a kind of uncontrollable hellfire that was the byproduct of activating a certain other magic. Or maybe it was controllable all along, and Faraga just didn't know how. He knew that three members of the Seven Days clergy, the champions of humankind, could manage it. But the abyss core Ultima just conjured up was more than a level larger than the one the Seven Days could create. He might not have known how it worked, but one look, and even he could understand how much of a tactical level threat this was, Ultima casually tossed it in the air. Okay, have fun. Why now? And without another word, she walked away from the bridge. Faraga, left to himself, was stunned. The question of what Ultima really was no longer mattered to him. As soon as he caught that abyss core, he realized he was at the end of his life. Instinctively, he understood that he'd never be able to control it, and that understanding was correct. Even his full power was meaningless against it. The fire that had left Ultima's control expanded, multiplied, and spread forward, as if mocking his worthless efforts. Just as Ultima took off, the dark ball of fire engulfed the flagship. Then it grew even bigger, swelling to a gigantic size and triggering an explosion. It was now a nuclear flame, the ultimate in destructive magic, and Faraga was in the middle of it. Beautiful. This is it. The magnum opus of all magic. With a look of ecstasy on his face, he let the dark flame scorch his body. Soon, it had evaporated, letting his very soul taste the pain of being burned alive. Master! Master Ghidorah! Have you ever gotten to experience this miracle? No, he decided. He couldn't have. Faraga understood that magic cancellor-driven interference wouldn't matter if it could be dominated by someone with strong enough thought waves. This beautiful destruction, the one giving Faraga such a sublime sense of despair, was all the proof he needed. And so, biting back the despair and enormous gratefulness of being surrounded by the ultimate in magic, Faraga's life came to a close. Thanks to the destructive nuclear flame, the flying combat core led by Faraga had been thoroughly crushed. Not a trace of it was left. The superheated flames caused most of the initial damage, followed by the secondary shock wave from the explosion. The flagship itself was vaporized by a core of unimaginable heat, while the surrounding ships exploded and scattered to the four winds, their hulls turning into lethal shrapnel. The larger fragments, hurtling downward beyond the speed of sound, caused incredible damage all by themselves. With that explosion, the outcome was set in stone. Only the very first ship to fall from the sky remained in any recognizable form. All the others were ripped apart by the chain of explosions that were the day's climax. Thus, the flying combat corps, the golden child of the imperial military, suffered the disgrace of being completely wiped away from existence well before it even caught a whiff of Veldora. Ultima was now flying away from the flagship, her interest in Faraga now gone from her mind. She turned to look at the swelling fireball, giving it a satisfied nod. Recalling Raimuru's order to go at full power, she wondered if she should have turned it up a notch after all but thought better of it. That would have killed off Team Hiryu on the ground, so this much was just fine. Despite the catastrophe occurring in the air, the damage to Team Hiryu was zero, as if it was calculated to end that way all along. Then again, if some of its members failed to meet their quota, they might have suffered some indirect casualties later, but that was none of Ultima's business. What she was more concerned about was Gable. What's Gable been doing over there? Gable had been exposed to prolonged magic cancellor fire. It sounded like the bridge had mistaken him for Veldora because of who knows why, but Ultima didn't let it bother her much. As things stood, however, he was going to get caught in the nuclear flame, so she really wanted him to retreat already. She flew over to his side, as much of a hassle as she knew this would be. Hey, Gable? What are you doing? Ah, Lady Ultima. I've actually gained a new sense, you see. He sounded oddly boastful about it. It piqued Ultima's interest, but evacuation took priority right now. She wouldn't be killed by her own magic, but Gable probably wouldn't survive. Okay, maybe he would, but she didn't want to take that bet, let alone be stigmatized as someone who killed her allies, and so Ultima forcibly removed Gable from the scene. Back on the ground, 
the two of them regrouped with Team Hiryu. It was finally time for Ultima's interrogation to begin, so what's this all about? She asked, her tone firm with Gable. Apart from her information officer duties, Ultima was also an observer watching over him, providing both support and advice so he didn't pull anything foolish. If Gable failed, that meant Ultima failed, too, so it was only natural that she was harsh with him. But Gable was totally oblivious to this. Gwahahaha. You see, when I was exposed to that special light beam the enemy shot at me, I had a brief stroke of genius. I immediately saw that this light affected magicules, and so I wanted to experiment to see how long I could withstand it. I should just turn this lizard over to Sir Raimuru and have him scream at him, Ultima thought, but she held her ground and soldiered on. And so what's this new sense of yours? Yes, that's the thing. All of you, come up and listen close. Sir Midre told us that our intrinsic skill dragon body would become available to us for longer periods of time as we trained with it. I, too, kept myself transformed that entire time, didn't I? He looked around his squad mates, sneering at them. Upon hearing this, Team Hiryu exchanged glances with each other, surprised. They were all able to transform for an average of about ten minutes, and they had long since returned to their original forms by now. I thought that'd be a given for you, Sir Gable, but no. If you teach us this secret, can we do it, too? His troops began growing more and more excited. It made Ultima glance at them with cold, dead eyes. If only these lizards could experience a little pain for a change, she thought. She showed no mercy to her foes and little care for those below her in rank, but technically speaking, Gable's force wasn't in her hierarchy. If he disposed of them without permission, Raimuru would fume at her. And a bit of a lecture was one thing, but when she recalled how Raimuru reacted whenever one of his people got hurt, she'd likely receive a much harsher punishment, maybe even banishment. Ultima was determined not to let that happen, so after weighing that punishment against the chance to release some stress on these lizards, she reluctantly decided to remain patient. It is thanks to you, Gable told her, that I've discovered the secret of this power. You believed me when I said I had an idea, and you bought me enough time to think it through. What? He he he. No need to play dumb, for I, Gable, can see right through you. We all thank you for giving us the opportunity to grow from our inexperience. Ultima never turned down a compliment. Regaining her composure, she decided to revise her assessment of Gable a bit. Okay, that's enough. So what did you discover, Gable? because everyone else seems to want to know about it. She decided not to bother correcting Gable's misunderstanding. Right now, it was more important to get this situation under control. By this point, fighting was taking place only in localized pockets. There was the rear, commanded by Hakuro, the center, where Gobda slash Ranga was still rampaging away, and the three main enemy positions Testarossa was headed for. Now that Gable's crew had finished destroying their air force, it was time to head off and provide support for other parts of the battle. There was no time for idle chit-chat. I'll report this to Sir Raimuru as well, but before that, I will be as brief as I can. And all of you listen up, too, because it'll help everyone be stronger. Gable sternly began his explanation. It was, in essence, a way to fully control the dragon body skill. As an intrinsic Dragonute skill, Dragon Body strengthened the user's body via a surge of magicules. This surge took in matter around it for its strengthening effect. More mass meant enhanced defense, along with near-immediate recovery if the user was injured. Having magicules running out of control like this meant casting magic was off the table, but they'd have no problem using breath and other ability-based skills. As long as they could keep a hold of their consciousness, it provided enhanced strength with almost no downside. Now, it seems that this enemy attack has a tendency to disrupt the movement of magicules around us, and I could feel it further enhancing my powers. What? You mean, even beyond your current form? Ultima was surprised, this was an unexpected side effect of the magic canceller. Right now, Gable had magicule energy in him equivalent to back when Clayman awoke for the last time. If it could be further strengthened from here, 
he was definitely worth listening to. The idea of magicule disruption boosting one's power to the point that they'd statistically outdo an awakened true demon lord was enough to shock even Ultima. But there was always a catch. No, no, not like that. There's more power, yes, but I couldn't handle it very well. So I consciously focused myself, so I could feel the magicules running rampant in my body, but... But the result was that pinned-down performance he showed off a bit ago. He wasn't taking damage, but he couldn't move at all. However, Gable had a knack for turning anything to his advantage, and so through that experience, he learned how to more fully sense his magicules. That's what Sir Midre was referring to when he talked about a state of selflessness, I think. Looking into your inner space, turning an ear to it, and then. You're taking too long. Keep it short and simple. Gable's force nodded their agreement at Ultima's sharp feedback. Oh, Gable said, overpowered. Well, essentially, by sensing the magicules running around wild inside me, I could send my thoughts to it. And then, wonder of wonders, I gained control over their power. The first impression of his men upon hearing this was that he was nuts. On the other hand, it gave Ultima food for thought. Seeing them made her realize that while it was easier than breathing for her, it must have been really tough for Team Hiryu. This gave her a real shot of motivation. Wait. If I train Gable's force, maybe they can become even stronger? Doing that would definitely make her useful to Raimuru. The potential for receiving praise from it was enormous. I know exactly what you mean, Gable. But we can take the time to discuss this later, all right? because right now, I really think we need to support the goblins. It was her way of saying this break was over. Typically, she'd report to Raimuru about how lazy they were, but after receiving such useful information from Gable, Ultima raised her opinion of him slightly. That was why she was being so gracious here, overlooking Gable's erratic behavior this time. Ah yes, you're right. Well, time for us to step in and provide aid, then. Gable nodded happily. He still had the completely wrong idea, but Ultima didn't see that as a problem. It was better that way for her, even, so she let them be without further comment. Anyone who didn't meet their quota is going to face some thorough re-education later, so be prepared. You said it. I'll pitch in on that, too. Ultima gave him an adorable smile. It seemed like a very good idea to her. And so, blissfully unaware of her intentions, Team Hiryu went back out on the field. Nonsense. This is ridiculous. At the main camp, far from the battlefield, Lieutenant General Gaster ranted, his face pale. Before him was a scene of unbelievable devastation. The Magitank force, his pride and joy, was being tossed around by a monster wolf that had taken human form. It was a nightmarish scene, Safe to say there were more destroyed tanks than intact ones by now. Defeat was unavoidable at this point, but the battle had progressed so much faster than expected that they had already missed their retreat window. They hadn't even been able to report the situation to Caligulio, general commander and leader of the armored division. Got a report back to that bastard Caligulio ASAP and asked for permission to withdraw. Gaster's sense of reason was pleading with him. And yet, even if he submitted that report, he'd likely never receive permission. The main force led by Caligulio had already kicked off their operation, if Gaster and the rest of the forces here withdrew, they'd be left totally isolated. The restructured armor corps, their main force, was being deployed in front of the demon lord Raimuru's stronghold. They were all proud warriors of the empire, each of whom underwent reconstructive surgery, and they numbered an overwhelming 700,000 strong. They were a sure thing, absolutely certain to win, but if they knew the rest of the army had been defeated, it was bound to shake them. Plus, the Dwarven Kingdom's army would go on the move soon. Once they did, the restructured army corps could be caught between the dwarves and the demon Lord Raimuru's forces, leaving the corps surrounded and cut off from their supply lines. They could function for about a week without food, drink, or sleep, but no more. They were still human beings, and even they needed supplies. My mission is to subdue the Dwarven Kingdom. If I withdrew from the war zone here, 
I'd be abandoning Caligulio and all his forces. Even if we can't win, we must at least maintain the stalemate. But that was a questionable option. The only thing Gasta saw ahead for his army was defeat. Confusion was reigning toward the rear, and the chain of command was starting to fall apart. They were even seeing friendly fire now. Even if they kept going, it was just a matter of time before they were annihilated. Lieutenant General. If we keep this up, one way or the other we'll be wiped out. Retreat. Give us the retreat order. He didn't need his advisers to spell it out for him, he firmly agreed with them. But if it was said out loud, all responsibility for the defeat would fall upon his shoulders. Lieutenant General Gaster was a man of impeccable personal bravery, one with a fine reputation within the military. He had never known a setback like this in his whole career, which was what made this seem so peculiar to him. We can't retreat. If we do, His Majesty is bound to punish me. I can't ever allow that to happen. I'm the man who'll become a hero, but now all the glory is disappearing. Unless I've got something firm to prove that it's not just my fault. The very prestige of the Empire was riding on this operation. If it failed because of him. Such was the true nature of Gaster's thoughts, something only coming up to the surface now. In fact, he was always a small-minded person, caring only about saving his own hide and not blinking at the thought of sacrificing his troops. Lieutenant General, if we continue like this, it'll be difficult to even rebuild our forces, we're still in control of our main force, I think we should use them to strike the enemy in the rear. There's no shame in a temporary retreat. If we keep fighting in close quarters like this, it's only going to cause us more casualties. Amid these suggestions, Gaster finally began using his head again. Lose the unit he'd been placed in charge of, and he'd never escape punishment either way. Demotion wouldn't be the end of it, they might not even give him a trial before they took his life. Damn it! I'm going to be a hero. And now, all these damn incompetents are dragging me down. Gaster's ugly nature was now bare for all to see but his voice was then drowned out by the sound of a huge explosion. Turmoil spread across the main camp. What's going on? It's, it's an enemy magic attack. Magic? No. Is that nuclear magic? We haven't confirmed it yet, but judging by the scale, it has to be. But um. But what? Speak up. Yes, sir. The enemy's offense seems to have easily penetrated our legion magic protecting our force from magic strikes. What? Damage report. The explosion occurred in the sky, sir, we've lost contact with our allied airships. That, that's ridiculous. Are you saying that the Flying Combat Corps, the jewel of our entire military, is gone? Gradually, in fits and starts, the situation grew clear, and now everyone realized the damage was far more serious than they imagined. They had lost contact with not one airship, but all of them. That magic just now must have taken them all down. They were equipped with magic cancelers, a new type of weapon, but it was magic that did them in? It was so hard to believe. Retreat. Wait, no. We have to. Yes, we have to change course and gather ourselves. Gaster sent out the order, aimed more at himself than his soldiers. He had finally made the decision to retreat from this ghastly situation, but that decision had already come decisively too late. A cool voice echoed through the battlefield. Huh? You're not going to claim this is the end, are you? Because I've already told you, invade us any further, and we'll show no mercy. Gaster turned his panicked head toward the voice and saw a beautiful snow-white face with a beaming smile. It was Testarossa. I'm a woman of my word, you know. When I visited this world in the past, I made sure I fully granted the wishes of my summoner. Rest assured, I'm going to reward you handsomely as well. Fear flooded Gaster's mind. Not a petty little fear involving saving his own ass, but an endlessly churning terror that threatened the very foundation of his life, eroding his instincts. Why you? Oh? I wonder if you forgot about that? If so, that's very rude of you. Testarossa eyed him like an affectionate mother looking down at her naughty son. 
Gaster would never have forgotten. Not that much time had passed since they parted, but no matter how many years went by, her lovely white hair and scarlet eyes were too beautiful to ever forget. More than that, it was all so terrifying. Her beauty gave him an unfathomable sense of foreboding. Suppressing his fear, Gaster tried ordering his men to attack, but there was no one to answer the call. I'm not sure what you're trying to do, but your men are resting at the moment. They must have been pretty tired, huh? I can't seem to get them up. She was whispering in his ear now. They were talking face to face a moment ago, but now he found her standing right behind him. He hadn't been careless, he never even took his eyes off her, but before he knew it, Testa Rossa had moved on him. It was just too fast, and even more frightening, there was no sound accompanying it at all. Gaster's unique skill performer allowed him to detect the movements of his opponents through sound. He could capture even the faintest of noises, things not even a trained guru could control, not just the beating of one's heart, but even the blood flowing through their veins. And yet sound was completely absent from Testarossa. Then Gaster discovered another terrifying fact. He couldn't hear any sound from his fallen men, either. They were dead. Why you? You didn't kill them, did you? Gaster staggered away from Testarossa, hmm? She replied, not betraying any remorse. Well, you know, I was a bit hungry, so I took some. Took some? Took some what? Oh, a few souls. Her matter-of-fact tone of voice infuriated Gaster. The anger overcame his fear, replenishing the strength in his body. Die, you foul demon. Mind requiem. Letting his momentum take him up, Gaster unleashed the most powerful move he could muster, scattering inescapable, murderous sound waves into the surrounding space. The special effects these waves had on the minds of intelligent life forms caused instant death. It was one of his all-powerful finishing moves, effective even against spiritual life forms like demons. But Testarossa just smiled elegantly at him. Ah, what a pleasant tone. It'd be such a waste that you had to be human. What a pity. You have such wonderful talent as a musician, but now I have to kill you. Her enraptured expression clouded with sadness. Seeing it made Gaster realize that his attack didn't work. It plunged him into despair. He had been fooled by her beautiful appearance, but Testarossa was definitely not human. In fact, he finally realized, she was a higher-ranked being than he had ever seen before in his life. Maybe even more so than that rampaging wolf hybrid. This was beyond dangerous. Are you saying there's monsters like that all over this nation? If so, then we may have gravely misjudged our strategy from the start. After all this time, Gasta finally began to feel some regret. Along with that, he foresaw the complete failure of the Empire's military operation. All of this, and above that, Tempest had the catastrophe-class threat Veldora. The war was already dangerously close to being lost. There was no way they could stage a comeback. So Gasta began to get desperate. Wait. I want to make a deal. Oh? What kind? I, I'm high-ranked in the Empire. I'm well-versed in our military operation. I have classified information on me. I can be useful to you, I promise. So please, spare my life. Throwing all shame and outward appearances aside, Gaster begged for mercy, but there was still a glint of light in his eyes, and he was careful to keep an eye on Testarossa's response. He thought he was out of options, but right now, his ears caught the sound of several footsteps approaching. He had an idea of who they were. They were running quietly enough that only he could notice them. Just from those footsteps, he could immediately surmise they were from the Imperial Intelligence Bureau. If the IIB had agents monitoring the battlefield, it certainly wouldn't surprise Gaster. They were directed by Tatsuya Kondo, the one stalking the halls of information, and he was sure Tatsuya would use every measure at his disposal here. So he decided to believe that they were here to save him. It didn't matter how pathetic it made him look, if they could buy enough time for him, he'd be saved. His confidence in this mainly stemmed from a rumor about the IIB he had heard a while back. 
among the IIB staff were people simply termed intelligence officers, operatives with first-class combat skills who were trained for operations in any environment. Their names were unknown to the public because they never joined in any ranking duels, they were affiliated with the IIB, and they never transferred out. They were, in a way, removed from the world at large, working strictly under the mysterious otherworld at Tatsuya Kondo. That was all just a rumor, and not a very credible one at that, but Gaster had nothing else to grasp onto right now. If these were just regular soldiers coming along, it was all over. But if they were IIB intelligence officers? Well, with Gaster's help, they could probably beat Testarossa. That was why, right then, he had to do whatever he could, even beg for his life, to buy some more time. And the bet paid off. Do you sense that? You're a demon. No, an arch demon. Several soldiers jumped out in front of Gaster, shouting. He thanked his own good fortune, and when he heard the term arch demon, it suddenly made sense. No way his physical attacks would ever work, he was dealing with a spiritual life form. And an arch demon was top of the heap among them, dangerous enough to pose a calamity level threat. Only a true champion could fight one off solo, and maybe Gaster would have a chance, but it'd truly be a fight for his life. W.H. Who are you? Three men were now on the scene. The sight of them reassured Gaster enough that he dared to ask. Sir. We're from the IIB. I. Just as Gaster expected, they were secret agents. One of them was about to state his name, but the man in the middle, the leader, apparently, stopped him. Whoa! Now's not a good time to give out names. The first man turned toward Testarossa, a concerned look on his face. You're no regular archdemon, are you? It looks like she's received a physical body. TCH. No wonder she had such a faint presence. Lieutenant General, we'll get to names later. For now, we have to team up to beat this evil demon. Yes, of course. Gaster had no choice but to back the leader. It was annoying to not be in charge, but right then, survival was everything. In a brilliant display of coordination, the IRB men instantly surrounded Testarossa, using a chain made of monster hair to block her movement on three sides. Unbeknownst to Gaster, this move was the Imperial Suppression Stance. It was the most advanced killing formation taught in the Empire, allowing a team of three people to defeat higher-level monsters, even arch demons. The secret was in this chain, woven with the hair of monsters and forged from holy silver, a legend class treasure. These definitely weren't rank and file soldiers carrying it, and in fact, the members of this trio were among the greatest fighters in the Empire, Knights of the Imperial Guardians, in disguise. Davis, ranked 11th. Balt, ranked 38th. Gordon, ranked 64th. When running an infiltration mission, Imperial Knights preferred to work in groups of three. The Imperial Guardians had their own numerical pecking order, and it was customary for the smallest number to be their leader. In terms of strength, the gap between the twenties and the thirties and below, number-wise, was enormous. Those assigned number thirty or below were enlightened, reaching dimensions beyond humanity, and they all had powers almost as strong as saints, and one of them was here now. Davis, who played a key role in the bloody Shaw incident. Davis's team had sealed away Blanc, that nightmarish primal demon, and now he was swooping in at Gaster's time of need. He and Blanc had a score to settle. Watching the knights act as one to subdue Testarossa, Gaster cheered internally, assuming he was saved. If he kept throwing mind requiem her way, he reasoned, even a spiritual life form couldn't last long. He had included physical creatures in his previous attack, but this time, he adjusted it so it only affected spirituals. That way, no matter how lofty an archdemon she was, it'd be impossible for her to maintain her existence. That's what he thought. But again, he was too naive. This strategy didn't take into account the fact that Testarossa was physically incarnated, it was meaningless to act only upon her mind, and his mind requiem had no hope of working. But even before that. Oh my goodness, what a fond trip down memory lane. These are the people who defeated me before, aren't they? 
What? This is so nice. I was so rudely interrupted last time that I wasn't able to eat a full meal back then. I had this wonderful meal set up for me, and just when I was set to dig in, that happened. Don't think I've forgotten about that. Testarossa's voice, filled with malice, echoed across the area. Despite being blocked by the chain, she didn't sound even remotely concerned. No. This evil presence. Look at her. Is that Blanc, the original white? It can't be. We made so much of an effort sealing her away, and she's back this quickly. Testarossa laughed at how upset all three were. It was so wicked of her, yet so beautiful. He he. He 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 he. Ah, such lovely expressions on your faces. Fear, anxiety, and completely unfounded confidence. All you can do is pretend to yourselves, but you still haven't run away from me? You certainly do enjoy engaging in wasted efforts, don't you? Shut up, demon. We didn't expect you to come back, but don't forget, we've sealed you once already, remember. Boast about your victory after you beat us. Davis is right. We're going to destroy you down to the soul this time. This declaration was ridiculous to Testarossa, you guys are so funny to me. Are you sure you should be that self-confident? You think the exact same technique is going to work on me a second time? She asked the question as elegantly as could be, even as the imperial suppression stance caught her in its grasp. Quit being a sore loser. Nobody here's gonna listen to a demon's nonsense. Well said, Gordon. There's no place for you in this world, demon. And if you couldn't get it through your head once, we'll bury you as many times as it takes. Lieutenant General Gaster. Leave this scene to us, please. You and your troops should retreat. Davis was calm from start to finish. The original White's appearance was unexpected, but he still hadn't forgotten his original purpose. He was attempting to defeat the wolf demon, the combined Gobta slash Ranga. In order to achieve that, Davis intended to convince Gaster to withdraw his troops so Davis didn't blow his cover finishing that monster off. Not even Davis had the right to give orders to the higher-ranked Gaster, if worse came to worst, eliminating him from the picture entirely was a possibility. But with Blanc on the scene, now was no time for that. Davis had no hope of beating her while maintaining his cover, in fact, unless he got all the nearby troops out of here fast they could all get caught up in this battle. Gaster, unaware of any of this, was suddenly spurred back into action. He was having trouble keeping up with this situation. Blanc? The original white? What are they talking about? Do, do they mean that archdemon? Ah, I can't think about that now. Enough thinking about who this trio is, I gotta survive this. Desperately slamming his brain into motion, he tried to come up with a solution. Then, in a panic, he used his unique skill performer to order his entire army to retreat. But it was too late. The moment he had encountered Testarossa, all hopes had already been dashed. Davis, Balt, and Gordon were three nameless heroes who had once defeated a powerful demon lord. The incident was known as the Bloody Shore, when Blanc, the dreaded original white who ruled over the demons of the East, came dangerously close to incarnating herself in this world. Ever since, the Empire's vigilance against demons had changed dramatically. Every city had its own demon control office now, and their summoning was banned by law. If an archdemon was ever to physically incarnate itself, it'd require mobilizing the army to deal with it either way. If not handled property, it'd be a potentially city-wrecking disaster. Plus, this was a primal, a very special existence among archdemons, their strength couldn't even be measured in terms of mere magicules. Ever since that incident, Davis believed it was sheer good fortune that let them defeat Blanc. But at the same time, he was confident that no matter how many times they staged that fight again, he'd never lose. Why? Because he was ranked 11th. Even the strongest champions of the outside world were no match for the truly powerful, those who had lived for over a thousand years in the underworld. We're talking the magic-born Rosin, guardian of Pharmus, and the heroic King Garzel of the armed nation of Dorgan. Other worlders like Yuki Kagurazaka and Hinata Sakaguchi wouldn't cut it. 
neither would Thalion's Magus Corps or Lubelius's Crusaders. No matter their strength, they'd always be a mere blur before the Imperial Guardians. And even among this all-powerful group, the single digits held a special position. Davis, being ranked eleventh, served as their assistant. His Majesty has given us this, the most powerful of gear. With our combined powers, there's no way a mere demon could defeat us. Davis was brimming with confidence. Once he urged Gaster to retreat, he turned to his companions. Both of you, open it up. It looks like Blancs incarnated herself, but she couldn't have stored up that many magicules yet. We'll hit her with all we got. Right. On it. Gordon nodded, Belt smiled defiantly. As they acknowledged him, the pendants hanging from all three of their necks began to glow. The light soon became a torrent, enveloping their bodies, and what emerged from them were three warriors wearing golden full-plate mail. This was legend-class armor, only given to the chosen ones. Imperial guardians generally preferred their choice of weapon, but their armor was generally all the same. This was impeccable quality, handed down from ancient times, no ordinary person could even catch a glimpse of them. And now that they had it on, Davis and his companions were able to fight with all their might. Bad luck for you, original white. Maybe you've gained a physical body, but that's where it ends. Meeting us here was the end of your good fortune, NGH. To give him a better chance at finishing off Testarossa, Davis had put more strength into his grip on the chain. Then he noticed that there was no response from it. Testarossa, whom he had sealed up inside the chain, had slipped it off like a pair of pants. Look, do you think I'm going to let you do that? Davis turned toward the chilling voice. There he saw Testarossa, whose hand was on Gaster's neck. With a dull snap, the lieutenant general collapsed. He was dead, killed by the demon without putting up the slightest resistance. How? Davis instinctively shouted. Gaster might have been more than a little self-centered, but he was no weakling. He was a lieutenant general, and he had the ability to match, in fact, he had every right to join the Imperial Guardian's ranks. Probably just a far-flung number, yes, but even so, he wasn't the kind of man who'd go down that easy. That, and Davis shuddered as he looked at his hands. The chain of holy silver, monster hair threaded through it, this legend-class piece of gear had been battered to pieces. Confused frustration flashed across his face, as it did with Balt and Gordon. They had no idea when Testarossa had even moved, much less broken the chain. And the hardship didn't end there. Oh, were you waiting for me? If so, I'm sorry. This man was trying to escape, so I had to give him a little punishment. If I didn't, you know, that'd be disobeying Sir Raimuru's orders. We can't have that, can we? Testarossa shot the men a lustrous smile as she sized them up. Then something else occurred to him. Ah, right. I've been wondering, would you three mind not calling me Blanc, or the original White or what not? What? I mean, you know, I've got a name now, it's Testarossa. I'd really hate it if you didn't use it, you see? The statement was a peal of despair for Davis and his team. Wait. A name? A name? Testarossa. Some fool gave a primal a name? First an incarnation, then a name. This was unprecedented. Suddenly, their position wasn't looking so good after all. We must retreat. This crisis must be brought to His Majesty's attention immediately. Yeah, I hear ya. I'll hold her off. And I'll set up a warp portal. The trio's teamwork was beyond reproach. Quickly dividing work among themselves, they sprang into action, Gordon already casting the warp spell. Once they did, Testarossa let out an evil laugh, lovingly, beautifully, but with a truly sinister touch. What's so funny? Balt shouted, taking up his spear and charging at her. But Testarossa had already disappeared. Balt had no chance of keeping up with her. Damn it, where the hell did you go? Over here. A hot breath blew into Bolt's ear, filling his nostrils with a sweet, fragrant scent. There was no need to turn around, it was Testarossa. Then he felt a cold, delicate female hand on his neck, 
almost chilling his soul. Ah, uh, ah? Uh? The image of the now limp Gaster flashed through his mind. I hate it when people don't realize the limits of their abilities. But it was questionable whether Testarossa's voice even reached Belt. Crack. Belt collapsed, a sobering look of terror on his face, and that was the end of the 38th ranked member of the Imperial Guardians. Davis, watching all this, experienced a feeling of panicked self-doubt that disturbed his thoughts for the first time in several hundred years. Gordon, hurry up. She's killed Belt. She's too dangerous. His voice was colored with fear, regardless of his intentions. Gordon nodded silently, as if he understood. His teleportation magic now complete, the circle of magic floating above the ground began to glow. Okay, retreat. Davis sprinted toward the circle as he made the order, but the spell failed to activate. W-H what? Why? Testarossa kindly explained it to Gordon, as if ridiculing him for being so upset, I'm not sure what's so strange about that. I'm not using the magic canceller wrong, am I? Davis and Gordon had no idea what she was talking about. What? The magic canceller? Wait, did you recreate it with magic? She looked at them and let out an exasperated sigh. Testarossa had been sharing information with Ultima and Carrera via thought communication. Among the information she obtained that way was data on the magic cancellers installed on the airships. For Testarossa, recreating and using the technology from the data she obtained was child's play. But such an act was well beyond the scope of human common sense, and it'd be absurd to expect Davis and Gordon to understand it. All they did know was. What? What are you? Whether you're a primal or not, there's no way an archdemon can have that much power. Davis was shouting now, trying to paint over his own fears. Why, yeah. You weren't this overwhelming the last time we fought. What the hell did you do to evolve this much? Evolve? Davis and Gordon looked at each other. Hearing his own cries, Gordon now understood exactly what was going on with Testarossa, no matter how much he didn't want to. The same went for Davis. Incarnated, named, and thanks to that, what kind of being had Testarossa, the original white, become? Testarossa gave them a bemused look, leisurely eliminating all doubt. Oh, how clever of you. That's right. Now that I have a name, I'm higher level than even an archdemon. Have you ever heard the term demon peer before? It's something completely different from an arch demon. A pity I need to spell it out to people before they understand, isn't it? It only plunged the two of them deeper into despair. D. Demon Peer The Second Coming of Guy Crimson Only then did Davis and Gordon realize the gravity of the situation. This primal hadn't manifested herself just for a laugh, she had a firm will, and she used it to fully take root here, but didn't you lose interest in this world when you lost the princess's body? Not quite. By the time you came along back then, my contract with the girl had already been fulfilled. That's why I left, although certainly not without my regrets. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you laboring under the assumption that you could beat me? Well, silly, I think you see that's not going to happen now. It can't be. Davis could feel his own confidence shatter. I still haven't forgiven you for interrupting my meal back then, you know. H. Hey. Davis. Neither Davis nor Gordon were able to move. Testarossa's crimson eyes bolted them to the ground, like a snake staring down a frog. Your meal? Davis repeated. All he could do was keep talking to buy more time. With that precious time, he desperately tried to figure out what was happening to his body. Anything so he could have a shot at Testarossa, proud and confident in her victory. That's right. That beautiful lake was bathed in enough blood to turn crimson red, but that still didn't make me fool, you know. Nearly ten thousand innocent people died. Well, that's how our deal worked. Besides, you interrupted me before I could enjoy the main course, the most important part. Now that we're all together and everything, why don't we take this opportunity to have you atone for your sins? You you. Testarossa was the very one behind the bloody shore tragedy, 
but to her, that regretful disaster was just a simple meal. And it's still not enough? Davis's heart seethed with rage. Flames of justice burned through the kindling of his fear. This evil, he thought, could never be left unchecked. An evil like you. Raising the gleaming sword in his hand, Davis struggled to escape Testarossa's binding spell. The initial results were promising, he could feel his body regaining its strength, but Davis's despair had only just begun. You're not gonna kill them yet, Testarossa? I don't mean to interrupt, but I think it's time to end this. A cute voice, not at all appropriate for a battlefield, was heard from above. It belonged to a girl with bluish-purple hair in a side ponytail, Ultima. Even Davis, ranked eleventh in his nation's hierarchy, could sense there was something unusual about her. Oh, is that you, Ultima? said Testarossa. Did I make you wait long? Mm, I've just been taking my time with Gable's band, so I'm not one to talk, but Saraimuru asked us to give our all, so if we don't finish this fast, he's gonna be mad, you know? I sure don't want that. Right? I just ran into some old acquaintances of mine, so we wound up chatting a bit. But you're right. Let's end this before Sir Raimaru gets angry. Davis couldn't understand the conversation unfolding in front of him. Or really, it's not that he couldn't, he just didn't want to. No, 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 no. Testarossa and Ultima were both doubtlessly on the same level two demon peers. Taking on just one of them was difficult enough. Having backup just sealed the deal. Davis's flames of righteousness, burning hot inside him, had been painted black before he even knew it, black with fear. The glory of being the eleventh imperial guardian was meaningless in front of this duo. If it was just one arch demon, Davis might have been able to take care of it himself, but the reality of two demon peers almost broke his heart. He couldn't be blamed for that, in fact, Gordon was already crouched down and sobbing. Once a quiet, reliable man, now he was behaving like a little child. Suddenly, Davis felt jealous of Balt, dying before him and all. He had passed on without even realizing the true identity of what he had been up against. How fortunate for him. Great idea. Well, I'm sorry to say goodbye, but I have to go. I know since we're old friends and all, why don't I show you the magic you wanted to see? Testarossa sounded as amused as ever, speaking to the stunned Davis. He didn't know what it meant, but he did know the end was near. From the deepest darkness, a black flame was called forth. The flame, condensed to the size of a fist, shone on the palm of Testarossa's hand. It was an abyss core, a notoriously hard-to-control type of hellfire, but Testarossa crushed it into her hand with ease. Laughing to herself, Testarossa whispered in a sing-song voice. Death streak. Davis's eyes widened. He didn't know what this magic was. He couldn't comprehend it. No idea. But one thing was for sure, it was incredibly evil. And you over there, you know Guy Crimson, huh? In that case, you know what this magic is, don't you? the same one Guy used when he became a demon lord. Sadly, Davis's consciousness cut out at this point, plunging into an even deeper abyss of desperation, wishing he had never known anything at all. Dot. Dot. The abyss core crushed into Testarossa's hand became a black light that shone across the surroundings. It had the property of penetrating through almost all types of matter, a dark light that never occurred naturally. When it passed through a living being, it directly affected their genetic sequences, forcibly rewriting their genes to kill almost anything it encountered. It was deathly magic, the epitome of pure evil, but according to tradition, it existed for a different purpose. The only ones who could withstand this magic were spiritual life forms or those whose souls had memory retention skills. Living things who could completely reconstruct their bodies after they were completely destroyed could escape this magic, and nobody else. Spiritual particles, the tiny matter that made up magicules, emitted a special sort of wave. This was the light of darkness itself, difficult to counteract with magic and impossible to counteract via physical means. The only way to resist them was with other spiritual particles, and thus, 
the only way to resist dark light was with more dark light. No other type of protection was possible. Exposure to this light produced a 99.999% fatality rate. But not even that was 100%, and so, extremely rarely, there were survivors. One in a million would react by turning their body into a monster and gaining new life. In other words, this magic also selected those most suitable for monster transformation, granting the victims their blessing. It was the worst, most taboo kind of spell, this nuclear-level death streak. Instead of destroying physically like disintegration, it accurately bore down only on the particles that created life memory. It was the ultimate forbidden magic, one that could destroy the very souls of people. Dot. Dot. And so Davis, ranked 11th in the Empire, and Gordon, ranked 64th and pretty much just along for the ride, became the first victims of Testarossa's death streak. It didn't end there. Shortly thereafter, a ferocious rampage of death blew across the land, affecting everything within a 500-yard radius. It didn't distinguish between friend or foe, killing every living thing within that range, and that's why Testarossa used magic sense to ensure there were no allies close by before launching it. And this was her going easy. If she had cast Death Streak with all dampers removed, everything within several miles would have breathed their last. Death Streak was just as effective against spiritual life forms as it was to anything else, but Testarossa had been careful to activate it in a way that wouldn't affect their souls, so it was harmless to her and Ultima. The two of them casually surveyed the results. Doesn't look like there's anything alive in this whole area. By the way, you did a really good job with these, Testarossa. Oh? What do you mean? These toys they call tanks, I mean. They all look in perfect shape, so we can bring them back intact and examine them more. Well, of course. That's why I cleaned out only the humans from here. Hmm. You know, maybe I should have cast Death Streak, too, instead of cutting corners up there. Then maybe I wouldn't have broken up all those toys in the sky. True, Alt, you could say you were a bit too flashy there. But if we can recover that first sample that crash landed, that it ought to be enough for reference. Sure. Although I sure did cause a lot more damage to them than I thought. Those toys are so fragile. I only meant to destroy one, but I wound up breaking a whole bunch of them. Well, so be it. Now that Saraimaru named us, we're both stronger than ever. We're gonna have to be more careful from now on, Ultima. Yeah. I feel bad about it, too. But you know, what I'm really worried about is Carrera. I'm not sure if she knows what the word restraint means, and you know how much she loves flashy magic. That's why she's on standby over at our headquarters. Raimuru had the foresight to assign her to that, which I was certainly glad to see. Oh. Well, that's a relief. So they merrily chatted on. They may have been misreading Raimuru in a few ways, but nobody was around to point it out to them. And Benimaru's a real worrywart, huh? Talking about how he thinks there are people in the Empire who can harm Saraimaru and all. Even asking us to go easy so we can find out who it is, said Ultima. That is a little troublesome, yes. If all we wanted was to win, they should have just sent us out alone from the start. Then Saraimaru wouldn't need to bother with anything at all. Well, it was Saraimaru's idea, wasn't it? he even told us not to fight. I think he wanted to give Gobda and Gable and their forces a chance to grow a bit. It'd be easy for him to just evolve them upward, but the only way to get experience is to actually do it, after all. Some dolt with a lot of power and nothing else is just a wimp to us. That's a great idea, I think. I get it and all, but, well, you know. At least we got to perform in the end. That's nice. Testarossa and Ultima were enjoying themselves well enough, but as they spoke, they were also carefully gathering up the souls of all the dead around them. The forbidden spell Death Streak had a secret, there were no known successful cases of someone turned into a monster by it. The only way it ever would do the trick was if you had a soul left to be transformed. But if those souls were all being harvested, as they were right then, the chance of survival went from one in a million to exactly zero. They said the devil never gave you a straight deal, 
and this was maybe another example of that. A great way to hide the real probabilities, though. Testarossa and Ultima were aware of that, naturally, and that was why, once they were sure there were no survivors out on the field, they declared the battle over, witnessing the fate of those who messed with her never moved Testarossa's heart. There was no real emotion, she treated them the same as anyone else. They had never been in Testarossa's mind in the first place, so this was only natural. And with that, the battle with her cohort was finished. Two departments of the armored division that participated in this operation, the Magitank Force and the Flying Combat Corps, suffered total defeat. With the death of Lieutenant General Gaster, the Empire had lost its local base of operations, leaving the soldiers out on the farther reaches isolated and struggling to flee. Now the only question in this battle of annihilation was how long it would last. Gaster's Magitank Force numbered 200,000 service people, while Major General Faraga's Flying Combat Corps had 40,000. Without a commander, there was no way for the Imperial Army to request a ceasefire. And so all the Imperial forces on the ground and in the air lost their lives on the battlefield, at that moment, the Tempest side was confirmed the victors. But this didn't mean the end of the war. That was because General Caligulio, commander of the armored division, still had no idea about this defeat. And at that very moment, the restructured armor corps, the heart and soul of the whole armored division, was about to hit the road for Raimaru, capital of Tempest. Interlude Garzel's Melancholy Garzel, king of the dwarves, was stunned to see the scene on the big screen in front of him. This. This is just. My liege, your agitation is showing on your face. Don't tell me you're still that naive about this. Ah, Jane, you say that, but how else are we supposed to react? All conventional wisdom about warfare is being thrown out the window. The prodding of Jane, Dwargan's elderly archwizard, was met with a rebuke not by Garzel, but by Vaughan, Admiral Paladin and Supreme Commander of the Dwarven Force. It was understandable. This large screen provided by Raimuru's new technology showed warfare at its worst, projected to them as it happened, even to the usually jaded Garzel, it was something extraordinary to witness. This certainly turns conventional wisdom about war on its ear, doesn't it? Dolph, captain of the Pegasus Knights, breathed a tired sigh. Not even a legion magic barrier could block that tank's attack. Face up to that without knowing anything, and defeat is inevitable. But, while we have every right to be terrified by it, we can handle it by building trenches and earthen walls. Just like it was foretold to us. They all nodded. As they had concluded, one wall wouldn't be enough to keep the shells at bay, but multiple layers of defensive walls could very effectively tamp down their power. That countermeasure was based on Raimaru's knowledge, and although the battle ended before it could be put to use, based on the power they saw in the video footage, they had come to the conclusion that this was no overwhelming weapon that rendered them totally helpless. Looking at the Empire's equipment, I'd say their main focus is on medium to long-range strikes rather than close-quarters combat. It appears they've eliminated their heavy armor and are using light equipment instead. Yes, I've looked into that. It seems the Empire's invented a new type of arm called a spell gun that allows even junior foot soldiers to easily wield magic. Furthermore, some of their troops are armed with guns, an otherworlder weapon, it seems. With that, they apparently think the era of close-quarters combat is obsolete. I can hardly blame the Empire for thinking the era of swords is over, then. Dolph nodded gravely. These so-called guns could apparently penetrate iron armor without much difficulty, and their large tank force seemed capable even against stout city walls. It all but made a mockery of the weapons and armor that were the mainstays of dwarven industry. But. We are in our world, and not another one, Garzel insisted. Tactical theories that work over there are pointless if you can't incorporate the presence of magic into them, is that what you're saying? Indeed I am. The spell guns are a threat, yes, but they did not match up well against their foes. Lord Raimuru has a large number of scale shields obtained from Charybdis. He was kind enough to give us an ample supply, but they allow us to cancel out most magic. Hmm. With magic a real presence, 
they had the ability to defend themselves against many modern weapons, even as they neutralized the enemy's magic skills. And thanks to that, yes, they had drawn an inopportune opponent, but still, today was a disaster for the Empire. They had specialized way too much in mid to long range offense, and when the enemy came too close, their abject vulnerability became all too clear. It was a major tactical blunder. But it all depends on who's controlling the reins. We have to make the most effective use we can of the intel from this war, lest we fall into the same traps. Such was Garzel's conclusion, but truth be told, he felt the real issue came well before that. All this talk of tactics and weapons was well and good, but they had bigger fish to fry. However, he hadn't quite willed himself to bring it up, his concern lay with the individual strength each of these monsters was showing. Gopta slash Ranga and Gable went without saying, but even the monsters serving under them seemed like they had grown an incredible amount. They also made extremely liberal use of recovery potion, allowing them to engage in some pretty hazardous battle tactics. Thanks to the large-scale production of the Hippocut herb, a far cry from times before, they were now cranking out huge supplies of potion. That, too, had disrupted the norms of battle on this planet. But even more than that. King Garzel, may I offer you a word of advice? said Jane. Don't say it. I know. Yes, yes, I'm sure you do. But this is something I think we must bring out in the open. Jane's words were grim. Her warning needed to be shared with everyone in the room. Taking Garzel's silence as an affirmation, she began speaking. Those demon girls, you know, there's just something off about them. The one that set the flying ships afire used nuclear flame, which is classified as a ritual magic. It'd be damned difficult for even me to pull that off alone. But the real problem is what that white-haired girl did. That was Death Streak, a forbidden spell, one deemed uncontrollable. Everyone listened to Jane's words in silence. Just in the few days they had spent together, even the casual observer would realize just how beyond the norm these demon girls were. Henrietta, the knight assassin and leader of the Dwarven Kingdom's Dark Agents, had looked into these new hires brought on by Tempest. Diablo, Raimuru's close advisor, had seemingly brought them in out of nowhere. They were demons, and rumor had it that they were old acquaintances of Diablo. Raimuru explained that they were intelligence officers tasked with observational duty over their various army divisions. Garzel assumed they were much more than that, and he seemed to be right. Aye, I thought this might be the case. So, my lord, do you have any idea who these girls might be? Hmm. Yes. But you'd be much happier not knowing, what are you talking about? After seeing such an unbelievable battle unfold, I'd be more terrified if I didn't know. Jane was right. The fighting skills of these demons was the scariest thing of all about this day, enough so that even Garzel was staring at the screen, muttering are you joking? To himself. Well, I'm ready for it. If you became that emotional after seeing that, King Garzel, I have a pretty good idea of what it is. The group nodded at Jane's grave foreboding. Garzel looked at the faces of his trusted comrades in arms, Dolph, then Vaughan, then Henrietta, and steeled his resolve. Back during that one night at the festival. The festival? When you were invited to the Monster Nation? You did attend a secret meeting alone while you were there, didn't you? We were standing by in the next room over, but what happened then? Well, I saw Raimuru's secretary, or butler, was it? You met him as well, right? Ah yes, Diablo. Quite a gentleman. Certainly one with a threatening air about him, though, what of him? Everyone who participated in the Tempest Founders Festival was acquainted with Diablo. Henrietta had been undercover guarding Garzel, so she knew the names and faces of Raimuru's top staff. Only Jane, who was holding down the fort in Dwargan back then, was wholly unaware of what was coming as Garzel dropped his bomb. According to Elmesia, Diablo is a primal. W. Wait. What? What did you just say, King Garzel? Jane's face paled at once as she spoke, hoping that she was mistaken about this all along. But reality was cruel to her. 
I said he's a primal. I can only assume he's noir, the original black. That's the only one not previously bound to a claimed territory, and there've been sightings of him all over the world from before. King Garzel laid out the facts as flatly as he could. He sounded dignified as always, but Jane wasn't fooled. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. King Garzel, wait a minute. What's wrong? What's wrong? A primal, noir, is working for the demon Lord Raimuru? That's right, that. That's a big problem, isn't it? Why were you silent about it until now? Jane was screaming at the top of her lungs. But the assault wasn't over. Then. What about Testarossa, and Ultima, too? Oh, come now, that'd really be too much. They're probably just old demons under Diablo or whatnot. Right? Dolph and Vaughan's hopeful conjecturing was shot down by Henrietta. That's not all, she said. Diablo has recruited several more people from parts unknown. Hierarchically speaking, they're meant to be his subordinates, but their diplomatic attaché Testarossa, Chief Prosecutor Ultima, and Chief Justice Carrera have known each other for a long time, and all four of them seem to treat each other as equals. Whoa, whoa, are you serious? Lord Raimuru's far too loose with his legislative appointees. Th three people on the same level as a primal? B but we just saw two of them do that. Everybody there wanted to deny it. But reflecting on what they just saw transpire, all of them had to arrive at the truth. Testarossa's and Ultima's strength was massive, not even Jane could fully estimate it. I told you, you'd be happier not knowing. That is to say, I feel bad that I kept quiet about Diablo, but what would telling you all have accomplished? If he was spreading evil, that'd be one thing, but I have a firm promise from Raimuru that he'll keep him in line, and I'd like to believe my former training partner at his word. But never in my wildest dreams did I think he'd bring on more primals. Bit late for that, everyone in the room thought. But as they all saw now, being aware of that wouldn't have changed much. Look, when I decided to trust in Raimuru, that's when I cast my lot with him. He's already got the storm dragon, it's a little late for regrets now. All of you need to settle this in your mind. It's not that simple, but Garzel had a valid point as well. Well, I'll trust in you, said Vaughan. If you believe in someone, I'm not going to complain about it. Yes. I've seen Lord Raimuru with my own eyes, and I agree with my lord. He deserves our trust, said Henrietta. I am your shadow, my lord, and I will follow you in your thoughts, added Dolph. Sigh. I trust him, too, you know. I had an audience with Lord Raimuru, even before he became a demon lord. What I'm scared of is that he'll assemble this vast concentration of forces that we can't deal with any longer. But you're right. It is a little late for that. If we can't deal with it, there's no point considering ways to. Everyone nodded deeply at Jane's words. If there was no way to come to a conclusion by thinking about it, the problem essentially didn't have an answer. They had only two choices, trust in him or not. Well, we'll put that topic on hold. With Garzel's final statement, the issue was shelved. Was this the end of the war? Not hardly. The troops who had been looming large at the Dwarven Kingdom's central entrance were now fully eradicated, but they were still locked in a standoff with the Imperial Army at their east gate. There were still hints of disquiet around Raimuru, the capital of Tempest, as well. Damn that Raimuru, though. Even after such a huge victory, he's still not satisfied? I'd hate to get on his bad side, Garzel grumbled. This may not be Lord Raimuru's will, though. There's a chance the Empire still hasn't called off the invasion because they're unaware of this defeat. Hmm. That's a strong possibility. Garzel nodded at Dolph. If the Empire was aware of it, they'd definitely abort the mission at once. And also, King Garzel, Jane cut in, I'm sure even the Empire is using magic to coordinate their forces. But well, you see how the situation has changed in an instant today. It's hard to believe even with your own eyes, but if you receive this report about how your army was defeated, and everyone was killed out of nowhere, 
you'd heavily suspect it to be some sort of enemy ruse, wouldn't you? No, I'm sure I wouldn't believe a mere report, either. The Empire's General Caligulio is hardly incompetent, but I don't think he's the kind of guy who'd opt to retreat at this point, they'd treat him like a coward if he did. Those imperial fools aren't going to shoulder their lances until they taste defeat for themselves. Jane was right, and Vaughan was talking good sense as well. Garzel was convinced he'd make the same decision if he was in the Empire's shoes. He felt pity for the poor soldiers and officers who had to come along with him. But as the invaders, that's on them. Garzel was known as a wise king, but he had no intention of taking responsibility for an empire currently engaging in hostilities with him. He wasn't obligated to anyway. All he could do was coldly speculate on what the future would bring. Out of the 940,000 imperial soldiers who invaded the forest of Jura, 240,000 are already lost forever. By this point, I don't think there's any questioning Raimaru's final victory. That's fair, yes. It'd be pretty cute of him if he got caught off guard at this point. But Lord Raimaru is hardly that kind of buffoon. Vaughan wistfully agreed with Garzel, but the question on everyone's mind, how much more of a sacrifice was the Empire willing to tolerate? We will need to keep careful records of this war, so we can use it as a lesson for the future. That, and we should remember all the more that we, as humans, must never rile at Demon Lord. Yes, my lord. The strength of these monsters, shattering conventional war strategy, even as its sheer depths remained untapped, was now clearly something that could approach a catastrophe-sized threat. Quite fortuitous, then, that the goal of Raimuru and his cohorts was to live hand in hand with humanity, not dominate the world. The Empire was simply getting what it deserved, but to keep their sacrifice from going to waste, Garzel wanted to see this battle through to the end. That, and despite it all, he still had to prepare for the worst possible outcome. If Raimaru was ever to turn against him. Well, he prayed that would never happen, but what if it did? What should they do? Garzel had boasted to his closest confidence that he trusted Raimaru, but by that, he only meant Raimuru as a person, as the leader of a nation, he also had to take the best measures possible to prevent hurting his people. Just because he didn't have a good answer yet didn't mean he was excused from pondering the question. That being said, taking on a primal is a fool's errand, and we're not much more likely to ever defeat Veldora. My hands are tied, really. Faced with a question far too difficult to ever answer, Garzel began to feel a headache coming on. Chapter 3 Battle of the Labyrinth I do remember saying something like give your all, yes. Don't worry. I'm not losing my marbles yet. It's only been around three years since I was reincarnated, even. No need to worry about that. But still. As I watched the big screen, I began to wonder if those words were really mine after all. Did I really say that? After all, the screen was showing my army pretty much kicking everyone's ass out there. Which is great. Super. No problems there. But the content was just too much to watch. It was such a lopsided thrashing that I just kept my mouth agape the whole time. Gobda was acting very cool, very non-Gobda-like, as he stormed around the battlefield and crushed tanks with his bare hands. Unified with Ranga, he both looked and raged like someone who deserved being called part of the Big Four. And Gable, to his credit, had transformed into a real strong-looking dragon-ish kind of monster, smashing up enemy ships with some kind of crazy powerful energy reaction. And not just him, everyone on Team Hiryu had undergone transformations, too. I realized at once that this was dragon body at work, but since when had they mastered it so well? Also, that dragon body skill, something I left for later and never got to, I had no idea it was so amazing. It's got a time limit, and you can only be active in it for around ten minutes, I guess. But the crazy power more than makes up for the disadvantages. It'd be suicide if you used it the wrong way, but it's a nice little card to add to your deck, I think. But even Gable and company lost the spotlight to that giant midair explosion. I don't know what the heck they did, but the enemy's flagship had a thermonuclear meltdown or something, and it took out the Empire's entire airship force with it. 
that surprised even me, but as a result, the Empire's air power was essentially destroyed, every single ship crashed to the ground. That kicked off a major offensive by the Tempest forces. With Gobda's and Gable's forces joining up, everyone could see that we had gained the upper hand in the war. Even in modern warfare, helicopters had an overwhelming advantage against tanks, and in much the same way, Team Hiryu was mostly using breath attacks from the air, inflicting heavy, one-sided damage on the Empire's ground forces. And because they were such small targets, the tank guns weren't even a threat. Really, as long as they don't hit you, it's not worth worrying about. The Empire didn't just sit there and take a beating, of course, they tried fighting back several times, but we squashed every attempt they put up. The big performers in that respect were Veyron and Zonda under Ultima's command, those two were definitely old demons, all right. They seemed to have an eye for spotting the strongest among their foes, and regardless of whether they were squad captains or regular soldiers, they only chose the most powerful, and tore them apart. Their butler and cook outfits, respectively, weren't exactly appropriate, but for the imperial troops, they became a symbol of fear. Looking at the enemy's supply units, Hakuro was slashing away at them with his sword, offering no mercy. Apparently some of them even tried to introduce themselves first, God damn you. I am ranked 97th. And so on, but Hakuro's white blade made them spew blood before they could finish. Forgive me, he said to the bleeding masses. Sir Raimuru is watching this battle. He has ordered us to go at full power, and thus I can offer you no mercy. That really wasn't how I meant it, but now I understand how much of a big deal it was to them. You know, though. I couldn't really withdraw that order now. If I butted in at this point, it'd just cause confusion on the field, so I took the long view and decided to watch how the battle unfolded. This turned out to be a pretty good decision. Frankly, the Imperial soldiers Veyron, Zonda, and Hakuro picked off were equal to or better than Paladin's inability. That, and their gear was pretty insane, even better than the spiritual armor worn by Paladin's, legend class in quality. Looking at the big picture, they were way stronger than any of those guys, a fact that shocked me when Raphael gave me the results. I wasn't sure how they got this kind of equipment, but they did, and that was that. Maybe the people granted this gear were the heavily rumored Imperial Guardians, huh? Ghidorah told me about them, this group handpicked from the best the Empire had to offer, including other worlders. There were around a hundred of them, he said, and I guess the rank stuff they mentioned was proof of their membership. If people like that were given a chance to really strut their stuff, things might have been a lot more chaotic out there. It was smart of us to take them out before they were fully ready, just like Hakuro did. Veyron and Zonda did the same, too, taking action before anyone knew what was going on. They all had a good eye for spotting the most fearsome of our foes, like they had stats floating above their heads. If all their champions had bonded together, I don't think killing them would have been so simple, but it's their fault for being careless on the field. Got a problem with that? Well, you should have gone all out from the start. That, of course, could be said for us as well. If we showed any needless mercy to the enemy, there was a good chance they'd take advantage of it. If that happened, the damage would have been unthinkable. I refused to let us do anything foolish like hurt a friend to rescue an enemy soldier. I couldn't help but want to show a little compassion sometimes, but that would be the same as letting up because I assumed victory was in the bag. We were fighting a war here, best to keep our minds hardened and let them all do their best till the end, so regarding the surrender I was expecting to receive from them. Well, while I was admiring the exploits of Hakuro and the gang, something strange was going on in the Empire's Command HQ. Report. Activation of the large-scale destructive magic death streak confirmed. The user is the subject Testarossa. Hearing Raphael's report, I hurriedly projected things on the big screen. There they were, Testarossa and Ultima, standing around with big smiles. Nobody else was alive. The nearly 1,000 tanks the Empire had left were silenced, all the infantry deployed around them fallen. It'd have to be in the tens of thousands, I estimated. Death streak, was it? That's one ridiculously dangerous spell. Understood. 
Death Streak is a type of nuclear magic, a magical death ray that kills all living creatures. As a side effect, Raphael was happy to analyze and explain the situation to me, but I really don't think I could be blamed for almost shouting don't use that kind of dangerous magic. Ultima's nuclear blast was called nuclear flame, apparently, but this move seemed several times more dangerous, not that Testarossa was stopping her, either, but. Either way, the moment that spell triggered, that pretty much decided the match. There were no surviving enemy commanders left, and it was only a matter of time before we weeded out the remaining troops. So our battle with the Empire over on the Dwarven Kingdom side ended in a fantastic victory for us. The Imperial Army, which we considered to be a decoy, was annihilated, literally wiped off the face of the earth, and not just in strategic terms, either. It was absurd. I didn't think telling them to go all out would result in something like this. Also, Benimaru was starting to act a bit scary. If this was the result, was there any damn point to my strategy in the first place? What the hell's up with our intelligence officers down there? You said they were under your control, so Raimaru, but can you explain this, please? Yes, I had been keeping a few things to myself. Benimaru didn't need to yell at me with a freaky smile like that, I mean. You know. Did we really have a strategy at all? And look, Benimaru, you're not the only one who wants an explanation. In fact, I want to get some answers on this, too. But I couldn't just shout out everything on my mind, so I glanced at Veldora for some assistance. He averted his eyes. I knew this in advance, but it was pointless to rely on Veldora for situations like this. The same went for Ramirez, she wouldn't pitch in, either. No, um, I told you, right? Those are the new guys that Diablo recruited and brought in for us. I know they're Diablo's people. No dancing around the topic, then. Ah well. So I decided to be honest and tell him everything. If it was Benimaru and Geld, I was sure that revealing that these ladies were super freaky primals would be greeted with a smile and a nod. Besides, Diablo was responsible for everything related to them, so if something came up, we could discuss it then. Armed with this theory, I prepared to tell the truth. So ah, uh, do you know what a primal is? A primal? Benimaru didn't seem to, but Shuna, currently offering us some coffee, interrupted. You're referring to the Seven Sovereigns, the source of all demons? I overheard a conversation about them the other day, so I got curious and looked it up, but I was surprised to see that Diablo is one of them. I didn't know the primals, the origins of all demons, had such a fancy moniker. And really, why was Shuna smiling so peacefully as she unveiled all this classified information? The smell of coffee drifted across the control center, easing the tension a bit. Um? Benimaru seemed confused. Oh, you didn't know, my brother? Well, it's not just Diablo. Testarossa, Carrera, and Ultima are all sovereigns of Demon Dom as well. They are? They are. Shuna's smile almost blinded me. Faced with it, Benimaru could no longer state any doubt. And seeing him fall silent like that, I thought, wow, Shuna's actually a pretty big deal, huh? I was stealing myself to tell this horrifying secret, but having it revealed so readily was sort of a disappointment. Kinda felt better this way, though, Diablo, I want you to explain it. Very well, Sir Raimaru. Benimaru, I must admit that I am as she says, a primal demon. I sipped at my coffee as I listened to Diablo's speech. Mmm. Tea is great and all, but I do like me some coffee, too. All right. I understand, Benimaru said. That certainly explains everyone's strength, then. But if that's the case, I wish you had told me about it from the beginning. Well, you know, I began, I thought people would get all scared if they knew the truth. Me and Veldora are one thing, but I didn't want you guys to have more unnecessary stuff to worry about. I was worried for my friends, so I kept quiet. I made sure to emphasize only that point. Let's not dwell on how I gave them bodies and names and stuff, if we could. Well, I wasn't afraid of them, neither. 
Even Ramirez was on my side. Hopefully everyone else wasn't too freaked out by this. I believe your concerns were unnecessary, Sir Raimaru. If you have accepted them, then we all welcome them as our friends. Yes, Benimaru is right. Nobody here would discriminate against others based on strength or appearance. Benimaru smiled as he said it, Geld preaching stone-cold fact to me. They helped me banish my worries for good. Not even Shuna had any concerns about Diablo and the rest of the demons, the fact that they were still treating each other as they always had was proof of that. Well, great, then. Now I feel bad for worrying so much. Ha ha ha. You should have more faith in us. Exactly. But I do have to thank you for worrying about us enough to assign Carrera and the rest to us. It was a little awkward, but I was glad Benimaru and Geld accepted it. But what about Gable and Gobda and the rest? They seem to be doing fine, as far as I could tell, and let's hope they continue to be. Well, we're all getting along well with Diablo. I'm sure it'll be okay. Xi'an gave him her stamp of approval, not that I was ever worried about her. What do you mean, Xi'an? I mean exactly what I said, Diablo, Xi'an, my first secretary, and Diablo, my second, glared at each other. Being called a primal sounds real pretentious, but this was how he mainly acted. Once again, I was relieved that I had worried over nothing. With that behind us, we discussed the day's events a bit longer. I assigned Testarossa and Ultima to the field army because if the enemy had a demon lord class threat on their side, I thought we'd be in trouble. Then, well, they put in a little too much of an effort. This was all thanks to that order I sent out, but I really didn't expect everyone to go this out of control. It was just so wild, so over the top, and so cool, too. They just annihilated an entire enemy army, and they didn't flinch even once. K he 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 he. Seems they got a little too excited and carried away, didn't they? I'll be sure to give them a good lesson about it later, Diablo said cheerfully. Keep it in moderation. I didn't forget to add. But ah well. Diablo could take care of himself, and I was sure he'd continue educating them, again, without overdoing it. Next up, we surveyed our damages. Just two hours after the start of battle, all the fighting was over. It looked like we had a lot of injured on our side, but as for the final damage report, all casualties have reportedly been fully healed. A cheery voice echoed across the control center. All the demons who had gone into battle had been given tempest-made high potions, ten per person. That allowed them to immediately heal most wounds. And that even applied to people I thought were dead at first, in fact, they were only playing possum, and even their severed limbs had already been fully healed with full potions. They were playing the decoy role with serious aplomb, just as Benimaru ordered them to. I told you, didn't I? I told you not to worry. You sure did. And I trusted you and everyone else, of course. Everything went according to Benimaru's plan. The one random element he didn't expect, apparently, was the demon's performance. As a result of that, Despite going through a lot of potions, we didn't suffer a single casualty, it was an utterly unbelievable way to win. That being said, we weren't totally unscathed. It seemed Gable and Team Hiryu suffered some fairly serious bodily fatigue due to the side effects of the dragon body skill. I was pretty wowed by that move, but sure enough, the ten-minute time limit wasn't the only minus. The moment battle ended, the overexertion crashed on them like a tidal wave, and they all lay prone on the ground, as if paralyzed. This wasn't an injury per se, so potions wouldn't help them. After taking in all those magicules and becoming so strong, maybe this was the body rejecting all that foreign matter out again. This fatigue penalty seemed to apply to all of Team Hiryu, not just Gable. But I was fine with that. Best to have them think you should be glad it wasn't worse and leave them be. It would later transpire that this paralyzing condition lasted for around 24 hours, so after some debate, we decided to limit dragon body activations to no more than once every other day, tops, their full strength scored them the win this time, but invoke that move at the wrong time, and it could come back to bite them. 
a real double-edged sword, you could say. So I advised Gable to be very careful with that. Next we turned our attention to the Empire side. The Magitank force led by Lieutenant General Gaster had 200,000 troops, Major General Faraga's Flying Combat Corps had 40,000. That, as confirmed by the wizard Ghidorah, was the first size of the Imperial forces. But we didn't take any POWs this time. They were all dead, around 240,000 in all. What a massacre! And look, it's not that my heart didn't ache over it. But when I became a demon lord, I did it by killing 20,000 people by my own hand. By this point, I guess I was just done making excuses. Either way, after killing all 240,000 members of this force, I guess their souls were being offered within me. A little while after battle began, I started feeling the souls accumulating at a frantic pace, this must be what collecting souls from the people working for you feels like, that classic demon lord perk. Thanks to that, I had an exact grasp of just how many enemy soldiers we beat. But, I mean, really, this many human souls? Because, like, 10,000 was enough to upgrade me from regular to true demon lord. What would 240,000 do to me? The answer, nothing. The moment I awakened to true demon lord, that must have been the end of the road. Makes sense. Otherwise, Guy Crimson would have been busy eradicating the entire human race, reaping souls all over the place. He kept the needless slaughter to a minimum because he instinctively knew there was nowhere higher to go from here. That was when I received an unexpected notice. Report. The amount of acquired souls has exceeded the set limit. It is now possible to awaken subordinates connected to you via your soul lineage. The following people are eligible. Pretty outrageous even by Raphael's standards. Apparently, if you gave a set amount of souls to a qualified receiver, you could awaken them. I assumed capturing excess souls was pointless, but even if they didn't affect your own evolution, you could still use them to evolve the people under you. As Raphael put it, Several people close to me had met the requirements for this awakening. Giving them the souls I had acquired would, it seemed, grant them the same kind of awakened strength that I enjoyed as a true demon lord. The number of souls required was 100,000. Sheesh. I didn't think ten times would be needed to awaken someone else. No wonder nobody else knew about this until now. Maybe someone like Guy did, but who could say? Even if he did, it wasn't like he could execute on it all the time. Besides, it's a lot easier to befriend a demon lord and have him boost you up than try to do it yourself. Maybe that was how the Walpurgis got its start, a gathering of the big bosses, a way for Guy to see who was really worthy of joining up. But maybe there was some other reason for it. Maybe I was giving him too much credit, and he really didn't know after all, I couldn't dismiss that notion. At the very least, a hundred thousand souls was nothing to sniff at. It was killing an entire city, basically, so you couldn't be casual with it. Anyway. As of right then, I had around 250,000 extra souls on me, which would let me awaken two people. My pool of qualified subordinates, Ranga, Benimaru, Xion, Gable, Geld, Diablo, Testarossa, Ultima, Carrera, Kumara, Zijin, and Adalman, twelve in all. Create a soul corridor to evolve a subordinate? Yes. No. Based on how Raphael put it, I guess I could awaken people even if I wasn't physically nearby. A soul corridor would allow my target and me to be unaffected by time and space, kind of like how Veldora and I used to be, it would also strengthen the bond between us, which wasn't a bad thing, either. So what now? In my case, Awakening made me incomparably stronger than before. It evolved my unique skill the Great Sage into the ultimate skill Raphael, Lord of Wisdom. If someone like Benimaru could evolve to that level, then I had no reason to hesitate. But hang on. What was the deal with that soul lineage thing? If I had to guess, it referred to the soul connection we had after I gave those people names. Naming a monster causes an evolution, and I definitely wasn't shy about doing that all the time, but I also knew it was kind of dangerous. I wasn't afraid to name with confidence because Raphael was now assessing the safety risks for me. Get it wrong, 
and I'd be stripped of all my power and maybe even die, that I'll be permanently weakened. In my case, I had Belzebuth's stomach, a tremendously useful skill, and I used it to store any excess magicules I had. If I was short, I could apparently borrow some from Valdora, too. But either way, Raphael managed all that, and I didn't need to worry about a thing. So unfair, isn't it? Normally you needed your own magicules to name something, which made it no small feat. I bet that was even true for Guy. That's why so few people were really connected to others at the soul. But as far as I was concerned, my friends were irreplaceable, I meant that, too. And I didn't mind experimenting on myself, but I wasn't gonna use my friends as guinea pigs. Raphael was recommending this option to me, so I didn't think it was dangerous, or I liked to believe that. But something told me this was playing with some serious fire. Besides, I didn't even know who I should pick, and there were a bunch of other problems, too. If magical energy was the main factor, I really thought C.I. would qualify as well, but he didn't, so it made me wonder about the conditions for staging an awakening. Everything about it was so unclear, which really gave me pause. During my harvest festival, there was a long period of dormancy before I evolved, known as my initiation. There was no guarantee that wouldn't happen again this time, so I really wanted everything worked out in advance. Most of all, however, this war wasn't over yet. The Imperial Army's main force, some 700,000 of them, was on the march toward our capital. Going on wacky adventures during such urgent times really wasn't a good idea, so the answer is no for now. Let's leave this matter until things settle down. I ordered the goblins to go on salvage duty, collecting the intact tanks and surviving airship wreckage for me. Gable and the dragon utes would be knocked out for a while longer, so I had the wyvern riders transport all the stuff they got over to the dwarven kingdom. I wanted them to have all the recovery time I could give them. Instead, I sent the blue numbers to join up with the goblins. This was on Benimaru's suggestion, he said there was no need for them to hurry back to the capital, since even if they did, they wouldn't be in time for the final battle. Garzel, to his credit, also asked if I needed any reinforcements. I told him we had no problems for now. The dwarves, too, were still in the middle of war. Hostilities at the central entrance were done, but the east exit bordering the empire was still staked out by an imperial force of some 60,000. Ghidorah identified them as Yuki's division, deployed as a diversionary tactic, but we didn't know what was to come, so I really didn't want to drop the ball with them. I was sure Garzel could take care of that, and in fact, I was sure he was fully on the case that very minute. Our mission right then was to settle the score with the Empire's main force. The opening battle was a huge victory for us, but the enemy still had a force far too enormous to downplay. In terms of numbers, we were at an overwhelming disadvantage, but my staff couldn't have been more motivated. Xion couldn't wait to get cracking, even saying stuff like I can't let those demons hog the spotlight. I have to go out there and show them what real strength means. She sounded so frustrated. I almost wanted to ask exactly who was her enemy in this war. Aren't you supposed to be my bodyguard? The moment I pointed that out, she regained her composure in a big hurry. Nothing good comes from being too eager to fight, after all. But Xion wasn't the only one raring to go among us. My lord. Ultima's been bragging shamelessly, saying our forces achieved a huge victory in the first round. Ooh, I can't wait to get my turn. Would it be all right if I went over and put in a few choice words? Carrera's cheeks were flushed as she flew into the control room. I had ordered her to stand by with the rest of the Second Army Corps, but I guess the demons were all thought communication-ing with each other. Her fellow demons boasting about all the murder they committed must have been more than she could stand, but I couldn't have her working solo right then. A few choice words? Benimaru asked. He knew Carrera was a primal, but he still dealt with her the same way. Maybe I really was worrying too much. Yes, I thought I could give them a little nuclear magic as a gift. She said that with the most endearing smile. June, the original yellow, sure lived up to her reputation. Denied. Came Benimaru's disgusted reply. Carrera, 
Please be patient until further orders, Geld added. Your actions take on meaning only when they're applied at the most critical moment. Carrera wasn't too happy about that, but she had no intention of disobeying Benimaru. She reluctantly nodded at Gel's rebuke. All right. I just wanted to show you what I could do, but maybe there's a time when that'll be more effective, huh? I'll sit tight and wait, glad she saw things our way. It looked like she respected what Geld had to say, maybe they were a better pair than I thought. Ha ha ha. Carrera, life is about more than going on the rampage, you know. It's only when we become a sword for our leader that we can truly shine. Yes, Xion, I understand you. Maybe I've been a little too hasty, huh? I'm going to go cool off a little. Are you really one to talk, Xion? I thought. It was a nice thing to say and all, but coming from her, it sounded so unconvincing. Weren't you the one who wanted to go on a big rampage just now? But let's hold back on that. It'd be a bad idea to rehash the conversation when it was over now. I gave Xion a judgmental frown as Carrera left. So morale definitely wasn't a problem. On our side, we had the forces inside the labyrinth as well as the rested Second Army Corps. Everyone from my top officials to the soldiers deep down the chain of command seemed to be in high spirits, eager to give it their all, they must have heard my orders. The Empire, meanwhile, totaled 700,000 troops. We'd never compete in numbers, but this was quality over quantity. The other side might still have had some strong characters lurking in the background, but we had one killer defense mechanism in the labyrinth. The key to victory is gonna lie in the labyrinth. Veldora. Ramirez. I'm counting on you guys. Yes, of course. Do not fear. I'll take care of everything. Right, exactly. We're all backing you up, so you just rest easy. Their eager replies soothed my heart. The important thing here was how we'd avoid casualties, and luring the enemy into the labyrinth was the best way to do that. Inside the dungeon, we could reduce the wear and tear on our army down to zero, and that wasn't all, we could also add the monsters of the labyrinth to our forces, letting us make up for any numerical disadvantages without much hassle. Count the lower level monsters, and the total number would add up to several hundred thousand. Then we'll just have to see how much the Empire believed in Yuki's cajoling, huh? I said, isn't it the other way around? You can't trust him, and that's exactly why he's led them to have their suspicions of him. Ah, that does make a lot of sense. I was sure Benimaru was right. If you looked at Yuki as an enemy, he was quite a nuisance. We might have been in a temporary partnership, but there was no way to trust him as an ally. Maybe the feeling was mutual on the Imperial side? Someone that fishy, maybe it's safer to have him infiltrate the enemy instead of fight with him as allies. That was an unusually accurate statement from Xion. At least we don't have to expend any effort worrying about whether we'll be betrayed, Benimaru added with a nod. The Imperials, on the other hand, probably don't consider Yuki to be a complete ally. They'll be wary of him, suspicious of whatever he has to say. In other words, they don't really know how the 60,000 troops by the east exit of Dorgan are going to act. The Empire might make their strike there, so we'd best tell Garzel to be on his guard, knowing King Garzel, I don't think we'll need to worry. But no, there's nothing more annoying than an untrustworthy ally. If I were you, I'd be the first to crush him. I already told King Garzel about Yuki, and like Benimaru said, I'm sure he took all necessary measures without me checking up on him. Our main concern should have been the Empire's main force. Even as we spoke, they were attacking from multiple sides, trying to surround us. The only thing left in our city was that huge gate, so there was no great need to panic, although we still couldn't help being nervous. My main concern was that they'd skip Tempest entirely and instead attack Farmanus, the new kingdom established by Yom. He had people like Rosen and Gruaseeth around to defend it, but that nation honestly didn't have the wherewithal to wage large-scale war at the moment. We were still in the middle of providing them support as they reformed their ways, so we really didn't want it to become a battlefield. It'd be up to us to provide reinforcements, of course, and that'd really complicate matters as far as I was concerned, 
so along those lines, we were glad it didn't seem to be turning out that way. Regardless, we couldn't let our guards down. If the Empire didn't trust Yuki and instead opted to was right by us and into Blumand, then we'd have Gale's force attack them from the rear. It'd be easy to send the Second Corps over with my teleport spell, but we'd still have a ground war on our hands. The Second Corps would get far less support from the Labyrinth, and I was sure it'd be a tough battle. We should have been able to recruit a good number of volunteers from the Labyrinth, but even so, we couldn't force monsters out of there if they didn't want to go, so the numbers would have to be smaller. Besides, if we fought on the ground, we couldn't leverage the Labyrinth's features at all, and thus we'd have to be prepared for serious casualties. Ideally, we really wanted the enemy to enter the Labyrinth. Bringing the battle there, in Benimaru's eyes, was both the safest route and the one most likely to succeed. If we fought on the ground, we'd lose our advantage in the labyrinth, we'd have to fight them head-on, in a level playing field. Which was how it usually was, of course, but in war, the key to victory was all in building an edge for yourself. I didn't think the labyrinth was exactly fair or whatever, but if we won, then hey, we were in the right. So while, hopefully, the labyrinth would serve as the main battlefield, our basic strategy was still the same even if we fought on the ground. Job one for us was to ferret out the strongest fighters on the opposing side, and just like how we used the goblins as bait for that before, we'd use Gel's force for that this time. That common core was in each of Benimaru's proposed strategies. Really, I guess they were doing this to protect me, their supreme general. I care deeply for all my friends here, and Benimaru and the rest put me first just as much, or even more, in fact. I didn't want them to get killed for my sake, but Benimaru's much more of a tactician than an amateur like me, he kept damage to almost nothing in the previous battle, even, so as long as I left everything to him, I could just sit back in my chair and relax. That, and I wanted to keep trying to make people feel secure in relying on me. We had set up a large gate on the ground in order to make it easier for imperial troops to come storming in, but looking back, maybe that felt a little too deliberate. I, at least, was a bit worried they might think it was a trap, but my fears were unfounded. I didn't know if someone out there was granting wishes for me today, but in the end, it turned out just as I had hoped. The enemies fanning out in front of the main gate. The operator reported. On the big screen, we could see rows of imperial soldiers lined up in an orderly fashion. If Argos was presenting this to us, it had to be true, but CI's group was monitoring them as well, so this definitely wasn't illusory magic or what not. The Empire had clearly taken the bait, and all 700,000 of them were on the scene, not bothering to stick to stealth any longer, their attempt at intimidation, maybe, not that it'd work on us. We had zero intention of surrendering by now. Maybe we'd run to fight another day, but capitulation was never gonna happen. Besides, we couldn't hope for a more ideal setup. We've won, I muttered to myself. Yes, Benimaru briskly replied, we have. Factually speaking, indeed, we were already guaranteed a tactical victory. Once we were all in the labyrinth, we'd take zero damage, as long as we took our time, we were guaranteed to win. Beyond that, as long as they didn't have some kind of unimaginable champion who could beat a demon lord, we had an insurmountable advantage. Good thing those greedy bastards let the labyrinth catch them. Very true. I thought Sir Raimuru's bait was a little too obvious, but I'm glad they took it for us. Yeah, well, looks like you did a good job on it, Ghidorah. The enemy was now revealing their full extent to us. If they had spread them out a little more around the forest, we might have been anxious about the stronger among them hiding out somewhere. Spreading your forces thin is generally a bad idea, I think, but right there, having them all together like that actually helped us a lot. I imagined they were gonna start filing into the labyrinth soon, so really, the only question was how much of the army they'd keep on the surface. Well, either way, I imagine it's not strategically sound for the Empire to skip our nation. If they decide to blockade this labyrinth gate and keep marching west, that's trouble, but... Yeah, if they left, say, a hundred thousand out of seven hundred thousand, that'd be enough to surround the gate easy. Then, 
If the remaining forces marched over to the Western nations, they'd have little to worry about behind them. If that happened, by the way, we'd still be able to transport ourselves in and out, but our destinations would be restricted to places we had spent some extent of time in before, and we couldn't access any place with space freezing barriers over it. Practically speaking, if we could undo the seal on the entrance to the dwelling of the spirits, Ramirez's old haunt, we could come and go through that, still, though, we'd essentially be trapped in the labyrinth, left helpless as we watched them overrun the western nations, and if it came to that, we'd have to find a way to force ourselves out and attack. So in the end, it might wind up turning into a ground war anyway. But we couldn't avoid that, really. So before that happened, we'd want to cut down the enemy's strength as much as we could. Are we going to send a warning to their ground forces? Yeah, maybe we can agitate them into deploying more soldiers inside. Valdora and Ramirez had some interesting opinions on this. You know, there's something to be said for that. But nah, no warning, I said. No? Why not? Valdora asked. You know about the words we put on the gate already, right, Ramirez? Oh. Right, there was that. We had actually carved a message on the massive gate. It read. Through these gates, the weak are unworthy to pass. So how were they gonna react to that? I'd love to see what they do when they read it, said Ramirez. Indeed, if it were me, I'd snap and come storming through the gate. Although, I'd nonetheless keep my troops at bay, added Benimaru. I'm sure that was exactly what Benimaru would do. Trap or not, he'd totally ram his way in. I would pay it no mind. I am all-powerful. Yeah, sure, Valdora. I didn't ask you. Me, I dunno. If Beretta insisted on going, then I guess I'd follow along, that kind of thing? Ramirez. If you'd be too scared of it, then don't press your luck, okay? And you name dropping Beretta is just making him snicker. If anyone is foolish enough to ignore that warning, they forfeit their right to Sir Raimuru's mercy. They have no right to complain about what happens. I didn't know why he was looking so gleeful about it, but yeah, Diablo was correct. This message did have the nuance of a warning, after all. Of course, if they're too much of a coward to go through the gate, they deserve to be in this battlefield in the first place. We must annihilate them all and make them understand the folly of antagonizing Sir Raimuru. Xion? If you put it that way, then we're all gonna have to fight ourselves, aren't we? Can you maybe think a little before you provide advice in the future? You're making girls crack up, really, though, the rest of my main staff were of similar minds. Super motivated, all of them, and super eager to dedicate more victories to me. Testarossa and Ultima donated a whole bunch of souls. Whether they knew that or not, everybody here seemed eager to follow in the pair's footsteps. Testarossa, or demons in general, really, apparently have a taste for the residual emotions left in each of those souls. There are assorted ways of consuming these, but Testarossa told me she loves to see faces frozen in fear the most. That smile of hers really is scary. I probably would have been petrified pre-reincarnation, but by this point, well, that's how it is. Which is fine and good for demons, but what about the other monsters? It's not like they'd know what to do with the souls they've collected. I learned about all this only a few moments ago, besides, and I'm still wondering why it's this big competition now. I'm sure it's like the spoils of war for them or something, but I really don't need those kind of spoils. 700,000, though, huh? If we really did score all those, that meant I could awaken seven more people, the fact that thoughts like this were naturally coming into my mind now was frightening, but... No, no, no. I gotta stay firm with myself. Can't have my mind turn monster on me. With that resolve in mind, I faced the big screen. They're on the move. Row upon row of imperial soldiers were now moving in formation, calmly storming the gate as if they weren't scared at all. Just as planned, I muttered. If at least half of them can go in for us, it'd make things a lot easier later. Minimaru gave this a calm smile. I have no intention of letting even a single soldier escape. I'll go in, too, 
if need be. Geld nodded. My second corps has approximately 17,000 troops. Compare us by numbers, and it looks dire, but in ability, we don't miss a beat. We can take advantage of the terrain to entrap the enemy. Great to hear. And if I burn the inner holes with my flames, anyone left standing ought to be strong enough to put up a worthy challenge. I'm sure Carrera would be glad to help with that, she's been wanting to let off some steam for a while now, so I'm sure she'll be eager to exercise her skills. No, there's no doubting the power of a primal. It's a tough act to follow. Hang on. This conversation was going a lot differently than I expected. Benimaru and Geld were going on like this was already one. Real bold of them, considering how I was still a little worried about this. Carrera had become a part of their strategy as a matter of course, too, there wasn't even a shred of hesitation about tapping a primal's power. That's not fair, Benimaru. If we're aiming to wipe out our foes, that's where I come in. Even Xi'an was stepping up. Yet again, she'd forgotten that she was supposed to be bodyguarding me. But then, there was no place safer for me than the control center. Team Reborn, the force Xi'an led, prided themselves in their relentless tenacity. It'd be a shame to leave them idle this whole time, so if this turned into a ground melee, I'd like to get them out there. So, yeah, I could see myself giving deployment orders to Xi'an if she wanted them, but... Xi'an, calm down. We need to gain an accurate gauge of what the enemy's doing first. Depending on how things go, though, I may need to tap your abilities, yeah. She'd have to be content with that for now. K he 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 he. If Sir Raimuru needs a bodyguard, I alone can more than fit the bill. Well, if Diablo's volunteering for that, then if things really get hairy, we could call Testarossa and Ultima back. They can teleport in no time flat, after all. If you say so, Sir Raimuru, then fine. In that case, you'll be up, Xion. Right. You can count on me, Benimaru. Xion beamed as she thanked him. I have trouble understanding why she loves fighting so much, but, hey, if she's happy, then great. Good. In that case, Raimuru, it is time to prepare. I'll join ya, master. Time for us to show him just how terrifying the labyrinth can be. Quite so. And with me as your final defense, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. If you'll excuse us, Sir Raimuru. Brimming with enthusiasm, Veldora and Ramirez left the control center, Beretta following behind. The room suddenly felt a lot quieter. For Veldora, this would be his first real day of work as the master of the labyrinth. I wasn't entirely sure if he'd have a role to play here, but either way, his zeal was certainly encouraging. Right. Let's see what the enemy has in store for us. I tried to sound as demon lordly as possible as I watched the rows of people marching through the gate. Everyone else nodded. And with that, our battle against the 700,000-strong main army of the Empire began. Caligulio, commander of the armored division, smiled at the sight of things going to plan. He looked over his army with supreme confidence. One after another, his rows of elites were streaming through the massive gate. It connected to the labyrinth, no doubt, and that labyrinth was bound to bring Caligulio immense wealth. By now, the monsters must have been in a panic over the unexpected six-figure strong force at their doorstep, but it was all thanks to long, careful planning, and soldiers strong enough to execute on it. Dot. Dot. After a great deal of discussion with the main brass over their route of invasion, they decided to send the Magitank division in first, standing out as much as they could. In addition to this, they also deployed a hundred airships from the Flying Combat Corps, their ace in the hole, so they could fight off the evil dragon Veldora if he happened to show up. The Flying Combat Corps was also responsible for transporting the Magical Beast division westward, with Gradim commanding them, but their journey would be chiefly over the sea, guaranteeing a safe trip. It was therefore decided that the airships wouldn't need any armaments, so Caligulio's only remaining responsibility was providing logistical support. This he planned to do by operating 300 airships at full capacity, transporting the necessary military supplies at the same time as Gradim's force. 
they had concentrated their forces in a single area mainly for the projected battle against Valdora. The other hundred airships deployed to the forest of Jura were each outfitted with a full set of the most elite magicians the empire boasted. With this final piece of the puzzle, their support system was fully complete, and Caligulio believed it all enough to let them take over the entirety of the West, and if Gradin's force attacked the capital of Inglesia, the war would be over in no time at all. It was a simultaneous dual-pronged operation, and Caligulio's armored division would play a major role. If they succeeded, they'd be putting up dazzling military results. That would grant Caligulio more power in the empire no matter what, and the thought made it impossible for him to wipe the smile from his face. The basic outline of this operation worked like this, the Magitank division would make a conspicuous entrance. The enemy would latch onto them, and once they did, Caligulio himself would lead the main force in a grand display of power, attacking the stronghold of the demon lord Raimuru. According to Intel, the demon lord could apparently transport his entire capital into the labyrinth for safekeeping. It sounded ridiculous on the face of it, but it was true. All that was left on the surface was a large gate opening up into the labyrinth. So they decided that the first thing was to surround the gate, blocking any escape routes. A handy magic canceller or two working on the surrounding space would make it impossible to magically teleport out of there it seemed possible to completely seal off the area. The problem here was the strength of the armed nation of Dwargan. One underestimated the heroic King Garzel at their own peril, and the dwarves are known for their stoutness. They remained undefeated for a millennium for good reason, and anyone who downplayed their might was bound to be burned. However, there's no way we can lose. Breaking out old-fashioned antiques against two thousand magitanks? it won't even be a fight. Dwargan's purported neutrality didn't even register in the Empire's mind, they had let the armed nation go unchallenged so far because they'd be a thorn on their side, but if they could win now, there was no need to pull back. With a combination of magic and science, they had built an all-powerful force based on a completely new system of combat. That, in a nutshell, was the armored division Caligulio led. Garzel was a champion among dwarves, Yes, but what could he do by himself? It may have been quality, not quantity, that could potentially turn the tide of battle, but knowing what he did about how destructive his tank guns were, Caligulio saw fighting with swords and magic as nothing but an anachronism. The dwarves, only capable of producing outdated, obsolete armaments, could never imagine the true value of this next-generation army. And by the time they realized it, it'd be too late. All that awaited the dwarves was a lopsided rout. These ideas were all fundamentally wrong at the core, but Caligulio had no way of knowing that at the time. He was so happy with himself, and so assured of his victory, that he never imagined for even a moment that he'd be defeated, and just moments earlier, the long-awaited report came in. An envoy from the enemy had paid a visit, but negotiations had broken down, and hostilities were already underway. Receiving this news, Caligulio and his team stuck to the plan and marched forward, and now they had captured the lands believed to comprise the demon lord Raimuru's stronghold. Dot. Dot. Caligulio, perfectly at ease, contemplated his troops. Rather a waste to give Gaster a free shot at Garzel's head, but ah well. You can't give him the stick all the time, the troops won't follow you otherwise. They need a carrot now and then. Lieutenant General Gaster and Major General Faraga were among the most capable of Caligulio's subordinates. He had no doubts that they'd failed to live up to expectations. Both Gaster and Faraga were dead at this point in time, but it'd be asking too much of Caligulio to know that. So have we heard from Gaster yet? Caligulio asked one of his men. Not yet, sir. Not since he reportedly entered battle. Ah. I think the dust will have settled by this point. Bit lazy of him to delay his report. He can't be having trouble over there. I'm afraid I have nothing else to report, sir. That's fine. So what about Faraga? Gaster's first on the field battle in ages must have been getting to his head. With total victory in sight, Caligulio reasoned, he must have been too focused on the fight at hand. But what about Faraga, then? 
he must have had a balcony view, dreamily floating up in the clouds, and he'd surely be able to give an accurate report. But the liaison officer assigned to Faraga was acting strangely, sweating profusely as he desperately tried to make contact. What is he doing? This put the brakes on Caligulio's good mood. He was irked, and that emotion no doubt came out in his tone of voice. Major General Faraga, reported the harried liaison, has reportedly encountered a monster believed to be Veldora. He said he would send a follow-up once he could confirm it. But nothing had come since then, just that first report, and then total silence. According to the communications wizard on duty, the forest of Jura was so thick with magicules that voice transmissions could easily be jammed. That made sense to Caligulio for a number of reasons. This entire forest was created by his archenemy Veldora, and it was home to a demon lord to boot. It stood to reason, in his mind. Deciding there was no use worrying about it, Caligulio shuffled the concern out of his mind. If they were engaged in combat, they wouldn't have time to send superfluous reports. And like the wizard said, there were more than enough magicules in the atmosphere to block incoming and outgoing magical calls. Plus, if Feldora himself was out on the field, no way any calls would make it out anyway. So Caligulio mentally switched gears. Humph! We'll have to wait for the good news, then. If they truly did encounter Veldora, it's perfectly natural to expect silence from Gasta and Faraga. But no point shuffling our feet over them, we've got a labyrinth to capture. Given the vast size of the force he provided Gasta, Caligulio didn't give a moment's thought to the idea that he might be defeated. In his mind, he had completely discounted the possibility long ago. In fact, this lack of contact could even be a good thing for him. If Faraga was engaged with Valdora in the skies above the forest, that meant only the demon lord was inside this labyrinth. He had heard stories about their big four and the threat they presented, but the restructured armor corps would make quick work of them. So without further hesitation, Caligulio's eyes turned toward the labyrinth. Before him lay a clearing, a vast one, big enough to house a large city. Near the middle of it loomed a huge gate serving as the labyrinth entrance. Magic-based probing revealed no traps or other threats. It was a simple gate, just waiting for Caligulio's force to challenge it. The words carved into it, through these gates, the weak are unworthy to pass, told Caligulio that his strategy was right all along, hiding everything from us because you're too afraid we'll plunder it all, eh? Pretty cheeky thing for a bunch of monsters to do. Looting in the name of supply procurement was something any nation was afraid of. Securing enough provisions to keep an army fed was always a challenge, especially to one as large as the empires. Taking the enemy's supplies was always an effective tactic, too. Well, tough luck. Caligulio laughed at the monster's shallow intelligence. His soldiers, having been enhanced via surgery powered by magic and otherworldly science, could work at full strength without food or water for a week. A single one of the nutritionally balanced energy bars they carried with them provided enough sustenance for a day's worth of activity. Twenty were included in a soldier's standard equipment, and their consumption rate was as previously calculated. Each soldier had been given a refreshed supply, and they'd have no problem keeping themselves sustained without plundering the enemy's food. These portable, lightweight energy bars made logistics infinitely easier for the empire, and potable water, the other piece of the puzzle, could be conjured up via magic. So no problems whatsoever. By their calculations, their elite soldiers could stay active within the labyrinth for up to 27 days if need be. The enemy might have pinned their hopes on their vast army running out of supplies, the biggest weakness with any force this size, but they were about to learn just how naive they were. Think you've won because you've cut off our supplies? Think again, fools. Caligulio gave the thought a mocking laugh. It caught the attention of one of his staff officers, a man of noble birth trying to latch on to Caligulio's coattails. Ha ha ha! Ah, my good Caligulio, don't be so mean to them. The demon lord Raimuru began this entire campaign by making a mistake. He misjudged our restructured armor corps so badly that he sent out his greatest asset, the evil Valdora, to meet them. And now, 
The next thing he knew, he's being surrounded by these teeming masses of champions. Well, I can't blame him for making that move, bait or not, it is quite a large force over there. Exactly. I can certainly see why he'd want to pit his maximum war power against them. Hearing the officer chatter egged Caligulio on further. Humph. Call him a demon lord, call him what you will, but I think it's clear just how out of his league he is. I'm sure he's all curled up in a corner of the labyrinth somewhere right now, shivering from head to toe. Scoffing at the demon lord's low intellect, Caligulio and his team couldn't have been more confident of their success. Ah ha 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 ha. You're absolutely right. Now all we have to do is drag this demon lord out and have Commander Caligulio chop off his head. Then he'll become a demon lord slaying hero. The noble officer never wasted a chance to flatter his superior. Caligulio didn't mind it much. The first step, as he saw it, was to seize this labyrinth and use it as a foothold. Establishing a military base here would help maintain their momentum, no doubt, as they pressed on and overran the west. If they didn't hurry, in fact, Gradim and his magical beast division would conquer and pillage the west from the north side, and he really wanted to be out of the forest of Jura before then. But no need to panic. If things turned out that way, his list of accomplishments in this campaign wouldn't be quite as long, but there was no need to quibble. Defeating Valdora the Storm Dragon was the Empire's long-held desire for ages, and if they could achieve it, any other badge of honor was insignificant by comparison. If they took the head of Raimuru on top of that, Caligulio would undoubtedly become the greatest achiever of this entire war. And the rest of his staff were just as assured of their victory as he was. This was a force of 700,000, after all. With a force that size, none of them could even think of defeat. We can make this area our camp once we build a barrier around it. Once that's done, they can start marching in. The labyrinth will never know what hit it. We're on it, sir. Fine. Proceed as planned, then. There were no objections. Things weren't urgent enough that anyone wanted to create trouble for themselves being contrarian. Gradim could have his glory over in the West if he wanted it, that's what everyone here agreed on. For now, the major prize was all the money and goods they'd be able to score in the labyrinth. Greed had won the day in their minds. It was a pretty simple plan, really, just overload the labyrinth with sheer numbers and strip the whole place bare. The fact that nobody objected to it was proof positive that greed, and the potential for instant profits, was already blinding them. Being so assured of victory, Caligulio and his team weren't bothering to hide their desires any longer. Whatever share of the labyrinth's booty they got, it was bound to make them fabulously rich. And so their conquest of the labyrinth began, and with that, the poor oblivious soldiers joyfully descended a staircase they would never climb back up again. The labyrinth never refuses anyone who comes for it, that applied even if the invading party didn't respect the rules. But the safety was already off on this loaded gun, and what awaited them beyond was the labyrinth as it truly was, a living hell beyond anything anyone had ever experienced. In one of the deepest rooms of the labyrinth, there exists a secret conference room not even Raimaru knows about. Gathered within its vast confines were the rulers of the maze, people who usually didn't come together very much. The fact that they were all here right now indicated just how vital they considered the topic of discussion. Dot. Dot. The meeting was chaired by Beretta, Ramirez's aide-slash-representative-slash-gopher and general manager of Labyrinth Affairs. Seated in the four cardinal directions were the Labyrinth's four arch-dragons, the Fire Dragon Lord, Frost Dragon Lord, Wind Dragon Lord, and Earth Dragon Lord. In the middle was a round ebony table, currently seating the following individuals. Nine Head Kumara, Guardian of Floor 90. Insect Kaiser Zijin, Guardian of Floor 80. Insect Queen Apito, Boss of Floor 79. Immortal King Edelman, Guardian of Floor 70. Death Paladin Alberto, Adalman's advance guard on Floor 70. These comprised the so-called Ten Dungeon Marvels, and they were joined by three others, Ghidorah, the Old, 
sharp-eyed wizard, was seated next to Adalman. Meanwhile, Bovix and Equix, co-guardians of floor 50, sat huddled at one lonely corner of the table, aware of just how much they stood out among all these titans, they both once thought they could beat any opponent who came their way. But now, seeing the very pinnacle of the labyrinth before them, they realized just how stark the difference was. It made them squirm uncomfortably in their seats, but that wasn't the only reason they were cowering a bit. The real reason, everyone in this chamber had a bad habit of incessantly squabbling over who was the strongest among themselves. They were clashing over the issue now, in fact, weighing down the very atmosphere as if it were warped apart by some strange force. Ghidorah, despite being the new kid on the block, was an active participant in the debate, making Bovix and Equix realize all the more exactly how they stacked up by comparison. As they saw it, some foes were just too insurmountable to ever beat. And given that these were two former rivals who fought each other for a literal century, it showed just how much of a presence Ghidorah struck around here. Beretta and the Dragon Lords didn't join in this competition, but they had no motivation to stop it. If that was what they liked doing, then fine was their attitude. And whether they intended to or not, that only spurred the debate over who was strongest among the ten marvels. Adalman's promotion in floor rank, following direct praise from Raimuru, was still fresh in everyone's minds. It instilled a new enthusiasm in everybody present, all of them believing they were the most useful among the guardians. This was especially true among the marvels tending the deeper floors, since they frankly didn't see much action during regular dungeon operations. Any chance they had to strut their stuff, they seized. Even Ghidorah, the new guy, was eager to be of service to his old friend Adelman. If he could make an impression with his performance here, he believed, it'd work wonders to ensure a position for him. Adelman, meanwhile, wanted to work even harder for his beloved Raimuru than he already had. He wanted to be awarded even higher levels, and on that score, the other guardians were nothing but obstacles, not enemies, no, but definitely in the way. Alberto followed Adalman's lead with this, but in his mind, he, too, had a desire to improve his fighting performance and make himself a household name. Despite appearances, he was surprisingly ambitious. Apito and Kumara, the two female dungeon marvels, had, to say the least, a strained relationship. Kumara, in particular, guarded floor 90 and thus almost never received a chance to perform in public. Apito got an opportunity to tangle with the paladins before, and Kumara was intensely jealous of that, leading her to treat this as much more of a battle than it really was. Apito, for that matter, was pretty competitive herself, refusing to back down a single step from her rival. This put them at odds over pretty much anything and everything. Zijin, meanwhile, acted like he was above the fray, and realistically speaking, he did stand at the pinnacle of the labyrinth, the target of everybody's envy. Whether he asked for it or not, he constantly got dragged into the debate. Thus, to sum up, things were kind of acrimonious among the most powerful denizens of the labyrinth. But did they truly hate each other, deep down? The answer was no. Their goal, in the end, was to prove they alone were the best, not to try to kick everybody else down. There was a lot of jealousy but a lot of respect, too. They might have fought a ton, but there wasn't any real hate involved. Every one of them saw each other as diligent rivals, nothing else. Dot. Dot. Despite the crowd sharing this meeting hall, it was surprisingly quiet right then. All eyes were fixed on the main seats in the table, currently unoccupied. They belonged to Veldora, king of the labyrinth, and the great Ramirez, its creator. They had been called to the meeting two hours ago, and while there was much carrying on between the marvels earlier, they all quieted down once Beretta showed up. Sir Veldora and Lady Ramirez will arrive in a few moments. Please remain quiet as we wait for them. Beretta sat down at his chair. Chairman, can I ask you a question? said Kumara, and Beretta nodded back. Why are we gathered here today? For the reason you're all imagining, I presume, we need to discuss how we will dispatch the foolish army attempting to invade the labyrinth. Everyone fell silent. They were all aware of the situation. Nobody told them exactly what this meeting was about, 
but they had accurately guessed its purpose already. Maybe they had been jockeying with each other for position before, but with the imperial army at the door to the labyrinth, hostility toward the enemy had replaced their competitive spirit. What did it mean to make an enemy out of the labyrinth? They were all of a single heart now, they needed to make their foe fully understand the answer. A heavy tension filled the hall. And then. Heya. Sorry for the wait. How nice of you all to gather here. Ramirez and Valdora appeared, upping the fervor in the hall that much more. It delighted Ramirez even further as she addressed the crowd in an unusually serious tone of voice. Today we're facing an unprecedented crisis, a kind that hasn't been seen since the labyrinth's foundation. So I wanna hear some of your thoughts, people. That was the signal for things to begin, Kumara reacted first. Hmm? Well, isn't it obvious? She could barely wait to express her thoughts, but a Peter beat her to the punch. We kill them all. The two glared at each other. So are you going to leave things for my level this time, Apito? You got to play with those paladins for so long, you have to be happy by now. What are you talking about? Lady Hinata is one thing, but the Crusaders were all so weak that I had one of the most boring times of my life. A different kind of tension ran through the hall. Valdora, oddly, stepped up to defuse it. Qua ha ha ha. Stop fighting, you two. And worry not. This time, I will give you all a chance to wage battle. From what I've heard, they think that the deepest level of the dungeon is merely floor 60. Considering we've advertised a hundred floors from the beginning, I find it simply absurd, but here we are. Can you believe that? No. Everyone thought. Valdora gave them a nod. I thought it would be fun to play along with those expectations. But really, it seems too much trouble to me. Yes. Exactly, Ramirez agreed. Like my master said, it's too much trouble to wait for them to get past floor 50, not just for us, but for our foes, too. Indeed. There are currently 700,000 soldiers jamming the area around the gate. I've been instructed by Raimuru to lure as many of them as possible into the labyrinth. But making such a huge crowd navigate that entryway is gonna take forever, won't it? Honestly, you have to wonder why they brought so many folks along. So instead of that, we decided to divide up the enemy, 1,000 soldiers per floor, and then repeat as necessary. Luckily for Ramirez, the Empire's soldiers were matching in neat, well-disciplined rows. This allowed for smooth entry into the labyrinth so far, but this was clearly going to take a lot of time. If the first few rows got in a fight, it'd interrupt the entire flow, and then there'd be no telling how long it would take to cram everybody in. How does that sound to you? And if you get a lucky draw, you might even wind up facing a real strong opponent or two. Qua ha 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 ha. Who knows, indeed? One of them might be the grave threat to Raimuru that Benimaru has been searching for. I think he's far too worried about that for his own good, but if you can find the man, that'll be a feather in your cap. Ramirez and Valdora made all eyes in the room sparkle. To the labyrinth guardians, the big four serving Raimuru were the targets of intense admiration. Benimaru, in particular, was Raimuru's closest friend and most trusted confidant, everyone wanted a chance to fight him someday. Valdora might have said no, no, I am his stoutest of allies if anyone brought up Benimaru's name, but they didn't, so things continued smoothly. So, we all have a chance, then? Well, if that's the case, I have no complaints at all. Apito and Kumara immediately seemed to patch things up with each other. They weren't alone, everyone else was driven by similar motivation and ambition. All right, intoned Adalman, does that mean we can do whatever we please with whoever enters our territory? Exactly, replied Ramirez. Now everyone was treating this more seriously. They're still filing in right now, she continued, but I'm just gonna connect them straight to floor 41 for starters. Once a thousand make it in, I'll move on to the next floor down, so be patient. Bovix and Equix, I've got another job for you too, so I'll brief you on that later. Jealous glances shot toward the pair at once, making them tremble with anxiety. 
Now they were huddled down closer than before, trying their best to get through this social awkwardness. It'd be far better, they both agreed, if they could just fight those foolish invaders instead of facing up to this. But Ramirez paid them no mind. So the idea here is to spread all these troops out and take them in at each floor. We're talking 100,000 people total from floors 41 to 50, 100,000 from floors 51 to 60, 100,000 from floors 61 to 70, 100,000 from floors 71 to 80, and 100,000 from floors 81 to 90. Then maybe, like, we can have each dragon lord tackle 10,000 at once? And if we get any more coming in after that, I can stash them in the higher floors, too. Thus the labyrinth would house a maximum target of 540,000 invaders at once. Ramirez wanted this number to be at least 350,000, if possible, last, but not least. Now, the one thing I don't want you guys to forget is that these are one-time rule changes to the labyrinth. Each dragon lord chamber has been expanded to ten times its initial size, and I've switched the floors around as well, so if they make it past floor 90, they'll be plunging right into those dragon rooms. But that's not really important. What is important is that I've changed the conditions for beating this labyrinth. Ramirez did a little dance in the air to accentuate her point. What kind of conditions were these? Well, for starters, once you went through the main gate at the surface, you couldn't go back out until you beat the labyrinth. Beating it, in this case, was defined as defeating Valdora, so the Empire would have to deploy pretty much everything they had to stand a chance. In order to gain the opportunity to face Valdora, however, a would-be invader would need to collect ten keys, passed out to each of the ten dungeon marvels. If you wound up starting on floor 80, you'd have to backtrack to earlier floors to defeat the requisite marvels. The moment they heard this, the marvels immediately perked up. Even the dragon lord situated behind the table rumbled their approval. In that case, we really do all have an equal chance. You're right. It's a race to see how many we can hunt down. Many among them were already out for blood. Hair. Hopefully I can find someone worthy enough to lift my sword up against. Don't be cocky yet, Alberto. All we must think about is laying waste to our divine enemies. Master and servant were brimming with spirit. But others among them were meditating in silence over this. In their own way, everybody in the chamber was in high spirits for the upcoming battle. Gauging them, Beretta, the overseer of the marvels, more or less, spoke up. So, Lady Ramirez, regarding the matter I asked for your assistance with. Ah, right, right. Yeah, Raimaru gave it the go-ahead, so let's see how things unfold with it, okay? Thank you very much. In that case. After that quick exchange, Beretta stood up and surveyed the ten dungeon marvels. Ladies and gentlemen, Lady Ramirez has assigned me the title of dungeon master. I would normally share this title alongside my duties as chairperson of the Ten Dungeon Marvels, but... Beretta saw that overseer job as a bunch of garbage dead-end work and little else. Ramirez thought having ten marvels sounded better than nine, so he got tossed in to fill up the ranks. The job, as one would expect from Ramirez's bird-brained ways, changed from day to day. Sometimes it was little more than being Ramirez's gopher, which, to put it bluntly, was not his cup of tea. Thraney, despite having roughly the same position, seemed far more valued by Ramirez than he ever was. A lot of that was because Thraney never lectured Ramirez about anything. And Beretta couldn't see what was fair about that, either. Besides, Thraney pretty much did whatever she pleased, too, jetting off on these mystery trips out of nowhere, although gaining Ramirez's advance permission for them. It was a real problem for Beretta, who secretly grumbled over it quite a bit. Regardless, he was still named one of the ten dungeon marvels, whether he liked it or not. He really wanted to give that position over to someone else. And now the perfect opportunity had arisen. I think I would like give my position to whoever puts in the best performance in this battle. The marvels had to resist the urge to whoop for joy. Even Bovix and Equix were filled with ambitions not quite in line with their talents, hoping against hope that they could join the Ten Marvels. Unfortunately, 
their ambitions were shattered by the next thing Beretta said. For this current battle, I will provisionally grant Sagadora my position in the Ten Dungeon Marvels. Given Adalman's attesting of his powers, as well as his own knowledge, both Lady Ramirez and I have no qualms about this appointment. Ghidorah, facing this sudden announcement, was surprised but calm. Given how long he had lived, he was used to situations like these. Yes. This is my time to shine. And if I put in an eye-catching effort, I won't be provisional for very long at all. Ghidorah had always been an aggressive man, he had to be, or else he couldn't hone the right place at the right time knack he used to navigate the world for so many years. And Ghidorah knew his place, too. His steely eyes told him just how powerful the ten marvels were. Some were lower or equal to him, while others were so far above him that even making a comparison was ridiculous. He'd never be appointed overseer of the marvels if he let those titans be, something he understood well enough, and so his goal was merely to gain membership to start. I will humbly accept your offer. You will? Thank you, Sir Ghidorah. It helps me a great deal. Ghidorah and Beretta had a real you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours moment. And while still temporary for now, that was the last change made in the lineup before the Empire War. Beretta was out of the Ten Dungeon Marvels, and Ghidorah was in. Oh, yes. I'm just as glad you're taking the offer, Ghidorah. I'll be assigning you to Floor 60, with the Demon Colossus boss, and I hope you'll make good use of that one. Everything wrapped up without a hitch, they had already discussed all this with Raimuru, and they had decided to put Ghidorah to the test on a trial basis. Ghidorah had already been helping with Ramirez's research and so forth, so he didn't need much convincing to accept the job. In fact, to him, being entrusted with the Demon Lord's Demon Colossus was a real dream. Great. In that case, shouldn't we give Ghidorah some kind of nickname, too? Ooh yeah. Any ideas, Ghidorah? Being asked this out of the blue, Ghidorah had nothing to offer. Well, let's see. Is this really important? He couldn't help but think. The Empire was already invading Labyrinth space. They really needed to take up defensive positions ASAP, something everyone must have been thinking, if not saying out loud but the big bosses didn't seem too concerned about time and were treating this like just another chat. Heavens! My hat goes off to them. Emperor Ludora is a great man, too, but I fear he's no match for this group. But given the labyrinth we're in and the storm dragon we're with, I suppose it's only to be expected. Ludora was truly impressed, he was never one for loyalty, but seeing Valdora and Ramirez, and most of all Raimaru, so adept at manipulating those two, he couldn't help but feel a sense of awe. How about the rune master, then? Ooh, how catchy, Ramirez gushed. Yes, is it not? When push comes to shove, I always have the right answer. Qua ha ha ha. There was no possible way Ghidorah could object. It seemed like everyone had their orders, but Ramirez still had one thing to announce. Oh, oh. Right. I had a real important role for Bovix and Equix. The two of them almost leapt out of their chairs, still nervous about what they'd be asked for. W.H. What role is that? What would you like us to do? Their nervous questions were greeted with a matter-of-fact reply. So I'm gonna have you two stand by on floor 30. You can use the bosses there however you like, so if you see any invaders trying to escape, wipe them out for me. All right. I set the resurrection point for your bracelets at floor 30, too, so even if you get killed somehow, no worries. Do your best up there. By the sound of things, Ramirez assumed this would be easy work for them, all they could do was nod their agreement. They were motivated, yes, but more than that, they were anxious. If they didn't deliver at a time like this, they feared being abandoned for good. If they put in a half hearted effort, they could be fired from this most prestigious of positions. They exchanged firm nods, promising they wouldn't let that happen. The boss of Floor 30 was an ogre lord, ranked to B+, along with his five minions. Following orders from the A-ranked Bovix and Equix, they were all bound to become a great team. Ghidorah, 
despite being so new, had readily accepted his appointment into the Ten Dungeon Marvels. Given they had been part of the labyrinth far longer than him, they couldn't afford to embarrass themselves here. That, and the two of them realized something else. Even if part of the Imperial force did make it past floor 30, there was still no escape for them. That held even if they climbed all the way back to floor 1. They'd just have to turn back, and along those lines, Bovix and Equix's assignment was extremely low stakes, come to think of it, and they both also realized that losing to those soldiers meant getting killed however many times it happened, an unpleasant experience. Well, let's do it. We're guardians, too. And if we can earn some recognition for our exploits, we're bound to get a promotion. Yes, you're right, my brother. No need to take turns or hold back this time. Let's crush our enemies with everything we've got. We'll crush every single fleeing Imperial soldier we find. We will. And I promise we'll live up to your expectations, Lady Ramirez. If their backs were against the wall, the only place to go was forward. Their anxieties instantly vanished, the two of them burning with enthusiasm. Now everybody had their assigned roles. Raimuru has asked us to lure as many Imperials into this labyrinth as we possibly can. And if we wanna do that, you're gonna have to show these guys a good time, to some extent. Got it? They all nodded, understanding. Everybody saw what their role was, for day one, at least, they'd keep quiet and watch how the enemy moved, then Ramirez, giving them all a satisfied look, dropped one more bomb on them. Good, good. Well, good luck, guys. And by the way, Raimoru said he'll be watching this battle. We'll be deciding who's the next overseer based on this, but it's a good chance for all of you to show off, okay? Everyone's faces turned dead serious. So Raimuru will be watching? Even Zijin, silent until now, felt the need to gravely ask the question. It really surprised Apito. The insect kaiser was a taciturn individual, rarely speaking at all. Apart from his loyalty to the demon lord Raimuru, Zijin was interested in little besides strength. Um, yes. Raimuru said he'd be observing the whole thing, okay? The unanticipated pressure made Ramirez stammer a bit. Not even she had the opportunity to see Zijin talk much. Her surprise was only natural. Zijin, there are no lies in Ramirez's words. Raimuru has a great curiosity about the strength of his labyrinthine ranks. That is why he trusted you all enough to give you such a major role in this war. Valdora, following up for the flummoxed Ramirez, saw Zijin as an excellent student, one he had been training in combat for some time. He was stronger than even Cherries, who had been with Valdora for a very long time, and if the conditions were just right, he could fight evenly, or better, with Valdora himself. He was, in essence, too strong. Nobody in the labyrinth except Valdora could handle him, and that's why he was so excited for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Ah! Sir Raimaru, watching us. This is so emotional for me. I'll be sure to show him just how much I have grown. He he he. Of course. He said he was expecting a lot out of you all, so let's give him a big surprise. Ramirez might have been giving them an innocent smile right then, but deep down, she was merciless. Being a self-styled demon lord, she wasn't afraid to abide by survival of the fittest. Everyone who enters the labyrinth, including Empire soldiers, is presented with a set of rules. After each person is confirmed to be a willing participant, they are then asked, directly to the instincts in their mind, whether they're okay with never leaving unless they beat the dungeon. Would they see it as a threat or a warning? But even if people heard that and thought oh crap, I'm in trouble, nobody seemed to be turning back. They all filed into the labyrinth like ants to sugar, dreaming of the fortune and glory inside, and at that moment, Ramirez ran out of mercy. Without reservation, she welcomed all of them as her enemy, and soon, the soldiers of the Empire would discover the true nature of this labyrinth. The fear it caused. Let us dedicate this victory to Sir Raimaru, muttered Zijin as he left his seat. With that signal, everyone was on the move. Visitors would soon start arriving at the hellscape, and they had to wait for them. 
column by orderly column, the soldiers of the imperial army were marching down into the dungeon, their movements methodical and without fancy frippery. Each had a safety belt around their waist, connected front and back so each column stayed around ten feet away from each other. In addition to these troops, there was a separate designated combat team, not connected by ropes and able to move freely around, when not engaged in a fight, they held onto the main force's lifelines, with enough sheer quantity, no labyrinth was ever going to be a problem. They had prepared everything well in advance, and this entire force wouldn't have any issues getting lost as they marched onward. Satisfied with his handiwork, Caligulio's mind turned toward all the riches he was set to gain shortly. This maze is mere child's play. The problem is all the monsters that live inside. Not their strength, per se, but the time they'd have to spend dealing with them. Their preliminary intelligence indicated the labyrinth ran a total of sixty floors, but they hadn't received confirmation on that yet. At least one rumor pegged the actual number at a hundred, but the other officers had dismissed that as unrealistic, a bluff. Still, the deeper the floor they reached, the more valuable the treasure they'd be bound to discover, and most importantly, the purer the magic crystals they were likely to find. That alone made this a very attractive offer, but the deeper you went, it seemed, the stronger the local monsters would become, that, Caligulio thought, had the potential to become a big hassle. Well, once we find out exactly what kinds of monsters we'll encounter down there, we can figure out how to subdue them the right way. That'll make for more efficient hunting, too. Stroking the beard he was unduly proud of, Caligulio had made his conclusion. Seeing the well-trained soldiers spread before him, their Grand Majesty a symbol of the Empire's authoritative power, this labyrinth hardly seemed like a threat at all. They had all undergone training to simulate the style of battle that would likely unfold down there. Practitioners of spirit magic would map out the path ahead, and then the special ops teams would disarm any traps. The combat team would then dispatch the local monsters, then the cleanup team would scavenge for salvageable materials and magic crystals. The lead member of each column was responsible for overseeing this entire process from start to finish. Once all the treasure was gathered, it would be sent rearward by the soldiers tied to each other, all the way back to the entrance gate, where the platoons standing by there would take it to the nearby command HQ. Linking soldiers together like this would allow them to quickly handle any unexpected changes in the process, if something came up, the soldiers were carefully trained to retreat at once in order to report to their superiors. Caligulio's plan worked extremely well, at first. But then something strange happened in there. After approximately one thousand soldiers went through the gate, all contact was suddenly lost. What should we do, sir? What happened to the soldiers? It was unclear, but judging by the surgically clean cut on the rope, someone must have been messing with spatial links in there. We were briefed on that, the labyrinth can change its structure at times. But they said it happened once every twenty-four hours at most. It troubled Caligulio, but he didn't let the brigade of soldiers stop. For a while longer, he allowed the storming of the labyrinth to continue. What they later found, after some more observation, was that the labyrinth changed structure with every one thousand people they put in. Wait. Not quite. I see. It looks like the enemy's welcoming us with open arms. Question mark how do you mean, sir? Simple. I'm sure it doesn't suit them much if the labyrinth's crawling with people. The stairs we see there don't lead to the second basement floor but likely to some other floor instead. Really? They can do that? Caligulio gave his surprised staff officer a well, what do you think, doofus? Look and a bit of a snorted chuckle. Well, I'm sure they can. This is a demon lord we're fighting, remember. If they can't pull that off on their home turf, they would have been destroyed ages ago. He had predicted what would occur in the labyrinth with decent accuracy so far. From the soldier chatter before they lost contact, there was no indication that anything unusual was going on. It didn't seem reasonable to think that something had just happened to them out of nowhere. Besides, we lost contact once exactly one thousand people came in. What do you make of that? Hmm. Yes, that's very insightful of you, sir. With a nod of acknowledgement, 
Caligulio considered their future plans. Even in these early stages, they had already retrieved a few bits and bobs of treasure, finely made personal accessories, for example, or weapons and armor made of magisteel. It was all top-notch stuff, and what's more, the magic crystals they harvested were similarly high in quality, producing energy with unquestionably high efficiency. If they halted the invasion now, the fates of the two thousand people in there already would be all but sealed. Best instead to stick with the original plan and keep pushing all their masses of people inside, that was Caligulio's decision. They're trying to threaten us, trying to make us give up on conquering this labyrinth so he can buy some more time. Expecting some reinforcements from Dwargan, no doubt. Hair. Laughable, isn't it? Because by now, those reinforcements must be. Exactly. Stopping now is exactly what the enemy wants us to do, make sure everyone's aware of that. Yes, sir. Continuing with our primary objective to conquer. Caligulio was satisfied with this. The enemy tried to trap him, and he was sure he saw through it. And weighing the potential profits from the treasure against the lives of his soldiers, he decided to ignore any lingering uncertainties in his mind. That moment alone decided the Imperial Army's fate. A day had passed since the invasion began. The march had continued day and night, and by now, some 350,000 soldiers were in the labyrinth. Like clockwork, they were being sent to different locations every time a thousand new soldiers came in. Apparently those soldiers taken to very certain floors were still able to bring at least a part of their bodies back outside the spatial rift, and the kinds of treasure they were still ferrying back was constantly changing. Nearly none of it was low quality, and there were even a few weapons with strange, concave holes inserted into them, some kind of new enemy weapon, perhaps. There was no better indicator of just how panicked the enemy was right now. They would doubtlessly have retrieved these weapons if they had the time to. If they didn't, it was proof that events had hurried them along involuntarily. They're all but putting out the welcome mat for us, and now that push has come to shove, they're finding themselves in trouble. So foolish. Using the labyrinth to attract people from surrounding nations, he thought, was a pretty neat idea but not being able to handle matters right at this most crucial of moments made the whole thing seem shoddy to him. So while Caligulio had at first been openly derisive of the demon lord Raimuru and his team, now that a day had passed, he decided to halt the onrush and see how things unfolded. The soldiers around HQ were thus allowed to take breaks in shifts. Really, they could have kept going, but suddenly Caligulio was feeling uneasy. It's 350,000 troops in there so far, right? Yes, sir. Half our army has invaded the labyrinth, he might have been losing contact with them every thousand troops, but so far Caligulio's predictions were correct, not much later, he got a report that soldiers inside the labyrinth had made contact with the ones who went in first. Now the empire was gaining momentum. Everyone was on edge about the missing troops, so knowing that their comrades were safe in there came as a relief to everybody on sight. They had been hiding their anxiety before now, getting worked up about every little hitch would make you an embarrassment to the empire, and the good news energized everyone all the more. They had nothing to fear now, and the speed of the labyrinth incursion was accelerating. Thanks to all that, now a good half of their entire army was sucked into the dungeon. But. We've put hundreds of thousands in there, but they still haven't fully plumbed the labyrinth? Not even I thought it was this vast, no. Sixty floors. I thought each floor shrank the farther down you went. That's what we heard, sir, I think they'll reach the lowest depths before too long, but. The plan called for the Imperial Army to conquer the labyrinth long ago, but things hadn't turned out that way, and the problem was, once they stopped throwing new soldiers inside, that de facto meant they lost contact with everybody already in the labyrinth. Reconnecting with the advance forces in there meant a pretty vast quantity of treasure was coming their way, but that caravan had been halted as well now that the invasion was on hold. And not one person who went inside has come out yet? No, sir. Apparently the labyrinth must be fully beaten before anyone can get out. Yes, I heard about that. 
Everyone who went in had a question run through their heads, didn't they? Correct, sir. But while the conditions are clear enough, it seems that before they can slay the king of the labyrinth, they have to defeat the guardians who are defending ten keys. Ah. And we haven't beaten those yet? They had an answer. But it wasn't the one Caligulio was looking for, the king of the labyrinth was likely to be Raimuru, and if killing him beat the labyrinth, that was exactly what the empire wanted, or should have wanted anyway. Instead, all they had done was stop sending in follow-up troops, thus cutting off contact with everybody inside. Do you think a force of 350,000 can beat the demon lord? The staff officers were at a loss to answer. But it didn't take them long to drum up their previous vigor. The blunder the kingdom of Pharmus made, I believe, is that it ran into Veldora. If it's just the demon lord Raimuru alone, we should have enough resources to beat him. I agree with him, sir. We have a great number of over A troops in this initiative. Good news should be coming our way, in time. His staff, seemingly relieved that they were apparently on the same page as each other, rejoiced loudly over their assured victory. But Caligulio just couldn't shake off his unease. All right. First, I want contact made inside the labyrinth, send in a liaison team and have them try out all our comm methods. Accepting the order, they went through the checklist of imperial communication protocols they had handy. None of them worked. Magical calls, telepathy, nothing elicited a response. By this point, the staff officers were having trouble kidding themselves any longer. Their hearts, bursting with visions of all the booty the labyrinth was about to give up, were now down in the doldrums, faced with a suddenly unforeseeable future. Having no contact with the inside was starting to seriously affect their mood, without any idea of the battle situation, they couldn't even adequately perform their jobs. In that case, sir, we'll resume the invasion once we reorganize our ground troops. Right. Caligulio nodded. No matter how this turned out, they needed to send someone to check on the situation. If they kept them on ground level, there was no way to check on what was happening down below. The large gate remained wide open, showing no signs of closing up, nothing had changed with it since first discovery, and yet the moment people stopped filing through it, nothing at all could be sensed from beyond the entrance archway. Even the steady flow of goods from the inside had cut off, and partly thanks to that, the command HQ was starting to become an uncomfortable place. Two more days passed. Why aren't we receiving any further reports? With every thousand people being taken to a different place, sir, it might be hard for them to find troops who found themselves deep in the labyrinth. Are you telling me the labyrinth's that vast? You don't think? What? You don't think they've all been defeat? Shut up! Fool. Lost your nerve, haven't you, huh? Calm down. I think this was the demon Lord Raimuru's plan all along. He wanted to make us suspicious, paranoid, and force us give up on his labyrinth. Now, unlike in the early stages, only a thousand troops were allowed to enter each hour, out of an abundance of caution. At that rate, however, it was hard to retrieve any new information at all, to say nothing of treasure. Thus, the first day saw 350,000 soldiers march in, the second day saw 150,000 more, but on the third day, only 30,000 were allowed passage, this left the number of imperial forces on the ground at 170,000 total. Would it be wiser to conserve our numbers at this point? Hmm. I'd hate to play into the enemy's strategy, but it may be unwise to cut our forces any further, yes. We did send supply teams into the labyrinth, that'll extend the operational time frame of our troops. Perhaps we could tow the line and see how things unfold for the next, say, twenty days. Rather a passive approach, don't you think? Perhaps, but we still haven't made contact with Lieutenant General Gaster or Major General Faraga, either. They might be in the middle of intense combat, or maybe. Several intelligence units had gone down as well none had returned. Trusted friends and dedicated imperials were now completely out of touch. It's because the magicule counts too high in here. What other reason would there be? Caligulio was assertive about that, 
At least. He didn't want to see morale go down any more than it had, but the atmosphere around the place was already very unsettled, there was an indescribably eerie silence throughout, and every person on the scene had long since begun to foster ominous premonitions. Even their commander, assertive as he was, felt the same way. He still had 170,000 soldiers here, but turned that around, and you could say there were only 170,000 left. Perhaps I'm making a terrible mistake. Now the doubts were coming clear as day into his mind. The towering gate before them seemed incredibly creepy to him now, contributing to his anxieties. And the fates of all those who cared to cross it into the labyrinth? Caligulio would learn about them all very soon. Labyrinth Floors 41-48 The exact fate of the imperial soldiers who entered the labyrinth varied widely depending on the floor they were dumped into. Those put between floors 41 and 48 were, by and large, the lucky ones. It housed some pretty tough monsters, but we were still talking in the B-ranked range, nothing for these surgically enhanced soldiers to sweat about. Things proceeded very quickly with their advance. These were all extremely capable soldiers, ranking at least a C-plus by adventurous standards, and their skills were first-class. A group like that would never panic when faced with monsters. So the troops kept marching in an orderly line, their affiliated combat team taking protective action a little behind them. Setting up base points at each corner, they made sure every passage was clear before proceeding, following training as their numbers filled up the floor. In less than a day, they had discovered both the ascending and descending stairways. In this mission, the top priority was to kill the demon lord with the full brunt of their strength. Plundering the treasure on the earlier floors would be left to other troops or saved until everything else was over. Once the stairs were fully occupied by the combat teams, the invasion continued. Near the stairs was a room whose door had been sealed shut. A sign reading Rest Stop was nailed to it. It was exactly how their intelligence described it, with the exception that the door refused to budge. It's not opening, sir. It's likely been disabled. Hmm. I'm sure. Can we break it down? Guns and magic did nothing to it, sir. I think it's safe to assume it's as indestructible as the labyrinth corridors themselves. The captain nodded at his reporting soldier. This was natural, nothing worth being surprised about. Maybe they could try a magitank gun on it or some kind of large-scale magic, but that could compromise the safety of everybody else in here. A nuclear magic spell would lead to untold casualties. So as originally planned, the captain decided to keep making their way straight down the labyrinth. A human wave strategy, basically. Not being able to use the rest stop irked him to high heaven, but he accepted it. Report up top for me about this and tell them the invasion's going smoothly. Yes, sir. Being isolated down there, kept to a force of one thousand, unnerved him at first, but getting downtrodden by this would make him unworthy of being an imperial officer. So the captain decided to continue the attack, and this turned out to be the right answer, for after a while longer, they managed to rendezvous with another team. This floor was much larger than expected, but thanks to help from an elementalist and a surveyor, they were proceeding at a rapid pace. The magic crystals dropped by the monsters they slew were high quality, and they were finding excellent treasure from the chests they discovered. The people who took the stairs down reported back to say that they were close to completely conquering floor 42. Cheering could be heard across the halls, the empire would never be defeated. On the second day, they completed their search of every chamber on floor 41 and journeyed onward to floor 42, joining up with the team they previously made contact with. There, at breakneck speed, they headed for floor 43, and before day 3 even began, they were just a few steps away from reaching floor 48. It was beyond all expectation, but floor 49 would be a much different story. Labyrinth floors 49 to 50. Ah, ah, there's something on my neck. I'm sinking. I, my legs are melting. H help. Help me. I can't get my hand out. It was pandemonium. A moment's inattention, and the slimes came. Everywhere, from here to the other side of the floor, tons and tons of slimes. 
Slimes, 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 slimes. Take a break for a moment, and slimes fell on you from the ceiling. Turn a corner, and slimes would scatter and destroy entire platoons. Slimes on the wall, slimes on the floor. Weapons and armor were laid waste to, soldiers rapidly losing their stamina. Damn it! Haven't they made it through yet? Sir, there's a monster presence across the entire floor, so our magical detection isn't working very well. In addition, it seems to be highly resistant to physical attack, so basic strikes aren't working on them. Yes, and they proliferate at an unbelievable rate. Pain doesn't seem to register with them, so they don't even flinch at our attack. A single slime was hardly any concern, but when they were this gigantic, burning one to death suddenly became a massive effort, they were proving much more troublesome than expected. And while they didn't have to retreat yet, thanks to the reinforcements who arrived every few hours, they were losing time fast and failing to post up the results they wanted. In the end, they didn't have the floor entirely explored until the end of day three. Only when more soldiers from higher floors came down were they able to human wave their way over the crest. Then, on floor fifty, they encountered a literal pile of the wounded. The passage resembled a dark, dank, gloomy cave, the sounds of battle ringing in their ears. Damn it! came an enraged shout from beyond. Those monsters revived again. Ahead of the group, a gigantic snake, like a living embodiment of darkness, had wriggled its way into the passage, growling as it blocked any forward progress. It was a tempest serpent, and the Empire's regular grade magic and gunfire couldn't even put a dent in its armor-like scales. Even if you wanted to take a sword to the serpent, its poison breath had a reach of well over twenty feet, bathing the target in a deadly mist before they'd ever come close enough. Bastard! These narrow passages were practically made for these creatures. We could go around it if we had enough space, but there's no way to do that here. Can we get a Meiji Zuka ready? Negative. We just fired it. It's got two hours left to recharge. A Meiji Zuka was a new type of magical weapon, one of the most powerful types of portable offense the world had seen yet. Unlike spell guns that ran on magic stones, these ran on charged magic using magicules taken from the atmosphere. The spell tucked inside them was the elemental magic air buster, which compressed atmospheric air before firing out in a series of concussive blasts. Easily aimed and not reliant on combustion for its force, it was an ideal piece of magic for inside buildings and other closed spaces, and it packed enough of a punch that just carrying one could earn you an A rank. The problem with a Meiji Zuka, though, was the intense amount of energy it consumed. That's why it was designed to be rechargeable, but even in the magicule-laden atmosphere of the labyrinth, a full recharge took three hours, usually, that'd be fast enough for most purposes, but here, that still wasn't enough. Whoa, are you kidding me? So these monsters are regenerating faster than we can kill them? The Tempest Serpent was clearly unique. There was a ring placed around its neck, giving it a presence that set it apart from other monsters. Most important of all, though, no matter how many times you beat it, it had come back within three hours. In other words, no matter how many times they captured this floor, the battle would start all over again once enough time passed. And worst of all, no part of this floor was safe from the creature. But that still wasn't all. Ah, ah, there's one over here, too. The sound of warfare began echoing from another passage. No, that was not the only Tempest Serpent, in fact, they had confirmed the presence of at least ten. A tangled web of serpents, each ranking an A- in terms of danger, was dominating an area uniquely built to take full advantage of their characteristics. It was, simply put, a den of black snakes. Typically, the Tempest Serpent and its reserves would serve as the boss monster of Floor 40. For this emergency, though, they had all been deployed at the same time on this floor. In the end, reinforcements from the upper floors came in to give them some better arms to work with. Only then did they have enough Meiji Zukas to take on all the Tempest Serpents at once, and only late into the night of day three did they finally subdue them all. Right. We need to stay on this floor and watch for any more potential regenerations. 
evacuate the sick and injured to the upper floors. Yes, sir. So the Imperial Army took this opportunity to reorganize their forces inside the labyrinth, and with that, they stepped forward into an even greater hell. Labyrinth Floors 51-60 Floor 51 featured a modern-looking passageway. The Empire had already gained control of this floor by the looks of things, and they could see soldiers at every corner. All the signs of fierce combat strewn about suggested that this was another hairy floor to tackle. One of the unit captains tried to make contact with the people on the field. What's the situation? He asked the guard sentry, trying to keep quiet enough not to wake the resting soldiers. It's a mess. We've really underestimated this demon lord. What do you mean? The traps on this floor are awful. The path you see us guarding every corner of is the correct way, don't even try to venture outside of it. I think we've destroyed most of the traps, but there might still be some activated ones out there. All right. By the way. The captain asked for details he could report to his superior officers. The story he was told involved a large number of chemical weapons, the likes of which not even the Empire made use of. There was a tasteless, odorless gas that damaged the eyes and throat, showers of neurotoxins and corrosive liquids, large, vicious traps that ensnared lots of people at once. The soldiers all thought this sort of thing was the exclusive domain of empire, and that made it seem all the more threatening, from this floor on, you won't find any monsters. Instead, there are these damned magicule-powered golems roaming around. It looks like they're self-repairing, too. It took forever to fully dismantle them. That sounds real tough. The captain wanted to talk about how tough he had it, too, but kept silent, urging the sentry to go on. Yeah. The injured and exhausted are resting down on floor 55. Make it there, and you'll be able to eat in safety, at least. Thanks. So where's the front line at the moment? The front line? According to a story I just heard, it's on floor 60. It sounded like a joke to me, though. If we reported it up top, they're gonna think we lost our minds down here. It's crazy, but do you still wanna hear it? The captain had to nod at the sighing soldier. Yes, please. You're sure? Well, okay, then. Supposedly, on floor 60, there's this giant humanoid weapon ruling over the place. And as for its strength. The more he heard, the sillier it sounded. That was how sublimely grand it was, even an entire army of A-ranked warriors, apparently, couldn't find a glimmer of hope against the guy. Its entire body was made of magisteel, making it impervious to swords and guns, and it had a permanent barrier as well, so not even Meiji Zukas worked on it. They had exhausted all options, and that was the latest the guard knew of. Also, apparently this giant golem talks, and get this, it sounds exactly like old Lord Ghidorah. It's totally unbelievable, and I'm supposed to report this? This is way above my pay grade. Despite the guard's valid complaints, the captain still felt obliged to report to his commanding officers and ask for their judgment. We'll have to go in. I'll have us aim for floor 55 first. We'll discuss our future plans there. Yes, sir. In a situation like this, the captain knew that his boss's reply was going to be yes and nothing else. He had no alternative ideas, nor any other concerns with the plan but this was kicking the can down the alleyway. They'd need a solid answer before long, but the word retreat simply didn't exist in the Imperial Dictionary. You're going? Yeah, I'm sure you are. Well, good luck, but before you go, I forgot about one other warning. We've confirmed the presence of five special monsters in the area. Keep an eye out for them. Special monsters? Yeah. Nobody's successfully beaten them yet as far as I know. They've got to be uniques, I'm sure of that, and they're nasty. They've killed several of my comrades already. They were a red slime, a golden skeleton, a deathly ghost, a heavy suit of living armor, and a small but powerful dragon. This vicious band was apparently patrolling the halls around this set of floors, a highly unusual presence among the herd of golems. Encounter them, the guard warned, and you were as good as dead. 
The survivors from the upper floors took that advice to heart as they moved on. It would be just a bit longer before they knew what was waiting for them. Deeper and deeper they went, incessantly and in strict formation, not knowing of the killing fields awaiting them. Labyrinth Floors 61-70 What? You still haven't won yet? I'm sorry, sir. Looks like we failed to achieve a breakthrough again. Hearing that report threw all the soldiers into despair, Floor 70 was home to a massive gate, a sort of boundary between this one and the great citadel of death. Dot. Dot. Pushing their way through the swarms of undead monsters, the imperial soldiers swaggered across the labyrinth. It was going well at first, at first anyway. All the monsters that appeared were of the undead variety. Get used to the stench of rotting meat, and it wasn't anything an imperial soldier would have much trouble fending off. The first thousand troops sent here managed to establish a base of operations, and after meeting with others, they decided to continue the invasion downward. Losing contact with the surface was a painful blow, but they weren't completely isolated. More would arrive when the time came, they decided, and so it was not a major problem. So like a raging torrent, the troops stormed down the floors. On day one alone, they had explored and mapped out most of the terrain between floors 61 and 69. Floor 70 was the problem. For some reason, this floor was a large, hilly area, one where all the vegetation had withered away, it was the eerie remains of a battlefield, with a hint of death in the air, and at the far end of it loomed a massive gate, similar in size to the one up on the surface. Made of bones, it was located in the middle of a wall that surrounded a fortified city. Why was this in a labyrinth? That was the question on everyone's mind. Apart from this gate, there was no other entrance into the city. There were no drainage pipes, no service gates, none of the other facilities you'd expect to be required for regular life. It made sense. This city was occupied by the lifeless, the immortal undead, and on day one, its gates remained firmly shut. They tried to destroy the walls, but they proved tenaciously thick. Any section they destroyed, the undead would come swooping out to repair it, so the demolition work proceeded slowly, if at all. Even coming close to the wall exposed them to the armed skeleton archers up top. It was too much trouble to attack in small numbers, so the Empire forces decided to wait for reinforcements. On the morning of day two, the Imperials now had over 10,000 troops on hand, and just as they were about to begin their attack, the large gates opened soundlessly out of nowhere. Behind it awaited a hideous-looking white king. It was a skeleton, but was that the right word? Its pure white bones, polished to perfection, shone in the light as it spoke fluently to the soldiers. Welcome to my kingdom Deathtopia. I am Adalman, the immortal king. Our preparations for the feast are complete. Now, it is time to enjoy ourselves. Let us begin. Immediately after Adalman introduced himself, an oppressive wave rushed over the army. This king was served by a band of unholy death knights, along with a death dragon that still loomed in all its majesty, long after life had escaped its clutches. Its evil roar was unleashed with enough sheer force to flatten the entire space, and then, from the sky, the death dragon landed just past the gate. The deadliest of dragons, the king of the mountain when it came to undead, had now bared its fangs at the imperial army, and that wasn't all. Once the large gates fully opened, the legions of undead swarmed out from inside. Massive armies of death knights, themselves led by a set of death lords, came crawling out one after another. The soldiers lined up in front of the gate were immediately thrown into confusion as the battle suddenly began. This death dragon was an A-ranked monster, a fearsome adversary that required careful advance preparation to take a whack at. Its attribute was undead, meaning that it could not be defeated unless its soul was directly attacked, and as proud as the empire was of its great war power, if their foe was impervious to their attacks, they were helpless. G. Get back. We can't just go slashing at random, H.R.R.K.K. Damn it. We have to fight fire with fire here. No. He regenerates faster than he burns. You have to get out of here. If you don't, its miasma will hit you and rip your spirit apart. The army was in chaos, 
and as if to laugh at them, the dragon's jaw opened wide, look out. That's, ugh. Bert. It's, my body. It's rotting. The death dragon's zombie breath rained down from high above, bathing all its earthbound targets. The majority of them failed the resistance check and promptly stopped living. And that wasn't all, for those contaminated by the dragon's miasma became zombies themselves, readily obeying the orders of their superior beings. In this case, the superior being would be the white king in the area, in other words, a Dalman. All the casualties the empire took from the miasma were inversely proportional to the rise in a Dalman's strength. And that wasn't the only tragedy for the imperial force. Even those who managed to escape the death dragon's rampage weren't safe, for now the death knights spurred on their death horses as they chased down the would-be escapees. In the blink of an eye, the empire's numbers were decimated, and in less than an hour, the force of ten thousand was wiped out. The devastation would be passed on to the rest of the army by the few people who survived, and now the battle for floor seventy was in full swing. Dot. Dot. From day two onward, the imperial army made many attempts to break into floor seventy. The first one ended in painful defeat, the second and third saw similar results. Nothing was going their way, and the overwhelming threat of the death dragon was just the start of it. Although their numbers were only in the low thousands, the death knights experienced no death, no fatigue, no exhaustion. They earned an A- rank as a threat, and their regenerative skills kept them going no matter how many times they were beaten down. The death lords commanding them must have been on par with the best warriors the empire could offer. They surpassed them in quality, even, and their army's ability to carry on fighting through untold damage far overcame their numerical disadvantage. On top of that, Adelman had the death paladin Alberto working under him as part of the ten dungeon marvels. Even the imperial elites on the ground here couldn't find a way to fight against this army of immortals, but that will end with this offensive. I expect great things from you all. A colonel with the imperial army had just wrapped up his speech to his soldiers. He was part of a group from the upper floors who arrived here on day four, they, along with the combined existing forces, were about to wage total war. The empire wasn't incompetent, of course. There were all kinds of ways to deal with an undead enemy. If you had a marauding army of zombies out to kill humankind, holy magic was an all-purpose go-to. Humankind had committed sizable resources to researching and demystifying the principles of this holy magic, and the empire had succeeded in developing techniques that had a similar effect as offering prayers to a higher being. People well versed in these techniques had been gathered from across the labyrinth and assigned to the units here on floor 70. They'd provide resistance to the dragon's evil miasma and penetrative power against the undead attribute. That was the crux of this operation. The Imperial Army was now in formation atop the hilly terrain, numbering 70,000 in all. Adelman's forces, meanwhile, numbered less than 40,000 and even that was accounting for all the zombie reinforcements he'd won for himself over the past few days. The Empire had a clear numerical advantage, and now every member of their force believed that victory would be theirs at long last. Then the decisive battle began, and the king made his move. Think you've outsmarted me. Think again. Extra skill, holy evil inversion. The immortal king had perfect control over all his forces, down to the end of the line. Once his power reached across his entire network, their weakness to the holy attribute was no longer an issue. The empire, wholeheartedly relying on that weakness, would soon realize just how off-target their scheme was, and how massive their ensuing defeat would be. With that defeat, the imperial soldiers' wills were broken. The survivors were driven to despair, frantically fleeing toward the upper floors. They completely forgot about the conditions for beating the dungeon, the only thing left in their minds was the thirst for life, the urge to survive. Labyrinth Floors 71-79 The soldiers dropped off at these floors were instantly forced into a never-ending battle against swarms of insects. The onslaught was incessant, unafraid of death, they continually attacked, not letting up for a moment. For the troops sent here on day one of the labyrinth invasion, 
The first 24 hours against these swarms were a sobering experience but not a truly fearsome one. Building their base in a passageway they gained control of, they immediately stepped up to take countermeasures. These insects, dozens of times larger than regular ones, were not only terrifying sights, they packed a punch, too. Let your guard down, and you'd be eaten alive in a matter of seconds, keep your cool, though, and you'd realize that each individual one wasn't that strong. Plus, if these swarms never stopped attacking, that meant the potential for magic crystal harvesting was enormous. It was all prime quality, too, lighting up the faces of every soldier. This is no big deal, they thought. A regular adventuring party would have no way to take a break down here, their fatigue would build up, and sooner or later they'd stop giving 100%. But these soldiers didn't have to worry about that. If a skilled army wanted to conquer these floors, a bunch of bugs wasn't going to stop it, even if you counted each individual insect, the empire still outnumbered them. They could also work in shifts during battle, always keeping themselves in perfect battle shape. So the force gradually expanded its network of bases, smoothly proceeding along. They were given no time to relax, but in a way, that was the only real issue. The rewards they reaped, on the other hand, were massive. This insect paradise was lined with all kinds of hidden rooms, caves hidden in trees, dark caverns, and so on. They often housed powerful monsters, but they also had treasure chests, and their contents kept the soldiers constantly smiling with glee. One of them had just found a dagger inside the last room's chests, a pricey-looking number done up with gold and silver. It was a capable blade, too, its sheen belying its magisteel make. Weapons with magisteel cores were expensive enough, but the blade's pure magisteel, well, that'd make any rank-and-file soldier beam. During the briefings, these soldiers were told that any magic crystals and other items recovered were the property of the military. However, smaller items like this dagger would very likely be overlooked, all their gear would be inspected later, but considering the soldier carrying this blade had to defeat the boss guarding it, it was very likely he'd get to keep it. His comrades eyed him enviously, but at the same time, they were all expecting it to be their turn next. If it wasn't for the chance at little side benefits like this, none of them would keep standing here, swatting giant flies the whole day. By this time, they were also collecting quite a lot of magic crystals. Crystals of this purity were usually scarce finds, but the monsters here dropped them like they were going out of style. The soldiers were laughing all the way to the bank, as it were, and at this rate, they were likely to rake in the bonuses. From what they heard over the grapevine, it was pretty much the same deal up and down the floors. The section crawling with undead was a real disaster, though, you couldn't plunder anything from those guys, but they were a notch harder to kill. Meanwhile, the return on investment these bugs offered was second to none. The treasure they uncovered was more than satisfactory, at least, and everyone there was under the happy delusion that they'd be rolling in dough once they were back. Things started going awry on day two. One soldier realized that when, before his wide-open eyes, the head of his buddy walking next to them was suddenly rolling by itself along the ground. Yeah, so when we get back, we're gonna have a wild night at, huh? His buddy's head had what could only be described as a puzzled expression as his glassy eyes looked up at the headless corpse still standing above. His soundless voice stopped midway, his mouth still open as blood spurted out like a fountain, raining all over his comrades. W.H. Woe. The soldier screamed. The sudden catastrophe that befell the person he had just been talking to was too much to comprehend at first. But even that soldier was lucky, because he was chosen as the next victim before his brain could comprehend anything else. His head fell with a thud, and like the mute corpse he was next to, the man quickly expired. They died on floor 79, a place full of flowers in dazzling bloom, one had thought of it as a safe zone until now. He 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 he. It was worth waiting a day for this. All this praise come right to my doorstep. Thank you so much for coming. Now it's time to let us kill and feed off you. The voice was clear as day, an attractive one, booming across the entire floor. It spoke the words of a queen, for it belonged to Apito, the insect queen and boss of this floor. 
Her beautiful voice was converted into thought waves that reached every corner of the area, and to her faithful servants, they had the timbre of an order. Dot. Dot. Apito led a swarm of army wasps, a group of murderous insects nearly a foot long whose super senses could catch their human prey no matter how well they hid. Their small, transparent wings functioned as fearsome, high-frequency rotor blades, letting them easily perform irregular high-speed maneuvers. They were the silent killers of the insect world, sneaking up on you at the speed of sound. Excellent dynamic vision wouldn't mean anything against army wasps. Without exceeding the intrinsic limits of the human body, it'd be impossible to so much as detect them. The extra skill combination of hasten thought and ultra speed reaction were the bare minimum requirements to keep track of their movements. Just one wasp was classified as an over A disaster. Incidentally, in the Western nations, the sighting of even one army wasp caused the authorities to issue a state of emergency. It'd be immediately reported to the top echelons of each nation's military, who would then form a posse of senior level knights, including the Crusaders, if possible, it would become a large scale cleanup operation, featuring knights cornering wasps with holy barriers and weighing them down with weakening and slowing magic spells before doing them in. Even with that strategy, at least some casualties were always a given, that's how fearsome a monster they were. If more than one was uncovered, meanwhile, that dramatically increased the danger even more. So how many were under the insect queen's control? Dot. Dot. The number of army wasps carrying out Apito's orders easily exceeded one thousand. And so before long, the wholesale slaughter began. Anyone who might have thought yeah, I can take them was doomed. Even if they were A-ranked powerhouses, unless they had achieved a certain level in their fighting skill, they were little removed from a rank amateur. If you couldn't react to an army wasp's speed, all that awaited was certain death. And so it took less than ten minutes before all the imperial soldiers gathered on this floor were killed. Labyrinth Floors 81-90 Let's be frank about it, day one was just a little warm-up, all the surviving soldiers thought so. Their comrades were gone, all killed by monsters that had the strength of demons or ancient gods. But they weren't the only ones ruining their fates. The same tragedy was playing out on other floors. Everyone was now locked in a desperate battle, forced to fight powerful enemies at every single floor, with no chance of victory. Floor 81 was a paradise for magical beasts, strutting around with their powerful bodies and forming great herds. But these were still dumb brutes, and an imperial soldier could defeat one of them with ease. On average, the strength of each individual ranked a B or higher probably, and they usually appeared in groups of three to five. That had the potential to surprise an unprepared soldier, but not enough to get anyone killed. So they found the stairs before long, quickly meeting up with the thousand-strong force thrown into floor 82. Not a bad day's work overall, they felt. It might take some time, but with a few days to work with, they ought to have this whole thing conquered before long. Then day two came, and the arrival of a certain new adversary changed everything. On floor 82, a dense jungle from end to end, was a sentient ape who spoke the human's language. It was called simply the White Monkey, and it controlled both the wind and the sound, calling forth mighty storms as it flew across the sky. Its beautiful white pelt shone attractively across its supple physique, and the way it ran unfettered across every inch of the battlefield was so fetching that it almost created the illusion of watching a rehearsed performance. Its unique form of combat, using a mix of martial arts and a club in its hand, was paired with a seemingly never-ending array of aerial killing techniques. Add to that the vorpal blades it shot in all directions, and the white monkey was one of the most dangerous magical beasts in existence. In very little time, the white monkey had used its sorcery to bring the imperial army to the brink of destruction. Then, after an hour of this rampage, it left like the wind, shouting I'll be back. As it did, the regular raids from this simian menace would begin two days later. One after another, soldiers and their comrades fell. They had fought with every bit of the pride they held as imperial subjects, but they had all been defeated. The sniper team's shots were blocked by the monkey's storms, 
spells that affected its strength or status were blocked by its sorcery. Spellgun-driven magic wasn't strong enough to overcome its wind barrier. That only left close-quarters combat, and even the best the restructured armor core had to offer were just being led around by the nose. They were being tossed about by the white monkey-like children, and then, whenever time was up, it would simply leave. The reason? Simple, it was waiting for more imperial soldiers to show up. At first, they ferociously resented being toyed with like this. Now they just wanted this ape to go away. Now there were less than a thousand survivors, and one soldier among them wondered how much longer he had to live. He just couldn't understand how it came to this, no matter how much he thought about it, then he spotted a white figure. When did the gears start to go out of sync? Before he could find the answer, a dark curtain fell over his vision. Floor 83 featured an expansive grassland with good visibility from end to end. There were pitfalls and other bush league traps set up, but they posed no obstacle at all. The weather was fine, the faces on the marching forces bright. But on the night of day two, the empire suffered staggering damage. The moon had just shifted from waxing to full, and now it framed a lofty, high-minded rabbit in the air. This was the moon rabbit, the master of gravity, and its attacks made no distinction between friend or foe, but here it didn't need to worry about the former. Although its powers depended on the moon phase, the rabbit was capable of turning heaven and earth upside down even during a new moon. Now the imperial army was at the mercy of this crushing supergravitational force. But it wasn't over. Night would come again, soon enough, and in three days, a full moon, the night when the rabbit's power was strongest. Floor 84 was an intricate maze of cobblestone alleyways, the soldiers walking them seemed pale. W water, I need water. No dice. I can't reach our supply team. You'll have to hold out. Shit. It's only been three days, but I'm so damn thirsty. I can't eat without any water. This surgically enhanced soldier was crying about his uncontrollable thirst. It was a hard scene to believe. But it wasn't his fault. Because the Empire was confident in its ability to create drinking water with magic, they had supplied each soldier with only enough to fill their canteen. A portable food supply, the higher-ups felt, was much more of a priority. Now it was this army's downfall. The air on this floor was filled with some kind of toxin, and there wasn't enough evaporated water in the air to magically collect. This situation was only discovered on day three, when some soldiers began to fall ill. Plus, in a particularly nasty turn of events, antidote magic didn't work on this poison. No matter how many times they tried to undo the toxin's effect, it just kept leaking into their water supply, they could breathe normally, at least, but before much longer, they were going to face some serious attrition. Even now they were having frontline soldiers collapsing from the pain, exhibiting high fevers and black spots on their skin. We got another one. He's lost too much strength. He needs treatment. Damn it, we've got no medics in here. Any healing magic? It's not having any effect. And so more and more of their comrades fell, and every imperial soldier who was there to see it wondered if they would be next. Now tiny monsters were running around at their feet in the midst of all this. They were black-furred mice, not even two inches long and they seemed so trivial that the soldiers paid them no mind. That was a serious mistake, for the mice were the very source of all this. In fact, they were the minions of the black mouse, the floor boss, the plague monarch spreading a dark, foul illness. The soldiers had made a terrible mistake. So distracted were they by the powerful magical beasts trotting around that they totally ignored a little black mouse they could have crushed with one step. These servants of the Black Mouse were thus free to spread their germs with abandon. If someone with Shinji's restorative skills was here, maybe they could have disabled the trap placed on this floor, but sadly, no such handy doctor was present. Magical healing tended not to work very much on illness, it was meant more for physical injury, although certain other spells were better honed to deal with particular diseases. Boosting a patient's physical strength didn't matter much if the root of the disease wasn't cured, injury and disease, after all, required two completely different schools of treatment. 
If you needed someone who could totally cure a disease, well, there were only one or two holy magic practitioners of that caliber per nation. They were rare treasures, and barring special circumstances, they'd never serve in military combat. Death spread its tendrils across this floor as well. Floor 85 was dominated by a royal tiger, patrolling the thick deciduous forest that was its domain. The magical beasts that roamed freely on the other floors were completely under this tiger's thrall. This ruler was the Thunder Tiger, a big cat that controlled lightning. While the Empire thought it had the upper hand before it showed up, this perceived advantage didn't last long. Put rapidly on the defensive, they were forced back to their base by the stairway. The forest belonged to the monsters, and despite being literally cornered to one edge of it, the soldiers continued their struggle. Floor 86 was a desert occasionally dotted by oases. The sun shone brightly, the temperature rising every minute it was in the sky, when it left at night, the cold chill to the bone. The temperature difference was so great that it sapped the strength of many soldiers before battle even began. They assumed the climate would be their greatest enemy here, and while they weren't wrong, they weren't exactly right, either. The real trap here was the oxygen in the air. The winged snake was here, and the domain it ruled over was the air, controlling its composition, reducing the oxygen level to zero, for example, was like taking candy from a baby. And when the soldiers assumed the temperature difference was something they'd get over after some rest, that was all it took to ensure a peaceful passing in their sleep for every one of them. Floor 87 was, for some reason, a vast mountain range. The tranquil views reminded many soldiers of their families back home, if they let themselves reminisce for a moment, they could bask in their happy childhoods and envision lovers they dreamed of seeing once more. It took just under five days for them to become fully relaxed. That was partly thanks to the low monster rates around the peaks, unlike many other floors, it was difficult to maintain alertness. And that was why they never noticed that the guards on duty had fallen asleep, never waking up they only seemed awake thanks to a hallucination in their own minds. This was the work of the sleeping ram, a peace-loving soul that, with its gentle invitations, had reaped the consciousness of all the soldiers without a drop of bloodshed. The sleeping ram's illusory hypnosis lured them all to sleep, a sleep they would never awaken from. Floor 88, a forest bordering a great river, was home to a bird of raging flames. Strangely, this fire never spread itself to the surrounding trees. It could only burn those who were hostile to it, and when it did, it went on forever, never fading. This was the fire bird, the master of the flames, and it served as the floor boss here. This fire bird and the other avian creatures that served under it quickly burned all the invading soldiers to a crisp. Floor 89 was a maze made of mirrors. Nothing organic played a role on this floor, it was immaculately maintained, with every mirrored surface polished to a fine sheen. All the reflections on the walls, of course, complicated the maze further for the intruders, and the mirrors themselves were unbreakable. Why? Because they were created with a secret spell from a single monster, the mirrored dog, flitting across every reflective surface. Running freely among the mirrors, it toyed mercilessly with the imperial army. It existed within the mirrors themselves, mirrors that bounced all magic back to the casters. This made it hard to so much as catch the mirrored dog in action, and as it reflected itself more and more, multiplying to seemingly infinite numbers, the pitiful prey were all devoured. At every level, vicious floor bosses were on the rampage. Each had been granted an environment best suited for their traits, allowing them to demonstrate their abilities to the fullest. Still, the Imperial Army tried their hardest to resist. Sometimes, they were even able to defeat these bosses, cheers erupting across the floor whenever they did. But they came right back to life, again and again, and that truth frightened them more than anything else. The situation on the other floors was much the same, as the rumor mill had it. The realization broke the soldiers' hearts, as it made continuing the fight seem utterly pointless and as for the most desperate among them all. The monkey, rabbit, mouse, tiger, snake, ram, bird, and dog were all mystic beasts, the eight legions serving Kumara, nothing more than her cherished pets. Each one was a transformation born from one of her tales, 
and their respective abilities were granted by Kumara herself. When all eight came together, that was when Kumara took her full form. She was no longer a child, but one of the world's most beautiful women, Nine-Head Kumara, guardian of Floor 90 and the master of these eight mystic beasts. And now a group of foolish, pathetic victims were coming her way. They were nothing but food for Kumara, thus the death toll within the labyrinth climbed that much higher. 530,000 imperial soldiers invaded the labyrinth. Just a few days later, the number of survivors dropped to zero.